Hello? Hello? Okay, I think we'll uh, get this wintry show on the road. If you guys want to grab a coffee, we're going to, we've got about an hour and a bit before we have another break, but sure appreciate everyone making the effort to come on a day like today. I, what's the old adage? It's colder than a witch's ear. Is that how it goes or something like that? Um, they canceled all the schools today, so I, I've got a 16-year-old at home that he was supposed to get up and he goes early, he does some, some hockey stuff in the morning, and so I come down to his room this morning before I left, and I said, I got good news and bad news. And uh, he says, well, what's the bad news? And I said, well, it's 7 a.m., you got to get up, because you got to get on the road by 7.30, so. Okay, Dad, okay, up he gets, and not really ambitious at the best of times anyways, but uh, he gets up there, he says, so what's the good news? And I said, there's no school today, so he's... Uh, He's not real happy with his dad because he, you know, they would have liked to have slept in a little bit longer. Um, this is our, I think this is about our 20th year of doing these events. It hasn't been a specific herd tracks event for that long, but um, sure got a lot of familiar faces that uh, I've had the pleasure of, you know, working with and aligning with over these years. Um, and so, you know, if, for those of you that were here last year, I mean, we, of course, we went through COVID and, and um, our program uh, was acquired by TELUS Agriculture uh, in September of last year. So when we met last December, it was fairly fresh. And um, so I wanted to kind of give you a bit of an update and a review of this past year. Um, and... Uh, then we're going to, unlike other years, where I have a, a, a multitude of uh, different speakers come, which is, which is better, I think, but the feedback we've been getting is they, everyone just wants a little bit more specific training and stuff on herd tracks or a, a little bit of, uh, more of a detailed overview. So our entire program today and tomorrow is, is um, specific to herd tracks with the exception of having uh, uh, a distinguished uh, veterinarian and speaker coming up from Nebraska, uh, Dr. Kip uh, Lukasevich is gonna talk about cattle handling and, and facility design later today, but, um, and that'll be a nice break from, from myself uh, or listening to me throughout uh, the day. Uh, I've got some company names on the front up here so important. Um, these, these events take a lot of planning and a lot of um, money uh, to put together. And these, these uh, companies specifically have, have stepped up every year. I just kind of redo the slide um, for each year to the, to the presentation. Um, I don't know if Dave Stedman's here from Trial Nutrition. If he was, I'd acknowledge him. Dave Dave has been helping me nutritionally back in my early vet days since the early mid 90s. Uh, Zoetis, of course, uh, a huge pharma company that we're all familiar with, but uh, very uh, supportive of everything that we've been doing. Uh, is Dr. Bruce Kostelansky here? Okay, Bruce, or Adam Rutherford, but those are the two gentlemen that I work with. I'd like to acknowledge them. All Flex, of course, is really we do a lot of DNA testing. Everyone thinks of Allflex, I think of tags, and rightly so, but uh, they, they have the little TSU vials that you guys have all been using when we do a lot of DNA testing. And of course, the newer readers that we're gonna be demoing. And so Dave Lehman, who texted me because of the weather, he couldn't be here today, but uh, huge supporter. Um, CCHMS, I mean, it's, it's weird to say this. I mean, that was my alma mater, but uh, basically, you know, today there's a lot involved, but it's primarily, you know, Waylon and Sherry, who are both here. Waylon's up front, Sherry's uh, at the back there. Um, always a big supporter and, and participator in uh, everything we do and work together, and I think we've, it's been very synergistic. We've benefited immensely from that relationship. And then Neogen, of course, Michelle Miller. Again, we've been doing, we're going to talk about that again more today. Michelle, are you, I think she's maybe out in the back. She's waving at the back. A um, lot of projects, a lot of DNA projects. 
that entire invigor that kind of got gobbled up by Neogen, and I, I don't know if Michelle gets enough credit, but uh, that was her baby, you know, out of the gate of breed composition and and sire parentage all all coupled into a, into one test. Anyways, a lot of big thanks to everyone here to, um, uh, for helping helping put this together and make it uh, make it happen. Um, the next thing I want to talk about is uh, I don't is, is Vet Vetten, Are you here? My main developer is too cold for Vetten. Um I was uh, I was gonna the easiest way for me to to summarize how things have changed in the last year for me and for the better. Um, there was myself and there was Vetten. Right, and I mean, we've, I'm not saying we've done it entirely alone, but that was kind of basically herd tracks at the core. Um, and then today, and I want everyone to stand up, because I'm not going to remember all your names, but I see Luis, I see Zach, I see Kaylee, I see Leanne, um, Suzanne. Everyone, please just stand up, because I want to get everyone, the team, Tyler, Chris, Dave Moss, please, come on, you guys, just, just stand up. You know, all the veterinary uh, consultants, who's not standing up, there should be. Ash, yeah, Brian Wellman, everybody, Kent Fenton. So, and that's, this is just part of the team. You know, I, I see Marissa and Suzanne at the back there. Part of the team that I have access to now. So, um, if I can just learn how to play well with others, um, because I've been on my own for so long, I, I mean, the sky is the limit. I mean, I've just got a fantastic team of support now uh, that we didn't have before, that have equally as much passion for what we do in the beef cattle industry today. And so, um, thanks for being here. And, um, you know, I think you'll see as we go along through today, some of the changes, some of the things that we're wanting to evolve into and, and take uh, more initiative in it's all because of of having these resources that we just simply didn't uh, have before okay so herd tracks this past year what have we been doing well this hasn't really changed much it's a web-based cattle tracking management software tool people have referred to it as QuickBooks for cattle <laughs> um, which isn't all bad of course you know that Sam Bankman Freed that had the FTX exchange and lost all those billions, it's kind of a Ponzi thing or whatever that went, you've probably heard about a little bit in the news. The thing that I thought was funny is everyone was saying they were scratching their heads. They couldn't believe that he was using QuickBooks to manage all his, all his cryptocurrency. So, but I still think QuickBooks is pretty good. Um, we pride ourselves on it being simple and intuitive. I, otherwise, I hear from it every day still in texts, emails, now chat. That's a new way of getting in touch with me, I guess. Um, I hear all the time when things aren't great, but I think for, most, uh, for the most part, it's, it's, we continue to evolve and work on it. Uh, it is a web-based program, but it can be used offline. We're going to uh, talk a bit about that more later, but uh, when I get into Herd Tracks 101, but the offline actually has never been better. I mean, some of you may say, well, I don't know about that, but it, it's true. It, uh, it's never been faster. It's never been more reliable. Waylon will comment that when he's out working in the field or whether they're preg checking semen testing bulls, he never uses online. Does it 100% of it offline and then syncs it uh, when he's done. These are all the things we're still continuing to track on an individual animal basis. Like, so often it'll, it'll get brought up, well, your program's just like this other program. Well, maybe it is, maybe it isn't. I don't know, I don't really follow so much what the other programs are, but sometimes when the devil's in the details, a lot of the other programs aren't really individual specific, right? They're really good at managing groups, really good at feeding groups, dividing up feed amongst animals, things like that, but they don't really get into the individual side of things, especially on the on the cow-calf side, so we're, we take a lot of pride in that, and that's the baseline of, of everything we do. The one thing that's evolved here is the sharing of information. It's, it's amazing how I get a notification. I don't want to get notified of everything. I know some people will phone me and say, did you see our weaning weight yesterday? Geez, those calves are gaining great. And I'm like, I, 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 sorry, guys, I got other things 
to look at than monitor your weaning weights. But, uh, um, but I do get a notification for every time animals get transferred between different accounts. And that's really, really powerful, right? I mean, you're selling a product to another producer that's using the same program and sharing that information passively back and forth. I mean, we've seen all kinds of examples of that. Uh, and as I look around the room, I can't think of too many of you that haven't taken advantage of that. And we have a lot of language translations uh, that we've, Spanish is really, really good now because we've got an entity in Mexico and we've got a, a, a larger presence that's, ev presence that's evolving into the um, you know, southern uh, US where there's a lot of Hispanic uh, uh, workers or people that we're working with. And, and so Spanish is number one. French is, should, should have been number one, but we pushed the Spanish just because we had that opportunity in Mexico. George, the, one of the veterinarians that hopefully stood up when we were uh, introducing everyone here today, he runs herd tracks basically in all of Eastern Canada and Eastern US. And um, I'm doing my best, George. Well, we're, it's still a high priority to, to fine tune it a little bit. It's not, it's 90%, but it's not 100% yet. So a lot of this really hasn't changed, I don't think, other than it's just been enhanced. And what, how I'd like to refer to it today, and that's what we're gonna talk about is not like each session, that we, each topic that we're going to get into today, it's going to be specific, you know, reproduction, animal health, cow indexing ranking, feeds and feeding. It's going to be how, how you use herd tracks to capture that information. And every one of those sessions, we're going to take the last component to talk about where we see the value proposition is, right? Because the last thing we want is some you know, cool tool on your phone for entering records and you're not getting anything else out of it other than, oh, isn't this neat? I've got a record on my phone. Um, so it's all about the value that we think you can get out of having that information. And again, I call it an integrated operating system or like a W5, the who, what, where, when, and why, right? If you think of everything you do in your ranch, you're picking, you know, who are you gonna keep for replacements this year? You know, what are you gonna, what do you need for new herd sires? What are you gonna vaccinate your calves with? You know, um, you know what are you gonna feed those animals, you know, subsequent to maybe a conception uh, issue or something like that or a pregnancy issue? Those are all decisions you're all making all the time and your, your, your experience and your know-how has got you to where you are today. But there's just no question that you can't, you can't know it all and you need information you know, to help facilitate that. And whether it be on the animal health side or the reproductive side or the performance side, that's what we're trying to do is make it simple for you to collect that information and make it work for you. Is it gonna, is it gonna add more profitability? Well, we hope so. We know, we know in just about everyone that we've worked with, the quality of your herds, the quality of the product, especially those that have retained ownership, and we follow those cattle through, it's astounding how you've gone from, you know, not just performance, but minimized animal health issues and carcass quality and longevity in the cows, all of that. I mean, and you can infer that that's happening, but until you actually have supporting data, yet it's, it's hard to know that. So here's a, I, I want I, I see these other cool maps. Feedlot Health has a nicer map with nicer pins, so they're gonna have to help me with this. But, but this is a current map of North America um, you can see we definitely where we started, um, uh, but it's, it's continued to grow, right? I mean, out east, and you know, a year ago we had a few here in the, whoops, uh, in uh, uh, northern, you know, Midwest US there, but that's continuing to grow. And you'll see there we've got the um, few accounts in Mexico, there's a really, fantastic group of, uh, of, of individuals that we met called uh, through Megavet and it's uh, through a liaison through our, I call it our four Luises. We have four Luises that I work with. So I just have to say, hey Luis, when I see them and uh, they all wave, right? Hey Luis. <laughs> no, but they've been instrumental uh, in helping us move that down. It's really, 
It's really interesting in Mexico on how the vertical integration, all the things we dream about up here, I wouldn't say we dream about it, but we hope for, of having, you know, cows and calves and those calves going into a feedlot that is linked and then going into a packing plant that's linked and all that information stays together. I mean, they have several instances of that down there. Uh, and it's, so it, it makes you scratch your head as to why we can't do a better job of maintaining that flow up here, but, you know, wishful thinking. Um, yeah, again, just a little thing about the Spanish. Uh, so now we've got it set up that if, you're, if that's your preferred language, when you log in, that's what shows up um, on the screen. And lo and behold, we, we have an account in Mongolia, right? So when we first met with them, un unbelievably, uh, well, I shouldn't say unbelievable. I, I mean, and I, I shouldn't say surprisingly, but just a lot of inherent knowledge about cattle and what they want to do. Um, excellent English. Uh, you know, we, we, they're fine with the, with the English translation for now. And I give them access to a test account. When I was preparing this presentation, I was in the test account, and I'm like, who the heck has been making all of these feed entries and treatment entries and stuff in the middle of the night, right? And it's uh, a gentleman named Orgel from, uh, from Mongolia. <laughs> the other thing we've done that was a major um, event, it may not seem like a major thing, but it was, was moved our server. So what I mean by the server, where all of your data used to reside, you know, we call it the server, it's a computer box, it was in a temperature controlled you know, um, data hosting company here in Calgary called Data Hive, and that's where it was forever. We felt r really good about our security and our backups. We were doing that continually. Um, but of course, when you move in with someone like Telus, you know, you know, mega telecommunication company, um, you, you know, you need to up your game when it comes to not just where you're hosting that stuff, but the s privacy and the security and the backups that are involved. And so that's just simply never been better. Um, and again, we can have those conversations. A few might be thinking, well, you know, back to the data and who owns the data and things like that. I assure you, you still all own your data and we're not sharing your data without your permission. We're putting your data in part of our aggregates, you know, when we do benchmarks and we can do comparisons and we wanna know what's the average treatment rate in calves uh, at a certain age and for scours, things like that. Your data will be part of that. Of course, it'll never be revealed that it's uh, who it is. But that aside, the server's been moved. It's 100% on, hosted on Microsoft Azure now, and it's been really good. And the thing that it really allows us, because as you can see, we're kind of on this precipice now or a tipping point where, you know, it used to be a, a new account a week, right? And there's two accounts a week. Well, now it's kind of like five accounts a week, right? So the, you need that scalability and you need that team I just introduced uh, uh, to help do that. Because the one, there's a phrase that I've heard you know, a long time ago, you don't want to drown in your success. I think it's great that herd tracks is growing and expanding, but at the same time, if we lose the support of all of you that you know, have brought us to the dance, so to speak, and have been there and you know, we pride ourselves on giving you support and some customization and, and all of that. So that's been really important um, um, you know, for us moving forward. So we don't want to lose sight of that. Some notable changes, some other things I'll talk about. We have a purple cow. She was supposed to be here today. She was coming from North Carolina, I think, and she got stuck in the blizzard. I really wanted her here today. There, there's, there's something to this. Of course, these are Telus's colors, purple and green. But a lot of you have heard me talk to you about when we go through back in the early days of ranking your cows. And there's some of you, I won't, I won't call you out by name, but I'll say, well, this is your best cow. And you'll say, well, yeah, but she's red. Or she's tan, or she's yellow. And I'm like, well, who cares? Well, I, I don't want any yellow cows in my herd. Or, I want them all black. Don't want them. Don't want any red ones. And I'd like you. Know, you know, you you go through all this information. You go through all this data, and you you're all excited about that. And then something like a color. So I, I've used the phrase a lot, even way before Telus, that I don't care if she's purple. 
if she's your best cow, she's your best cow, right? Who cares? Um, I do get the color thing. I know when you're selling them and they got to look uniform and color helps with that and stuff like that. So anyways, I already talked a little bit about spending a lot of time on the language translations for Spanish and French and we've got Mandarin um, that we've uh, completed as well. That's, that was an undertaking, right? That's, I never, I never imagined it was going to be simple, but I really had no idea what it was going to be like to go through every code, every label, and, and even when you think you've got it, you get an email saying, well, this still says English, this still says English, and, and so forth. So it's, and, and maybe we just haven't approached it the right way, but it's a, it's a big undertaking, but um, it's, it's, it is a, it's a necessary thing. We've launched what we call a B2B subscription model, and for those of you that know that, great, because I didn't know. When you get into these, these big corporations and stuff like TELUS and all these meetings, you, you, you die by acronyms. Everything's got a, an acronym, right? This and that and whatever and letters for this. B2B basically stands for business to business. What we do with all of you currently, for most of you here, is what we call a direct to consumer where you, you license and you use herd tracks through us or through, our, you know, through us directly. But what, what was unique about this is if you think about it, you know, if 100 new accounts came to us today, could we handle that? I don't think so. But if, if Waylon and CCHMS has several accounts come to him, he's able to onboard those clients and we make sure Herdtrex does what he needs it to do for him. So CCHMS and Waylon and Sherry were kind of the first iteration of what I would call this B2B model that we d I didn't even know that's what it was called, right? And, until we, uh, until this come up. But now we've had the, you know, what's really exciting is the alignment with other, and currently it's, it, it's veterinary practices. I see Dr. Craig Dorn here. I don't know if Elizabeth or, or um, Dr. Tommy here, or uh, good. Um, from Veterinary Agri-Health Services, a lot of you would know them, large, successful, uh, and long-standing uh, veterinary practice, you know, uh, based out of Airdrie Crossfield area there. Um, uh, they've been, you know, willing to, to step into the realm of using herd tracks with some of their clients uh, for managing the data. You know, I know, uh, Tommy, from what I hear, you've been pretty excited and, and we're just as excited as, uh, as you are to do that. So we've also, for those of us, that, uh, those that are listening online, I'd, I'd be remiss, there's you know, Dr. Fred Muller and his company, you saw the concentration of, of accounts down in the Washington area there, Washington, Idaho, that's, that's two um, veterinary groups. There's Cattle Strategies and Cattle Health and Reproduction, J.D. Folsom. And so we work with those veterinarians to, you know, to help them make sure that this data tool enables them to assign their protocols, um, customize those protocols, help them uh, if they're doing some feed and nutrition consulting when they're preg checking those cows, semen testing bulls, et cetera, it allows them to, to interact with that. So this is a model um, that I, we're really excited about. This group in, in Mexico, Megavet, that's basically a B2B model as well. And even though there's veterinarians involved, it's more of a pharma uh, uh, feed additive distribution company at this, at this stage. But again, they're wanting to add value added services. And if you think about everything we do in this world, even those of you that are selling your uh, seed stock producers, right? Is it enough just to put a bull or a heifer up for sale and sell it and hope she gets pregnant and hope he breeds? I mean, that's just not the way the world works anymore, right? There has to be some sort of a value add that goes with that that differentiates you from the other, you know, 100 Angus breeders as an example uh, that are trying to do the same thing. And we're no different, right? Yeah, we're trying to differentiate it and we're trying to do it on not just quality of the product, but, uh, but on the service as well. We've added a standalone feedlot interface. Our wheelhouse has always been, the program's been a cow-calf program. If you retained your calves at weaning, which a lot of you did, and fed them out or they moved to another feedlot, et cetera, Hertrax has always done a pretty good job of accommodating that. But there's several smaller feedlots. When I say smaller, you know, less than 10,000, uh, you know, 1,000 to 10,000. 
uh, that maybe aren't quite ready for the big jump into the, you know, the really big admin, real big like IFHMS, for example, um, uh, data management tools. And so Herdtrax is maybe even a, just a really nice segue for them to, prior to moving on to a, a, a bit of a more robust platform. But it was required for us uh, to build a standalone feedlot interface. And again, we're gonna, we have a feedlot component or lecture tomorrow session that, uh, that'll be just exactly on all of the work orders, the feedlot induction screens, things like that, as to what that looks like. We have a calf ranch module. Raise your hand if you know what a calf ranch is by the term I'm, when I say calf ranch. A few of you. Yeah, so it's been around for quite a while, this term calf ranch, but basically it's beef on dairy. Okay, so it's a, again, it's nothing really new, but it really has gained a lot of steam in the last few years, where what do you do with all the dairy calves? Those of you that used to be dairy farmers, or a few of you, you here that I used to work with, um, those steer calves are kind of throwaway, the feedlots didn't want them, you didn't want them. Well, now if you provide semen to the dairy, you provide beef semen, Cavanese type semen, add a little bit more muscle, take a Holstein calf, breed it to an Angus, or you take a Holstein calf and breed it to a black limo, you get a black calf. And not quite as heavily muscled, but it's, it's, it, it adds a little bit more value to it. And so these calves get gathered up at the dairies, they get hauled and moved to a depot type scenario. And then from that depot, it's like a commingling place, or even it's not an auction barn, but it's kind of maybe similar to that. And then they get moved off into a, um, uh, a calf ranch like where they have thousands of hutches for those baby calves to grow into before they're old enough to go into a feedlot. We got a, a session on all of that tomorrow for those that are interested. Uh, a lot of you signed up for that where we're just going to get into the details of that model. I think it's really good to be aware of that. I know there's a lot of people that are saying, oh, that's affecting our beef prices. It's flooding the market. It's oversupply. Nah, I don't, I, I don't buy that. I mean, he will be talking about that again tomorrow because those calves were there regardless, right? It's just how, how they were managed and, and that's really what we're doing here. We've added more customization but maintained standardization. So what that means is, is what I'm going to show you a little bit in Hertrax 101 and again in some of the specific topic. We've tried to make it more flexible for you to add and hide and move fields on your screen, right? Um, because no two farms are the same, right? You know, if, you'll laugh at this a little bit because we're veterinarians, we're all about protocols, we're all about following the script, so to speak, and then you have some accounts say, ah, just take our temperature field out of the health screen, we don't ever use it. And it, it you know, it's, it just clutters up our screen, we don't want the temp field on there. Fair enough, make it so it's hide and, hide and show. So, but at the same time, we want to maintain standardization. And the best example of that is every product that's licensed for use in Canada, a vaccine, antibiotic, hormone, dewormer, we control those products in the back end. It's our fault, I guess, if we get it wrong. But we, I saw early on where the products were, you know, misspelled wrong dosages, wrong routes of administration being added when, when clients were allowed to put it in on their own. And the, the most glaring issue was getting the wrong withdrawals, right? So you treat an animal and you got, you know, it should be a 30 day withdrawal and you, you accidentally put three in there. You know, that's just no good. So um, that's what I mean by maintaining the standardization. And we're doing more of that even with our diagnosis codes now. It's just time to try and standardize those a little bit more, but you're still gonna have the flexibility of turning on and off those codes, but the codes are still gonna be standardized. So we can benchmark properly, compare, again, I talked about veterinary agri-health, CCHMS, and some of these other, it's really gonna be nice for us to kind of collectively get together. So if we wanna query everything geographically and look at where we're at, again, specifically on a veterinary diagnostics side, we're comparing apples to apples. We're not looking at 
what someone's calling a pneumonia and someone's calling a undifferentiated fever and someone's calling it something else, right? Or just calling it BRD. I think we do, you know, and I think we're in a position where we can lead that and we should be leading that. We started this Sire Share Alliance Network. If you recall, the first sire that we added to this was Hamilton Farms Alcatraz as a yearling bull. And what the plan was, the whole premise of that was I had multiple ranches using an AI sire out of an AI catalog and adding that sire into their account and doing their breeding events and everything like that, but that sire was siloed in, in their account. So if, a, if Farm A had Alcatraz, potentially, and Farm B had Alcatraz, there's no way those records were, were aligning or mixing together. So we just created this kind of like a global sire network where we're trying to put all the popular AI bulls or, and you don't have to do that. If you, if you got a new AI bull and you don't want it to be part of the global thing, you just add it to your own account and you carry on on your own. But, you know, Alcatraz, for example, we got over 700 progeny in that bull. He just turned four and, and birth weights, gestation lengths, weaning weights. We got some feed conversion stuff because people set that, sent some of the progeny up to Olds College and put them on the grow safe bunks. So it's an immense amount of real information on these bulls. Do you need 700 records? No, but you know, it's not bad, especially when you're looking at your EPDs that the Breed Association has put out for you. It's a really good thing in my opinion to have the real information to look at to help validate what, you know, what the crystal ball stuff is, is telling you. We got one other bull uh, that's got more than Alcatraz. It's got 880 records, right, of, of progeny records linked amongst, and again, back to your data privacy, it's all, it's all, you know, no, we're not saying um, these are Bob's calves you know, that he AI'd to this bull from his farm, you know, and had these birth weights, et cetera. That's all kept confidential, but it's all part of the aggregate and it's really valuable stuff. We, we've been trying our hardest to work with the breed association. So what I mean by that, I talked about earlier, wanting to play well with others. I mean, it's gonna be really naive, at least it would be for me, I think, to sit here and say, oh, herd tracks is the only cow data system eventually that's gonna be around and it's just, everyone's gonna be in the world, it's gonna be on herd tracks. That's just, that's not realistic. Every, there's gonna be systems come and go and there's gonna be other platforms that people wanna use. You know, the, the right answer for that, in my opinion, and I've used this analogy before about the Microsoft Apple debacle back in the years where only Apple software would run on Apple machines. And if you remember early on, Microsoft software would run on all PC machines, right? Well, we, I'm kind of on that mindset. If we have the data and you have a breed association that will take that data so you don't have to do double enter it, we're gonna build the, the template or the, the API or the framework so that'll work with you. And we've done that the, the, the one I want to give the most credit to is Canadian Angus. They've worked with us diligently and been very receptive and very helpful on, and fortunately, of course, that's our biggest subscription base for purebred herds in, in Canada. And then the Canadian Simital followed suit and the Canadian Charlet has, have done the same. And then we just recently were able to uh, get the American Angus, which was a big one, because as you can imagine, that's a, you know, the largest breed association in the world. Um, and so for all of our US clients, it was, it was pretty important to, to have that. So we've got that data file set up. I won't use any names. For those of you that had red feather necked white face cattle though, you could talk to your association and maybe tell them that we are willing to play if they would like to play with us. The next thing we're doing is that we've learned is we provide you th this tool and then through our network, especially Waylon and a little bit myself prior to Waylon, you know how we work together and it's like, you know, I, I remember going, I see Owen here and the family, Cheyenne, Brandon, I remember going to your place to 
help pick replacement heifers and thoroughly enjoyed that, right? And we'd use the data and we'd use phenotypes. And, and I think there's a, there's a demand and a need for that to where we don't want you doing what we call data-driven decision-makings, right? There's data-driven decision-making and there's data-informed. And data-driven is just letting the, just living by the numbers. Well, look at the paper, don't look at the animal. This is our top one. We're just gonna pick these top 10, right? Best example I can think of that, it's a client of ours that was using uh, grow safe data. We had a bull, correct me if I'm wrong, Waylon, but I think the feed conversion was 3.87 on this bull. And they double checked the data because no one believed it, right? Dry matter to gain, 3.87 pounds a day. It's like, oh my gosh, what a superstar, what an outlier. This is the holy grail, this bull, right? Well, except at a year of age, he weighed 850 pounds, okay, on a good feed program, and he had 22 centimeters testicles, right? So really good feed conversion, right, if you're going to select for just that, but, you know, a disaster otherwise. So you have to... You can't do single trade, obviously, and you have to pull it all together. But I think there's a need for other consultative services. At least that's the feedback we get from the clients. And especially on the feeds and feeding module. I don't pretend to be a nutritionist. The reason I have, I uh, mentioned uh, Trow Nutrition and Dave Stedman. For, your, for years, Dave would come and formulate rations and he'd help consult uh, with the clients on you know, you know, feeding programs and things like that. And unless you guys are really trained in that, I'm assuming a lot of you are doing that as well. And it doesn't have to be a veterinarian, but I know in-house we've got lots of PhD and master's trained nutrition uh, consultants, and we're gonna talk about that in the feeds and feeding module later, um, that will do your ingredient analysis and they'll monitor your feed. Because again, remember, this is an online program. So the minute you do your feedings or you do your bunk calls and we monitor the you know, the average dry, daily dry matter intakes, things like that. That's all stuff that can be monitored remotely and, and assisted with. And I think there's, there's immense value. So that's another, that's a service. The virtual veterinary component, when we get into the animal health module, which will be right after our break. Um, when, I, when I graduated VESCO, I mean, which was 100 years ago, but still, I had a $10,000 used Ford truck and I had a $5,000 used buoy. And we were charging, when I worked at Moore & Company, I don't even, we didn't even track mileage. It's just if I drove to your farm, it was $30, right? Um, to, for, for veterinarians to drive out to your farm to look at a sick animal today, it's too costly for them. You're likely not gonna call them to do it, right? And you're just gonna maybe try and treat it on your own because it's a it's a lose lose a little bit right i mean it's costing you too much money so we want to we want to try and we're, we're not trying to make you not have face to face with your veterinarian but on some of these cases whether it be a post mortem exam where you could cut it open and you could examine the tissues take easily take pictures of it or maybe it's a treatment maybe it's a lameness you want to stream a video on and say is this just a foot rod or does it look like it's maybe gotten into the joint and needs something a little more uh, a, a little more attention. Those are all things that we'll talk about and how you can engage more uh, with the veterinarian uh, when we get into the animal health side of things. Genomics and genetic selection service. As I mentioned earlier, we're doing thousands and thousands of DNA testing in commercial cattle, right? And remember when that genomics thing all come out, it was, it was all about testing for defects in the purebreds that's a self-fulfilling prophecy, right? This dream up a new defect and let's just test for it because we're not testing enough cattle right now. That's my opinion on some of that stuff. But anyways, um, the commercial side, well, here's the, here's the thing. Three and a half million cows in Canada, approximately. It's down our inventory, but that's our inventory in Canada for cows. What percent of those are seed stock cows? Anyone want to guess? Count? I know, because I know the registration counts on the big four, right? Angus, Simital, Hereford, Charlie. Want to take a guess? It's not even 100,000, right? Not 100,000 yet. Three and a half million beef cows and less than 100,000 are seed stock. 
but all our genomic testing gets focused on the seed stock and not on the commercial. I think that it's just there's so much value, the tests are economical now for being able to assess what sires are siring which calves. You know, you've heard, the, you've heard the saying, a good bull's half your herd, a bad one's all of it. I mean, that's an exaggeration. But, you know, as purebred people, we take for, for granted the fact that every calf that's born, we know who the sire is, or if the few that we don't, we DNA. But in a commercial herd, you don't know. You buy all those expensive bulls from the recent sales I've been watching here. Um, you know, prices, inflation has def definitely stayed pace on the, on the beef cattle side. A lot of money is spent on seed stock and for you to not know what they're doing or what they're siring or, or, or what the product is. I, I think that's just, it, 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 you're leaving a lot of information that uh, could be really valuable to you. But it's not as simple as it seems, right? We, I mean, you can take DNA on the calves, take DNA on the bulls and you, you shotgun it and you throw all the hair in the vials at Michelle up at Neogen. They don't like that. Um, she hasn't said it directly, but she doesn't like that. Uh, um, so we've tried to build some, as you, those of you that use it, some, some export files that will say, this is the type of test, these are the calves, these are the potential sires to go with those calves, do the testing, send it back. And then we also get that heterosis uh, component of how straight bred, how crossbred. Uh, those animals are. So we're going to talk about that when it comes to our cow indexing and ranking here a little bit later. And then lastly, these herd track success manager. And where this has become a, a really important is because I hear it time and time again. Nobody has any time. They really like herd tracks. They don't want to leave herd tracks, but they're behind in herd tracks, right? Their inventory isn't caught up. They just weren't able to, you know, update the treatments, update some movements, update the breeding events, right? And I get it, right? I'd like to sit here and say I'm, my eyes are dotted and my T's are crossed all the time. I mean, it's just technology hasn't made our lives better, absolutely, in a lot of ways. So we have people in house now that are evolving into these roles of you know, and it doesn't have to be a big deal. Maybe four times a year they help you reconcile your inventory or you're done prep checking your cows and they just help move the opens out, help get the pregnants treated with whatever they were treated with. Waylon does this on his phone driving back from every place he preg checks at. Like, like, do you have voice command? Because when you sent me that text the other day, it was quite long. So if you see a vet box and a Chev truck, just you glide to the, if you're heading them. But, but uh, one of our uh, new young bright lights here, Kaylee Dorval, that's here with us today, she's gone out. We've had a couple new accounts that got started and they just weren't sure what to do. We said, Let, Kaylee, would you mind going out, just be in there when they preg check the cows, run them through, help get their tags in. And the way to sum it up for her, like she hardly knew anything about the program. She went out to her herd in Kamloops. And I, I know what vets are like, because sometimes the vets are not onto this because they just, they're there to get a job done. They're not into this. So anyways, you preg check 750 cows in seven hours, yeah. right? Yeah. In Kamloops. Yeah. yeah. And recorded every tag, every RFID, every cow color, uh, on, and pregnant open status on everything. It's fantastic. Needless to say, how pleased were they, right? I mean, there's, a, there's an additional cost, of course, to go with that bit of a service. But if you're really serious about the data, which I know most of you are, you wouldn't be here otherwise, um, it, it, it's worthwhile, you know, focusing on that. And even if it just takes somebody to help you get caught up, and then you're good for a few more months, right? So, so keep that in mind. I think there's a couple of you here that have already inquired about it, and we'll talk about that that later. The other thing that's really exciting is, as you know now, we have this reporting module, and I think, right or wrong, every new account we start up, you get all 110 reports, and you have no idea what any of them do or what they're about, and I always keep saying, well, you should just try them and see if you like them, and if you don't, click on the trash can, but no one's, no one's got time for that. 
There's reports that you want, and you want them to be go-to, you want them labeled, and you want them simple, or maybe even better yet, you want them where they just show up, right? Like the calving snapshot that you can get daily when you're calving your cows. Anyways, right now with, our, with the server now being in Azure, and I'm not gonna bore you with Snowflake Tableau, but there's, a, there's another data capture module, like a data cube, which kind of helps process the data. So when you go to run a huge query in herd tracks, best example would be if I wanted to look at the feeding history in two years from a couple of you that, that do a lot of feeding events, I think, we'd get a, I think we'd get an error. I think we would crash it just because it's just trying to run it uh, so much data. Where Snowflake kind of puts that in there so you get it instantly. Tableau is the data visualization. So when you see these really nice dashboards, I'm a visual person. I mean, I don't mind looking at a table with, with numbers and p-values and stuff like that, but it's pretty nice to see a comparative chart, whether it be bars or lines and, or, or pies and stuff like that. And so this uh, Zach uh, Paddock, who's here today, he'll, he's going to chime in and show us some samples later on of what those kind of reports will look like and, and how we're going to uh, make more use of that. So. So th this isn't something we're just planning. We're in the midst of it uh, because we've had some accounts that moved quickly onto herd tracks and require some reports sooner than, than later. The value proposition, though, I think for the program has, has, has not changed. You know, this is my wording, but it's basically through the collection and use of data, we want to give you insights to making better decisions. So again, back to the five W's, you're making all those decisions. You know, if you're putting information into here, you need to be using that information to help with those decisions. And not everyone's gonna be the same. That's where the customization comes in. And we're gonna talk about that in our internal cow ranking, our maternal index, our terminal indexes. I'm gonna explain how we do that. I'll go through the details of that. And then some of you are gonna say, well, I, I'm not that wild about that. I'd weight this heavier. Well, Waylon's gonna, show you, right, that how, how many, most clients use it, but they don't use it exactly to the letter of the law, right? They want, they want the index, and then they want a few other caveats, you know, to, to be aligned with that. So that's, that's what we're at. But again, just make, you, make better decisions. So that's herd tracks in review. And this is the best place I thought to put this one in. I really like this one. We're, uh, I'm going to pick turkeys up on Thursday. Okay. So th the plan is to move into what I call Herd Tracks 101. And so that's where I'm gonna log into the account and I'm just gonna do a quick overview of features that most of you are already still aware of, but as I go through those, I'm gonna outline some of the newer ones. It's not, it's not gonna be really detailed, but at the same time, it, it, it's gonna show you some things that I think you maybe didn't know were there before. Um, and remember, as DLMS, and thank goodness for DLMS, I, I, um, willingness to do this and help us out because it'll all be recorded. Um, God forbid you ever want to watch it back again, but uh, if you want to find something and, and, and quickly go back to it. Any, any questions or comments about anything I've set up to now? I'm really impressed with the attendance. I thought most of you would get snowed in, but you obviously have somebody home doing the chores for you, so that's good. Okay. Herd Tracks 101. We're going to do this. What time is it here? 10.05. We're going to do this for about 25 minutes. And then we're um, uh, going to have a refreshment break. And then we'll break into each specific uh, module uh, throughout the day. So let's go back to the very basics 
of logging in, right? You know, we get asked this quite a bit. Can we just have one login for the farm, right? Why, why does everyone have to have their own logins? I guess that was my, that was my doing. As you know, unless there's a lot of duplicate names, which we've got, a, we've got a lot of J. Smiths, so we've had to do something different there. But usually the username is your first initial, last name, and then you create your own password, which yeah, most of you are no different than my wife. You can never remember your passwords, so you're always phoning to see how to get your password. I actually can't find your password, but you have to click here to, on, the, on the screen here. There's a click here to recover. It'll send an email to you to reset your password. That's pretty standard. The biggest reason I like having everybody have their own username, and again, it's not, we're, we're not here to try and monitor you because that's the last thing we're doing, but every record is linked to whoever was logged in, whoever's users log in. So these, tabby, these 10 calving records were done by Bill, right? These three treatment records were done by Jennifer. Um, you know, it's just, it's good stuff to know. And then at, there's times where maybe the protocol doesn't get followed or uh, things get entered in a different way. And we're not here to, and I know the, the management isn't there to, to rain on whoever's, you know, having trouble. They're there to help you. But that's one of the biggest reasons we like to have, you know, individual logins for everyone. There's no limit. Right, we've got some accounts, Heidi, <laughs> that have lots of logins, right? It's funny, because Shane was telling me we only want, I think it was Ed at the beginning, we only have so many logins, we only have so many people are gonna have access. Maybe they don't know you've given everybody access, have you? Okay, sure, sorry. The other thing that's worthwhile noting on the login is we can tier the access, and we're gonna actually continue to even do that further. So if you want someone to just have data entry access, which makes sense, you don't want them getting into the reports and the pricing models and stuff like that, um, that we just tier that access. If, they, if you want them to have more access, we, we turn that on or off. And the other thing, back to our B2B scenario, so if you're a client of Veterinary AgriHealth with Tommy and Craig there, um, to, well, Tommy's been signing them up left and right here lately, right? So um, he can do it all on his own. He can assign his own users. I think that's a big breath of fresh air where it doesn't have to, we got to reach out to Troy and, and company to, to add those users. I think you can you know, successfully do that all on your own. You can remove users, hide users, add new users. It, you know, do it as you need uh, with the veterinary uh, group that you're working with. I really wanted to use this touch screen because I have this vision because these things aren't that much money and they're pretty ruggedized that I, can, I, I think these would be nice to have by your shoot side because you guys will all be rolling your eyes. But, uh, but, you know, everyone's got these little tablets and I think the phones work fine as well, or they got the laptop inside a Rubbermaid tub, but you're still needing to use a mouse. Um, these touch screens are nice, and I'll tell you what, if you've got a crew and a bunch of people working on it, and you bring up a cow, and it's got a profile, and it's got some information, or the treatment history is right up there up top on the flash of the screen, I think it's just, it's, it's compelling. It's, it keeps everyone engaged. I, I, would, I, wouldn't, I wouldn't dispute it. Um, you know, until you try it. Anyways, when you log in on the program, as you know, there's a left menu with a lot of different selections there. We have these quick links. So repro is all the different repro stuff. Health's all the different health things you can do. Uh, sales are sales, feeding, weight info. Um, and we'll go into a few of these other things. But before I, before I say, this can be customized, right? This market info is for Western Canada only, basically, right? It's the CanFax averages for Alberta, Saskatchewan calves and the fat steer prices, things like that. We need to get one for the U.S., but we don't have that in there yet. So if they're a U.S. account, that's being hidden. 
Um, the feeding, not everybody wants the feeding. Feeding is a, is a add-on module. We can hide that versus show it. Uh, Alliance sires, not, everybody, not everyone's AI in or taking part in that, so that can be hidden as well. The, 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 the thing that we've done that I think is, is, again, adding to more customization, if I just go to the add animal screen, for example, so say you just bought some animals and this isn't through calving and stuff, we'll get in, into more of the specifics, but every one of the events, or you'll see this new link if you haven't already called select fields. Because it was just getting never ending where someone says, I want these fields, I don't want these fields uh, on the program. So you click on that select fields and you want to hide, you want to hide uh, that field, that field, that field. Uh, I don't need that field. And you can just see how you, now you got a nice arrival screen. Your preg check screen's no different. Your breeding screen's no different. Your health screen's no different. You pick and choose what you want to see on the screen. Turn on, turn off. We, you've always kind of had that functionality, but you, it wasn't controllable on your own. So I, I think there's that flexibility, and I know what's going to happen when you figure that out. There's going to be other fields you're going to want to add to that. That's fine. I don't care how many we put on that. So we've got this left menu. Um, you know, the Google lookup's the same, as I call it, right? You can look up a, an animal by its visual tag. You can scan it with an RFID. We've got a session tomorrow to really bring everyone up to date on the readers, scale heads, compatibility. Again, not with herd tracks per se, just with the devices, right? Specifically Android, Apple iOS, and Windows PCs. You know, we'll, we'll talk about that tomorrow if you're around. And if you can't be there again, it'll be streamed and, and, and captured again. But if you go into an animal, now there's multiple ways to get to the same event. Like one of the things I think that's the simplest is you look up an animal, we now have this actions, if you didn't know about that already, where you just quickly say, I'm gonna, I wanna treat this animal, I'm gonna breed it, it died, sell it, weigh it, move it, put a comment on it, transfer it. Um, those are all things that you, you can do and you want to take pictures on that animal, you can, uh, it'll launch the camera, and we'll come to that when we're talking about virtual, some of the virtual vet stuff. So I showed you what you can do there just by looking up the animal on the home screen, but lo and behold, we still have this health, where a lot of people click health, enter treatment, and that's when they'll look up the, um, the animal they want to treat and do it that way. I didn't actually select anything there. But it, it, in some ways, it annoys people that we have more than one way to get you to the same result. But I, I still think it's a good thing because everyone likes to do it a different way. And in fact, it's interesting to see how creative some of the young ones are as to how they get to where they, where they want to go. But again, back on this health screen, we're going to do it in more detail. Got to select fields. What do you want to, you don't want to see that. You don't want the temperature field, like I said. Just real basic fields uh, to do your, your treatments, okay? Um, settings. Top right. And again, there's lots of different things you can do there. But most of the codes, alerts, sort codes, your locations, your management groups, those are all user defined. Right? You can name them whatever you want. And we can get into it a little bit more about when to use an alert. Just traditionally, alerts started off as being the cold codes or the bad codes. But what's become lately is needs DNA as an alert code. Right? So it's not really bad. You can have cold for utter and then you can have needs DNA. Ultimately, what those alerts are meant to do as well as the sort codes, they're basically one and the same is when you look up an animal at any time in any screen, that's going to be at the top of the screen for that animal. You're just not going to miss it, right? If it's a cull, she needs DNA. She's a sort. She's a replacement prospect you want to keep. 
But those, the wording and the labeling that you have of that, you go into settings and you put, you know, those kind of uh, comments in there exactly what you want. Same with your locations, right? And the only thing that different that we've done on the locations, like we got asked this at the last trade show, it says, well, can, can a satellite track your cattle so they know where they're going, right? I think they're thinking about those tags, they're called series tags that, you know, a couple hundred dollars and they satellite tracks the movements of those animals uh, where they go. No, we can't do that. But what we can do is when you're at one of your pastures, you can click this get current location and it snaps the geo coordinates for that location. You only need to do that one time. So then when you're, you know, got your animals and you want to, you know, look at where they're all located, you know, and again, if I touched on there, I'd have to hover, I guess I'd hover, but it should show the name of that pasture and, and how many animals or pairs and stuff are in there. That's as good as our mapping is right now, but it still gets you to what the meat of the matter is. How many animals do you have at this location? When did they go there? When did they come off? What are our head days? Um, uh, et cetera. So again, back to settings. Most of that's user defined. You'll see here we've got a semen embryo one that's maybe more for the purebred people. We're going to talk about that later. But it's a really nice uh, inventory tracking for your tanks, right? I built that for me personally because at the end of every year I fuddle around in my AI tank not knowing what I've got left, right? This is meant to, you put it in, you put your purchases, like if I pick on one of those, and uh, so you, you put in when you bought some semen, how much you bought, where you stored it, et cetera, dollars per unit if you want, and then as you, you can do a sale on it, or as you do breedings, you can pick the straw or the embryo out of the cane or the canister that it was in and it'll reconcile as you do the breedings. Another reason, another compelling reason, I hope, to keep your breedings up to date because that's going to help keep your semen and your embryos up to date. Especially when I see what some of the semen selling for, Gail. You don't want to be misplacing some of those really good uh, showman straws. Um, one of the biggest things I want to point out here on the, on the settings is this called fixed account settings, for lack of better words. So if you click on that, and I don't know when the last time you were in here, but we've added a lot of things. And we'll clean this up, but it's just giving you some feedback. Essentially what it is, you're going to put a check mark in what you want to see and what you don't want to see in certain screens. And in this case, <laughs> if I had a nickel for every time this happened, can't, I don't even know what chartreuse is. Why is chartreuse in our tag colors? Please get rid of that. Well, it's part of our standardization. So you just uncheck it. So you just, if you've only got blue, red, yellow, and green, just uncheck the rest, and then in your, ni in your nice little tag drop down, that's all you're going to see for colors. Same with the breeds. Look at the breeds we ended up adding. We, this is what we had to do, right? I think Whalen's responsible for most of this stuff, but anyways. Uh, um, you sure you don't want to put a third in there for some of those? Or, uh, yeah. <laughs> anyways, point being, we still want as many breeds as possible in there, but again, if you only have Angus and you only have Simital and Charlet, that's all the breeds that you want to, to show up on there. And the next thing, same with animal colors, right? Like I had to draw the line, we had lots of requests for, you know, we just call them black broccoli, but they wanted you know, to go like the, ho the horse route, route, like with a star strip and a snip kind of thing. And I'm like, no, we're not, we're not going to do that. Take a picture. That works. Um, but again, if there's too many of those colors that are making your list too long in your drop down, just customize it. And then if you happen to get a brindle, 
turn the brindle color back on and away you go. The next thing is, and this is where we'll be part of the animal health, is we're, we're working to standardize all of the diagnosis codes amongst the veterinarians and the practices. And are we going to get it 100% out of the gate? Absolutely not. But we just want everyone to have access to those codes, right? And eventually, may, hopefully, we can, over time, streamline them. And again, I'll talk about this in the animal health module. But for example, we have this um, uh, sick depressed, right? And then you'll have sick with fever, and you'll have sick with no fever, and you'll have undifferentiated fever. Um, you know, I, we, we'll get into it again later, as I said, I'll, and I'll get beat up on this. But the way the program is set up now, we could just say it's sick. And we can say it's sick with fever because if they put a temperature in there and the temperature was at such a level, then we know it has a fever. And if it didn't have, if it had a temperature in there and it was no, and it wasn't a fever, that would classify as a sick no fever. You actually don't need a separate code for those. You just need sick, right? And isn't it interesting how we went from, from pneumonia to BRD and lots of the different labels back to <laughs> they're sick because it's, we just can't assume it's BRD or it's pneumonia or, or something like that. So, so that's part of our standardization, but coupled with the opportunity to, to be a little more customized as well. Um, other things I don't know if a lot of people were aware of is the shipping and receiving log. And so when cattle come in and cattle leave, I notice this at the feedlots, they all have a binder or maybe they probably maybe have something digital now. But a lot of them would have a binder where manifest number, you know, so many animals come in, this is, they weighed them or they didn't weigh them. This is the trucking company, this is the source, right? If I just click add new, that's the stuff you would, um, you would add in uh, on the program. That's a really nice, thing because you know what I figured out not everybody counts the same right I don't know how many times well Bruce Bruce is one of my cattle investors how many times do I go back to Bruce sorry Bruce there's more than you thought or there's there's less than you thought you know um, it's always good just I think a bunch come in Put it in there. This isn't just for feedlots, right? You bought some bred heifers. You brought them in. They come in on a certain date. Um, say where they were. Say the source. And then when we go to add them individually, it's just kind of a nice reconciliation to have that. And that's for shipping or, or receiving. The other thing that's on here is not everybody is able to track individuals the way I think it would be nice to do that. Best example, it happens in drought years, which we've had one and a half of that. Uh, you got 100 pairs on grass, grass is getting short, and you got to move 50 off because it's just not going to last. Who's going to scan those 50 pair? Who's going to write down the tags on those 50 pair? Nobody, I don't think. If you are, great. But this whiteboard inventory is really meant to be, and what I mean by whiteboard, I mean so many of the clients and stuff that we work with, even to this day, they've got a nice big whiteboard in the office and they, they write little things down on it. That's what the premise of this is. If you've got 55 cows at uh, Bull Center, you put 55. It's just a free type. And it's just nice check and balance for each month as to which cattle are where and what location. Uh, and then we can help reconcile. You say there's 55 at the bull center, but in our individual herd inventory, you know, if we have a bull center, you know, I don't know even if we have a uh, location. Um, I don't even have it in there, but regardless, you can kind of look and you can kind of see, well, why, does, why did you write down 55 when we have 52? Because <laughs> Inventory is such a big deal, and, 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 and it, everyone thinks it's easy, but it isn't, especially on a cow-calf ranch, because you just continually got cattle coming and going. It's not like they all start out in one pen and, and, and leave. 
So whiteboard, shipping, receiving, and this calendar, this isn't meant to replace your, um, your daytime and calendars and your iPhones and stuff like that, which are superior, your Google calendars. But what it does do, every time you do an event, it will highlight that event in the calendar for you. So you can just go back and have a quick snapshot of what, what it's showing there. But here's the cool thing too. If you want to send an event date, you know, to pretend that's July 20th, send reminder, so you pick a date in the future, pull bulls. I don't know, it's not like you're gonna forget that. But you can send notifications to yourself through there, right? It'll just, and I guess, I think the nice thing that's, that's good about this calendar, it's all there, it's all tied to your animal health record component. I mean, you're probably gonna write it down in your other calendar or maybe in a book or something like that. And again, the other thing I wanna show is, um, I was going to, I'm not sure if I can, uh, anyways, but it formats so nice on the phone. I was just gonna show you what it's like in phone mode. And you know, you can pick your calendar and, and whiteboard and stuff all from there. So it's, so you, the, you know, the overall guts of it there, I'm just looking at fixed account settings. Oh, I, and let's talk, let's talk about the offline while we're here. Um, like Waylon said, he uses it offline 100% of the time and then syncs it when he's back online. Even if you have pretty good service or pretty good cell phone coverage, I would do the same. If you're just doing data capture, I'd switch it to offline. And again, we just put this link here and Vetton has done such a fantastic job of making this fast. Like, like that, this is a test account, so there's only maybe a thousand animals total there. But I, I could take Doug Price's account and it would still be three, four seconds to go offline, right? It's just so fast. And what this is, it, it's creating an app on the fly. I get asked this and we're debating it internally. We're back and forth. Should we build an app to go with herd tracks and connect the two? And, and I'm not saying we're not gonna go there. I mean, we're, it, it's in conversation right now. But for right now, this is our version of how to approach not having any internet service. The caveat is you have to be in service to make it go offline, right? I get asked that a lot where they drive down into the hill or in the valley and four miles in and they have zero service and now they want to go offline and they can't, right? So just keep that in mind. You have to have service to go offline, but it just takes seconds. Go offline and leave it. And offline, again, the intention of offline is really just for data management or, uh, sorry, data collection, right? Look up an animal, enter a calving record, look up the cow, enter all that information. Do that for the day. Health history will be there, everything else like that. And then when you're back in service, click sync and go online. It double prompts you because some people will accidentally hit that when they're in the middle of doing something and they get annoyed because it starts trying to sync when they weren't wanting it to sync. So that's all that is. And then you're back live. So anything you did is, is live in, um, in, the, in the program. So that just, um, and you need to be using Chrome or Opera or Safari. Safari works offline too, but all of our testing, all I'm gonna tell you is you'll be, someone for fun will log into Firefox or Mozilla and they'll say, oh, her track seems to work pretty good. And then all of a sudden it'll do something really weird. And, or a menu won't show or an animal won't come up on the screen like it's supposed to. And we, we just haven't been or don't have the time to test all the browsers. So we do all our testing in Chrome Chrome's free. It's actually, I think, still the best browser anyways, uh, whether you're on an iPhone or not. And so if you're just using Chrome, you, sh you should have the, you know, the same benefit and effects 
of, of using that. So that's a little bit on our offline. The value back to the settings of making sure you keep contacts in there. Just as a rule, we force this. Every animal that comes in has to have a source where it came from. Every animal that gets sold has to have a buyer. And the source could be ABC Auction House, right? Auction Barn. Or the buyer could be local auction market. Doesn't matter, but there's something needs to go in there so we, we have a, a, a track and a trace of, uh, of, of those animals, you know, from, from an origin standpoint. Um, importing data, like I said, we, it's just really important to be able to play well with others. So we import animal changes, Canadian Simitol, uh, we've got other um, Angus links, carcass data, all our DNA info that go, goes back and forth to Neogen. Um, uh, we can import EPD stuff. Of course, new animals. That's one way to start a new herd is just have an Excel spreadsheet or whatever program you were currently in, and we export that in. Or a lot of people have these way scale uh, uh, Gallagher true test scale heads. You get a spreadsheet of the data, simple import with the RFID um, back into herd tracks. A couple things in the My Herd grid. Out of all the links in the program, when we look at the Google Analytics, My Herd link is the one link that gets selected the most in every account. So that's good. But we want to try and make sure that it's doing what you want it to do in that. Right. So, as you already know, we can default it to management group or, or location is the view on your, um, uh, on your screen, but you can also sort by alerts, you can sort by cow rank, you can sort by herd status, you can sort by breed. It's, it's just a nice filter. And it's, it's been so popular that I think a lot of people have bypassed reports because they can kind of get everything from their list here. So if I pick a group here of these 50 cows, and there's those uh, list of cows, you've got this customized columns. Again, it's a lot, but it's all there because somebody's really adamant and more than one person's requested it be there. But you can you know, you can hide some of those fields. And again, they'll, they'll just um, um, collapse and show up on the screen. And whatever is on that screen, if you go to print, whoops, if you go and go to Excel, print preview, do a mass update, mass move or whatever, everything that's here, this group of 50 is what'll go forward. But you can still micromanage from there. Right, so if I pick these 50, come on, try. If I pick those 50 and I want to do a move of those, there's the list. But, and you can pick a date when you move them, what location you're going to move them into. But again, that these are all highlighted. You can still micromanage that list even further. So you don't have to have the exact finite list from the original grid before you want to go. You got 42 selected now, and you just want to move forward um, with those 42. The other thing we added is instead of having to go right into the individual list, that's what all these plus signs are meant to be. Right, if I just touch that, that means I can move those 47, treat those 47, do a pasture exposure, sale, feed them, transfer them. So that's what that little plus sign is that you see. It's just kind of a shortcut to doing some of those group events. And then the show cross filters. Whalen uses these all the time, and you maybe didn't even know what they, what they meant. But if I want to look at all the management groups, but do a cross filter on a, f a feedlot with that, this shows which man management groups are part of that location. Again, this is a test account, so the data looks a little wonky. But I encourage you to go in and play with that. 
And as you see what I'm doing here, the reason I like doing this touch screen, because a lot of you that are, again, I use this arbitrarily, but that are 45 and under, you're doing everything on your phones. It's old people like me that are still like a mouse and a, and a computer. But anytime you see one of those gray bars, right, all that's meant to be is a collapse expand because you can't see all of the data at one time on the, on the screen. And as you get used to it, I have to admit, I, the, the, the touch is a really nice thing. I know when Wayland's preg checking, you're usually running the ultrasound and your phone, I think, right? A lot of times you do run a laptop. I think I saw you with your phone a few times. In the, too much shit. Too much shit. Um, the other thing I want to mention is uh, Leanne uh, Zakowski that's here, uh, or sorry, Leanne Longshore that's here. She's uh, spent a lot of time going through and updating these videos. If there's something that you just aren't sure how to do and you've had to reach out, or what we try to do is if two or three people are asking us the same thing, we're, we're going to make a make a video on it. It's just a screen share that outlines and shows um, you know, how to do certain things uh, within the program. And then lastly, we've got these links here, producer events. And I try to keep up with that. I've missed a few already. Um, but what that's really meant for is if you've got an upcoming production sale, sale event, junior stock show that you want everyone to be aware of, something that you want to advertise, right? You're working with us, we want to work for you. We put it in there, we'll put a link to the issue, um, you know, catalog or whatever it is that you have. And, you know, I, th I think as we get closer here where we're going to have some bull sales, uh, that'll, that'll get filled up. Along those same lines, though, is you'll see this option for sale listings. That's a little bit different. I mean, we could say you've got some cattle for sale in an event and just post that in producer events. But what we'd rather do is if you have, just recently we had a group that had 50 steers that were weaned in September and they just decided they wanted to sell and they're weighing about 800 pounds. And so you create a, a public sale listing of those. And then what we do in turn, right or wrong, you, everyone that's a user in the program, you've seen those, you'll get an email that says cattle for sale in herd tracks. And whether you're interested or not, you can click on the link. It'll tell you, you know, who those animals are, who they belong to, who to contact, what they are. We've sold a lot of cattle. Just, you know, there's so much advertising and marketing, I can't even imagine how, those, how animals don't get exposed. Um, but there is something to be said about buying animals that A, can be transferred, with a known specific health history. And people just infer that if you're on this program, I'm not saying it's, it's right or wrong, but they infer that you're at a higher level of management. Now we concur, they are. If you're, if you're using this program and you're paying de attention to detail on your animal records, uh, like I know most of you are, you're doing everything else uh, the right way. There's a lot of trust in, uh, that goes with that as well. Um, that's, that's the 101. Oh, just lastly, final thing, as you know, when you do events in the program, they're completed, they can be done, and then they show up in this unposted event screen. And we, I've had lots and lots of debates about that where, and we've actually got to the point where if you do a treatment, it's done, you don't want it sitting here waiting to be posted or someone to go through and, and select them all and post them when they're done. We can do an overnight posting automatically on those if that's a bit of a pain for you. But most people, I think once they get used to it, they quite like it because it, you know, you got, it, you've got a village at home there managing things, right? It's not just one person. So maybe grandpa wants to see what you did that day, right? and you've done it all and he wants to kind of look it over and see what's going on. Because once you post it, it seems to look like it disappears, but it doesn't. It just, it just leaves this screen. 
we never ever remove any record, right? It's, uh, well, we can delete them ourselves behind the scenes for some of you that uh, need that to be done. Um, but on the left menu, there's this event history. You can go search event details. You can pick any event you want, pick a big date, pick the date range that you want, and just do a search. And every animal that you had in one of those previous events will show up there. You can still take that, export it, print it, do a, still do an update on it. It's like you posted them and it's like, oh, I forgot to add all the vaccines. Well, don't sweat it. Just go to event history, grab that event, and do an update or a group event. The other thing you'll hear, you'll see, is when you're in some of these screens, people really like that My Herd grid. So you can just click on that, and that'll take that list of animals from your event history and just move them right into that grid right on the front screen there so you can manage them and print them or do some more filtering and sorting um, from there. Um, lastly, on these unposted events, these, as you do an event, like for example, right now you'll see, okay, this is just a test account, but say this was 30 scan list, you know, make a list type thing. If that sits there for a month, most people are going to forget what, what that was. Because I, I know, because when I'm talking to people and I'll say, they say, well, we need to update our vaccinations. They say, well, you got a group of 37 here. What was that? Well, I'm not, I can't really remember. Point being in this comment box, it's just a free text box. Just, you know, whoops. Just type whatever you want. Um, to, and then every record that event, and then you go into event history, if that was spring processing 2021, it's really easy to filter and sort for that. You can probably pick that up anyways because the date's 2021, spring, and it were calves, but sometimes it's just nice to, to do that. So use that when you can, right? For those of you that like to write novels, in the calving comments on your cows. I mean, this should be intuitive for you. Okay, I think it's break time. Um, yeah, I think, I think that's, we'll leave it there. We're gonna have a quick break and then we're gonna talk all about animal health, treatments, postmortems, pictures, protocols, working with vets on protocols, that's kind of the theme, and then the value of why, why you should record all that stuff, okay? I think we got coffee and cookies and stuff like that, so let's go. Which one? There, so they, she sent me a spreadsheet that she wants to upload um, change of RFIDs and stuff. When you go into Alcor Farms it, and you say data import, animal changes doesn't mean you show up. It's not checked off in admin. What's the name of the farm? Alcor, A-L-C-O-R. So where do I check that off? Because I went into the account settings and I can't see where you set where you put that in. A-L-C-O-R. Tonya. You said Altor? Yeah. A-L-C-O-R. No T. So where do I check that on? Um, well, it says show import animals. So you, she can't import changes. Yeah. So when I went in, because she sent me the spreadsheet, so then when I went in there, I don't know. These
Start it again. Make sure you got some caffeine. There were many prospect clients in Quebec. I put it on Facebook. <laughs> oh, did you? Oh, good. There were many prospect clients that.
can talk fast in the second half. This young man is having trouble logging into her track. Okay, Waylon, George, you can put that on. It's turned off. Just turn it on. Okay, you can put that in your middle of your lapel there. Got a chair there, George. Okay, I'm going to have uh, Dr. George Parody, who I mentioned earlier manages multiple accounts out in Quebec and Ontario and the Maritimes and uh, Eastern U.S. Northern Northeastern U.S. Uh, he's been a, a, a service, consulting services veterinarian with Feedlot Health for how many years now? Thirteen years. Thirty. 13. Oh, 13, yeah. You've been there quite a while. And then most of you know uh, Dr. Whelan Wise, who pretty notorious, doesn't need much introduction. <laughs> He's an extraordinary polo player. Okay. Um, so this module, and it'll take us into lunch. Uh, we're going to do, and again, it, it, it may seem redundant to some of you, but I, my impression is a lot of it's like, oh yeah, I see that, I know that, I know that. But I'm, I'm, I'm thinking there's always going to be a, a few things here and there um, that you weren't sure of or whatever that, uh, that we'll be able to bring up that'll, that'll hopefully make your day better. Just talking about my kid again, a little anecdote. He's really into Christmas and he was bought some gifts and he was wrapping them last night and he's fumbling away with the scissors and not very good with scissors um, and my wife Karen's got one of those I don't know little glide thing that you buy at a dollar store or whatever so I said why don't you just use this thing like it was just so satisfying for him <laughs> he just to, to see a 16 year old pubertal boy get really excited about a new way to cut wrapping paper was something to uh, <laughs> Anyways, okay, animal health screen. So there's, the, what we want to do is when you have a sick animal, and remember the premise when we're, when we're having you do data entry in herd tracks, 
handle the information one time. I know a lot of you will write it down uh, on a book somewhere, on your hand, on a fence post, because you don't, I, I hear it all the time, I don't want to get my phone dirty, or I don't want to get crap all over my phone. Well, for all of you young ones out there, that's a bunch of malarkey, right? Because you guys don't do anything without your phones. I don't care what the weather is, right? So that, that excuse doesn't work. So put the data in real time. And we've hopefully given you some compelling reasons to do that, right? As I'll show you, you're going to pick, you know, if you're working with veterinary agri-health and CCHMS or feedlot health, you know, there's going to be some protocols in there that are going to script to you what to do. You just have to say, hmm, looks like a foot rot. I think it's a foot rot. You're going to select that. Maybe triggers a protocol. You pick a protocol. It's going to tell you the product to give, how much to give, where to give it, assign a withdrawal date, all of that. If you're not sure, that's going to be the next step I'm going to show you. You're going to take maybe a picture or you're going to take a video. And then we have a diagnosis code called diagnosis pending. Click the notify checkbox. And those are vets that, again, that you're, you know, that you have, uh, you know, a VCPR with. Uh, we'll get a text or an email notification um, that you know they need you to, or that you want them to have a look at that and 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 offer their um, their consulting advice. Again, just back to driving around, right? And, I, and I'm just going to do a quick poll. I don't know how many of you are going to be honest, but at calving time, if you have a dead calf, you know, not not just a stillborn, but even a stillborn <coughs> or it's born three days later it dies. How many of you call currently call a DVM to come out and do a post-mortem on it? Show of hands. How many of you used to do that? <laughs> okay, so hypothetically, if you knew you had a veterinarian to offer that diagnosis virtually, right, you might have to have someone cut open the calves. And cutting open calves is much nicer and easier dead calves and giant frozen uh, steers in the feedlot. Um, and you just flip everything back and maybe you just have one picture of the lungs in situ or whatever. But say, say that was a $50 charge to make that diagnosis, but you, you know, you'd, you'd get that confirmed. How many potentially would be interested in that? Show of hands. Hi, put the hands up. <laughs> okay, more. Okay, good. Well, I'm hoping, that's, I, I'm hoping that's the case, right? I mean, we, you still want to engage with your veterinarian. We still, or I'm speaking on behalf of those, I mean, they still want to be customer facing as well, but it's just the times we live in, it's the reality. I mean, you know, I think of Waylon and, and Craig and Tommy practicing, you know, it's not like it was near Airdrie and Crossfield and stuff like it was years ago where you could drive from, you know, the east side of Airdrie to Balzac and in 20 minutes, right? I mean, it's, it's, it's a long time. So anyways, we're just trying to evolve and, and make the technology uh, benefit that. Two things, if you need to treat an animal, I think the quickest way to do it, if it's in the program, is you just look up the animal and I just, I just type, I'm just typing numbers as they come to my head here. Uh, I got a pink yellow uh, 22 steer look up that animal, go to the actions, and when you select that, it um, puts that animal on the screen. If there was some sort of a recent treatment or processing event, I'll maybe go into Albert. Is Albert here? Albert Stahl? Yeah. <laughs> Speak up. <laughs> I'll go in, I'm going to use a couple of years for example on this. Let me do that. I, it's just these demo accounts are um, not ideal. Let me just find an animal that's got some treatment history. Oh, Albert, doing good. You're not treating nothing. There we 
There we go. So I think, again, everyone knows that red, red font in the program means that that animal's on withdrawal, okay? So we've got 7122K, calendar year calf. So I'm just gonna, you go out into the pen, find that calf, type the number, okay? And you'll see at the top of the screen, it's in red, draw date. It doesn't have an actual treatment record, it just says it was processed 643 on November 2nd. So it looked to me like uh, that was just the weaning event. So if I go into actions and I want to treat that animal, so you just look it up. Um, I'm going to put select fields, previous ADG. So see again, these are fields you can hide and show. One of the nice things now, and this is a new feature that you probably hadn't noticed before, um, it'll show the previous weight, but it'll also show the date to that previous weight. And that's helpful <coughs> because in every treatment event, we want you to put an estimated weight in so it can calculate how much you know, product uh, uh, to give, especially if you're selecting an antibiotic. So November 2nd, it weighs 700, so I don't know, I hope it's gaining okay, I'm gonna guess it at 750. <coughs> then in your diagnosis process, you're gonna pick uh, one of these diagnoses. Again, these are all gonna get standardized and also customized more um, for, for what you need, uh, particularly in your herd. You know, I, I've talked to some herds that are gonna want seven diagnosis codes. I've been told that a hundred times. I just want a short list of codes. I don't want a hundred codes. Okay, fair enough. But they're gonna be codes that we've scripted and that we've kind of all consolidated amongst uh, the masses. So what happens when you pick foot rod, if you're working with your veterinarians, they're going to show you or have some protocols that are assigned um, that you can, you can select right and I'm going to show in a bit how we're changing this you know for these attributes to limit this so right now you've got seven or eight whatever it is there foot rot protocols we want to get it to where you put foot rot and based on the age of the calf based on the weight of the calf and maybe based on the temperature that will shrink those attributes will create an algorithm that'll just give you maybe hopefully one protocol and if there's only one protocol, it just triggers. You don't actually have to, hmm, I wonder which one I should pick kind of thing, right? But regardless, uh, I'm gonna say mild to moderate, pick that. Here's a protocol that basically, there's a little blurb. Again, this is, this is <coughs> printed by the veterinarian or provided to you by the veterinarian and you can enter it in on your account. Um, recommending biomycin and some meloxicam. Um, sorry, Bruce. I was hoping it was going to be liquamycin, but uh, <laughs> just never know when you pick these things. Take it up with Waylon. Blame the veterinarian. Yeah. <laughs> Professional scapegoats. <laughs> um, so anyway, so it, it shows how much to give there. If you want to edit that, because you did some mental math before you treated it, and you actually gave it um, 35. You type 35 in there. You can say you gave it in the right neck, and you can put a lot number in, because I know VBP and some of those verification programs like it if you do that, okay? It's not mandatory, though, for you to have to do that. The withdrawal, withdrawal dates automatically go in for each product that you're using. And again, you would just click save and you'd be done. And that record's in there, it's in history. Um, even if it's unposted and someone goes to look at that animal the next day, you know, they can go over here to event history, they'll go into the health, and they'll go when that animal was last treatment record, you can see all of that information there. This record that started here today is, of course, just what we're, um, what we're doing. Okay, 
try, try. <coughs> you put a shoot in the treatment, is it to calculate the shoot charge? Yes. <coughs> Wayland adds that to all the protocols. Yep. You want to touch on that, what that shoot line means? Yeah, I mean, we've done it for mostly the feedlot accounts who are charging, um, you know, for a shoot charge, right? So most of the cow-calf guys always ask me about this. It really confuses the reports because there's always a double entry for every treatment. But um, some of the best um, health histories that we have are tied, you know, in, in some of our smaller feedlots that are billing for it, right? So if it's not there, you don't get paid for it. So, um, you know, those histories end up being really well done, um, and the shoot charge is there so they can add it to the invoice, basically. Okay. Now, let's, let's go back. You don't have any protocols, or you're just not sure what's going on. You want to go diagnosis pending, and you can put a little comment in for the vet. You can click on this camera icon. It's going to ask me to download a picture because I'm on a computer. But if you're on your phone or a tablet, it's just going to launch the camera. And you just take a picture, click Save. You want to take another picture, click Save. Or turn it to video mode because we're streaming the video with Vimeo. It's a very compressed, <coughs> quick streaming service. So for you to take a 20 second video and have it upload instantly to that account, it would take like 10 seconds, right? It's really, it's really quite quick. And so, um, you know, in a lot of ways, I think especially for live animal diagnosis, looking at a bad eye, looking at a certain type of lameness, video is much more telling than, uh, than a straight picture. Anyways, simple to do and add I think we've got it up to a dozen pictures for right now. Click this Notify Vet checkbox, click Save, and then whoever that veterinarian that you're working with will get a, uh, a notification of, of um, you know, to have a look and log in and, and, and take a look at that. So that's something to consider, discuss with your veterinarian, whether they're interested. Like I know the groups that are here, of course, are interested, but those of you that have veterinarians that aren't here, um, again, we're willing to work with whoever. It's just, we just want you to get the most benefit out of, uh, out of capturing uh, that information. The same, I'm going to delete that like it never happened. The same thing goes for mortality, right? So I'm going to come back to one of these here that I think Albert has already done that with. Um, but again, if I want to look up an animal, unfortunately you found that animal dead in the bedding pack today. Um, you click actions, click dead. And it's similar to the animal health screen, right? You can go to the event history and go to the health. Whoops. Didn't mean to touch that. Go to the health link. Last, pro, last health event was a weaning event on November 3rd. So November 3rd, it weighed 646. Found it dead. Same sort of thing. You can say too badly autolyzed, scavenged, whatever. You can put that information in there. <coughs> put the name of the vet that... Um, did the postmortem, put an estimated weight in, you know, 700 pounds maybe. And then again, you can, so again, the treatment screen versus the mortality screen, just a few different diagnoses to utilize, but it's very, very similar. Take some pictures if you want. But even, even if you're not going to have the vet notified, if you see an animal that's dead and you see the tag or you see part of the RF, you know, the RFID, the other ears eaten off, just enter the record, right? Because it just helps you reckon, keep your, your inventory reconciled, right? Because it's just those things, I call it inventory creep. It happens in every cow herd, right? People load the cows and they haul them uh, to the auction market or they haul them to Prescott's, et cetera, wherever they're going, or they have a cow die in pasture, but they just never kind of pop it in. And I know it's not 
you know, that most convenient. It's not on top of mind to always do that, but it's so simple to pull out your phone and do that. Just, and then it's done. You only have to handle it one time. Albert, can I look at one of these unposted? That's what I like about Albert, team player. <laughs> Okay, good, I'm gonna, ha I'm gonna lean on all the, the current veterinarians that are practicing here to help with this. So, here's an animal. Unfortunately, she was a replacement prospect. Let's go into her recent health history. No treatment record, no treatment history. Up and died, diagnosis pending. So we touch on that. Anyone want to take a guess what that is? Looks good enough to eat, doesn't it, Albert? A little bit of green in the guts. You know what? These are great. You know, it's not just the, the cut open pictures. There's no one weak stomached in here. Eh? I'm not grossing anybody out with this. <laughs> Yeah, just before lunch. <laughs> but but seriously, look at look at look at how she's died there, right? I don't know. Again, I'm not. I'm just going to offer opinion. You look at that. You can just. It's like it's kind of like she just kind of laid down and just blah, just died. Also, pretty distended looking, right? Hmm. <laughs> that looks interesting. That's probably not supposed to be there, is it, Albert? Not that much? That's a heart. Someone was being craft and creative. And there's the lungs that, you know, a little bluey and stuff, but it's got a sharp border. I mean, really no signs of, of pneumonia. So, anyways, Craig, what is it? Yeah, that's what I would say too. You, you get lunch. <laughs> but do you see, just, you know, and you're just doing that with your phone, right? And um, it's a pain, but I'll tell you what, knowing that, how valuable is it knowing that? Right, especially that diagnosis, right? And Albert, Albert probably twigged into it already when he saw the, the green. But I, I can't tell you how many times people would walk by and see that, and what do you think they're going to call it? Bloat. Right? It's not bloat. For sure it's not bloat. So, again, I'm campaigning as a vet here, and I don't want to get into the weeds too much there, but um, it, it's, it's just all about you taking this information, and then we utilize that for making decision making because it might be maybe it was just an accident in the mix and the mixing load or the wrong pen got the wrong ration or maybe we need to revisit with the with the nutritionist that we're working with and talk about the fiber levels and you know for whatever reason there's some sorting going on and they're not eating the 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 forage that they're putting in there and they're eating the grain so that creates that whole dialogue and discussion which you would never have and you, you get going down a garden path that uh, maybe isn't that accurate. Anything you guys want to add to that? Just the, what I love most about the feature actually, anytime we see any of these dead animals, having the event history there is just so key. And that's why, um, you know, the program's been developed to really get data entered in um, accurately and it just makes our job as field veterinarian is just so much easier where we don't have to hunt that stuff down. Incredible. And <clears throat> make sure you talk to your vet. We have pictures, we have videos, we have training sessions available to do the job always the same way. You don't have to know what the problem is. All you need to know is how to cut that animal open and take the right pictures. Yeah, Feedlot Health, I think, pioneered that, right? You, you did such a good job of creating videos and documentation for how to do your own PMs. I mean, it's, it's not for everybody. You want to be careful. You don't want to be cutting a, a thumb off or anything like that. But I'm just going to go into one of the 
uh, vet info protocols. Where would the, your postmortem stuff be in the bottom here? Yeah, general? it's vet info under general. I think there's a, a YouTube link to a for, um, necropsy yeah. manual. Yeah. 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 So there's a video as well, which is probably better. But Wayland's got nothing better to do, right? So he does a, what a thirty-page document here. You should have been a journalist or something. It's been logged into three times. <laughs> <laughs> No one reads them. <laughs> oh, come on. Someone else. You guys all click on it now. Nobody knew it was there. Flip your head if you knew it was there. <laughs> There's one person, my partner. <laughs> <laughs> Anyways, so. Okay. Individual treatments, individual postmortems. You can do it by strictly looking the animal up, or there's this health quick link where you click enter treatment, find the animal, same result, same thing, enter dead. Other thing on these quick links, I mean, you got a quick treatment history, it just shows the most recent animals that you've treated. So if you're, you're going out for the day and you just kind of want to get a feel for, you know, what you're, what you're going to look at, et cetera. Any questions about entering individual treatments or individual dead animals? I'll hear about it at some point. Yeah. Is there a question? No. Okay. So the next thing I just want to talk about is doing a group treatment, right? So we'll have, you know, if, 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 if you've got a group of animals, the best case, the best example of that is, is you're processing all your cows. You've set the Ivamex syringe to 65. They're all getting a scour vaccine or all, they're all getting a cluster, you know, seven way or something. They're all getting the same thing, right? Those are cases where I wouldn't say what, you know, you fire up herd tracks and you get the, you get the processing screen on and you got all these, you know, drugs laid out and that you click save and add the new one, save and add the new one. And it's still pretty quick. I mean, we do that for processing and weaning and stuff. But if you're not changing the dose on the products, I think you should do it as a group event, as a mass event, right? Make sure you got the right list of animals and then assign the dose, the exact dose that you gave on the date to that group of animals, right? So an example of that would be, um, Pick, uh, where's your bred heifers at, Albert? Okay. So, got all these bred heifers, and they've already probably been given that, but you can go in and look at those, and from this actions menu, and there's some of these things in here, we, again, we can hide and show as well, but you can go group treatment, right? So, I click that. And that takes me, there's all of those animals, but now it's wanting to treat them as a group versus doing them. Because unfortunately, and it's probably on, on me, when we start up some new accounts, they said, oh, geez, that took me a long time to add the Ivamec on 250 cows. And I'm like, oh, no. <laughs> you know, they went in and did them one at a time, right after 60, 60 ml, 60 ml, 60 ml. So, you know. It, it, it's, we do have the group uh, uh, venting for doing that. So I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to exit out of this. And I'm going to go back. And the other option is, so you could open that list, go into group treatment. Or again, if I go over to this group, remember I showed earlier on that there's that plus sign. You touch on that plus sign and it says treat. All those plus signs are meant to be group type events. So now I'm going to say, um, now, something to point out on this. When you're calving all your calves this year, okay, and you know, for some of you, you I, I love the idea that you want to be to the letter of the law. So every calf that's born, you're giving it its vitamin AD, you maybe it's given Inforce, Internasal, uh, you know, you're doing all the things you should be doing or want to do. 
But again, if every calf's getting the same thing, don't, don't feel compelled to, you know, I want you to put, or we want you to put your calving record in, right? Get the dam match to the calf. If you're doing that, birth weight, some of those other things. Uh, but again, for that newborn processing protocol, you know, I'm just telling you, I wouldn't do it that way because we could do a group treatment and you see this checkbox here that says use date of birth, right? So we can just go back and take all the live calves, do a mass health event, it'll go back and assign that event to the, to the date of birth. Maybe you did it a day after the date of birth, but it, it still gets away from the tediousness of slowing down the record keeping to the point where, yeah, maybe I'm just not gonna do it, right? Is what we fret about. So, so keep that in mind, but not just use date of birth. If all the animals come in on a date and they all got the same thing and you wanted to go back and do a mass health event for that, you could use the arrival date and same thing, you just capture all your wean weights on your calves. You just did a weight event. You didn't do a, a health event. That's okay. Just go back and have it select use the wean, wean date. That's what those are for. In this case, we're going to pretend we're doing these animals today. You can always backdate your events as well. These calendars, it's kind of problematic because sometimes it's good that they default to today's date but it's in a way bad because it's like you did them last week, you're all diligent, you're gonna do your update today and it's like, oh shit, I forgot to change the date. Uh, don't fret, we can help you with that. Anyways, you click update. Now it moves all of those animals, 145 of those bred heifers and put an average weight of 1300 pounds in there. And the diagnosis list now you see is not foot rot, not pink eye, not pneumonia or anything like that. These are all group codes, right? And that's by design. So whenever you're doing a group event, it's a processing. Even if you're treating them all for foot rot or you're treating them all for pink eye, I guess we could label that, but it's really a mass processing event that you're, uh, that you're assigning to those animals. We could call this you know, processing spring cows, spring pre-calving, general, Waylon and I debate about this all the time. I think there should just be one processing code and depending on the time of the year and the animal type and what we're doing, that infers what we need. We met in the middle, you're gonna have all these codes to pick from in your customization and fixed account settings. And if you just wanna use processing general, like me, that's what you'll use. And that's all you're gonna see for your processing. Really, you know, drastically simplify that. Now, don't have a protocol, you wanna add your products. Always remember that every product, except for some of the new ones that Heidi reminds me of and I need to add, which is good, she's really good that way. Um, uh, but every product should be in there that's licensed for use in cattle, right? So if we're gonna start typing um, scour guard, whoops, got a spell, scour guard 4KC, goes in, add your next treatment, maybe they got an ultra choice 7 vaccine or something like that. Anyways, isn't that much nicer? I mean, you just take the whole group, they all got the same thing long as you're confident that these 145 were there, I think you know, your records are nice and tidy and right up to date. So that's, now, you're thinking, well, what's that picture thing for? Sometimes, instead of, uh, I've, I, you know, again, I learned so much from all of you guys when, and girls when you do this stuff, but instead of putting the lot number in, sometimes they'll line up all the bottles on, a, on the uh, processing counter or a shoot side that they used for the day with the lot numbers all showing and then you just take a picture of it. And you click that pic, you attach that picture. And remember when you attach this picture to this mass event, in every individual's history, there, that picture will show up. So I, I thought that was pretty clever, right? Maybe a lot of you already do that. I, I'd be the one in there typing all the damn numbers in each one, if that's what I was gonna do. Um, 
So single treatments, single PMs, group treatments. Um, let's see here. I'm going to delete that. Even currently, too, right? I mean, we've struggled with CCHMS to try to accommodate what everyone's doing. And on the CalCAF side, there's just so many permutations of different programs uh, multiplied by all the different drugs on the market. And we've been trying to manage that and put it into different diagnoses. And even something like um, even the vaccine schedules on the cows, newborn processing, it gets complicated and everybody's starting to do different things, right? Use different products. There's lots of lines. Um, so we've pre-built this in here. Um, there's also the ability to, in the settings, if you go to diagnosis uh, code, right, you can, you can, sh you can uh, choose what gets shown in the farm protocols. So instead of, if you know you're doing one thing all the time, um, you can deselect the other eight things that everyone else has requested to have in there as well, right? Yep. Um, get that request a lot. Yeah, and the create edit protocols, right? There's, so your veterinarians, if they're in the supervisor interface, like um, uh, CCHMS, Veterinary AgriHealth, um, I see Eric's here. Um, this is a nice interface where they can go in and they can create these protocols without having to recreate them for client two and client three, right? Uh, it's not saying you don't have specific needs and requirements, which you'll get those, but sometimes there's a protocol that you know, would work for all 10 accounts, the supervisor interface gives them the flexibility to do that. But if you don't have that relationship or that hasn't got off the ground as of yet, you have that in your settings where you can go, and we've had uh, producers get information from their vet or get them to send them some information and then they'll go in and they'll They'll give the protocol a name. They'll say if it's a disease or treatment or a herd protocol, and they'll put a message in about it, and then they just add the, the treatments if it's a treatment protocol. Remember, when we add protocols, I call them protocols, descriptions, processing, documents, they don't always have to be a medical-related thing, right? One of the ones I remember early on that was really um, clicked on a lot, again, through the search history was how to tagging of twin calves, right? It was a kind of a method because everyone was always getting mixed up as, you know, they could figure it out in herd tracks, but then they get mixed up when they're pairing them out and stuff like that. So it, protocols, you know, don't have to always be a veterinary related thing. It's just a nice recipe. And especially for new staff or, or people that aren't doing it all the time. That's one of the things that I hear all the time on the cow calf side of the software is it's pretty intuitive. By the end of calving season, everyone knows what the hell they're doing like really well, right? And then Warren and Nicole, they go to Hawaii for the, for the summer, right? And then they come back in the fall and it's, you know, you kind of forget a little bit, right? So, uh, um, so it's unlike a feedlot program where pretty much year round every day they're, they're using it. So there is that, you get a little rusty sometimes and you just need a refresher. And again, as I pointed out, we've got quite a team for uh, for doing that. Any questions about adding treatments? Single group? Yes. You can you can take pictures offline, but you can't notify the vet offline. No, when, the way it works now, Nicole, is you have to sync it and then go in and click the notify vet box. You can add everything that you wanted to add, just the notify checkbox isn't there. It's a good point. I'm not sure if we can get that. I don't see why we shouldn't be able to do that. And then once it's synced, then it would go forward with the messaging. Just two comments. Uh, when you're processing cattle, <coughs> I have clients that keep forgetting to put all the details in the process, like management group changes and movements. So when you're done with your job, just don't post it right away, and you can update 
into the unposted events, update the whole group with all the changes you may you want to make. And one more thing is, uh, whenever you process cattle and you're you're not done, you go for lunch and for whatever reason you get out of herd tracks or or the health treatment screen, you can go back to the unposted events and click on the right side, add to event, and then you will be adding cattle to the same process you did in, mor in the morning. So you won't end up with two, two events to, to, to uh, post. Excellent comment. So the first one was, is George, I mean, there's lots of reasons we have this unposted screen here, but, um, you know, Albert did a weight event on November 7th, 131 animals. Well, it's unposted, but from these actions, we could do that group treatment I just showed you too. You could also go to update and do a movement because maybe they all got moved to a different pen. Uh, or maybe we created a new management group for those. Um, and so having them in this unposted screen already grouped versus you having to go back and find them and filter for them in the MyHerd grid, it makes it really, really nice. It's one of the, one of the biggest advantages, I think, of having um, these unposted uh, um, events set up there. And your second... Add, add to oh, yes, so, it, so like you go for lunch or you shut it down or whatever, you go for a break or you're waiting for another group of calves to get peeled off the cows. Anyways, her tracks is gonna go to sleep or log off or something. But you can just open up that event, that same event, and then the actions you can go to add to event. And then it just takes you right back to the exact same spot you were and we'll just keep adding animals to that event. Now, having said that, if you want them in a separate group, right? Pasture A had these 131 calves, so you process them, they're all in one group you're going to do the next group, 150 head from pasture B, but you want them all collected in a separate group. You click, that's what this new session is meant to be on every event. When you click new session and I start a new animal here, it's going to leave these 131 all in their own group and it's going to start the next group with the first one. And so you'll have your new session um, of, of animals to do that with. And where that's kind of important because some of the things we've added in this year, if I go to this weight event that Albert created, we've got this show stats thing in, inside the screen, right? So as you're weighing the cattle, right? Um, got quite a weight range there. I think these are all cows, I guess, was it? Were they Albert? Must have been but it breaks down the weight range and the percent of each and the min max average. And we do the same thing on the repro exam now. And then what's really nice is if you're done, you can hit the print stats and it just creates a nice little PDF that you could email or print or whatever uh, to have for a paper document or send it to a manager or one of the owners or something like that uh, to have. So, that way you can have one pasture group is this, another. Now, I'm, you can still do this reporting and querying later on, but there's not a lot of delayed patient gratification in the cattle group, right? <coughs> like they want it now. <laughs> Where's my summary now before I'm driving out of the yard kind yeah. of thing. Uh, but that's good, I get that. So anyways, that's some other reasons to create a new session versus putting them all together in one session. Yes, go ahead. So Troy, with the exact summary, uh, that I was talking earlier, um, once that event is posted, that group that was in the group, we're adding it into the event history as we speak, yes. I think you're the 11th person to tell me that that's... <laughs> But that's good. <laughs> no, but that's really good though, right? So yeah, that, you don't want to post it back because you don't Honestly, that, that, that's why I, I, I'm very confident as we talk here because this is, this, is built, this is built from you guys, right? I mean, you're, you're living this, you're, you're, you're doing this every day. So 
if something needs to be better and work better, then that's what we that's what we're doing there. Troy, have you figured out how to get zero 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 X in here though? Yeah, so you're lucky I don't show that tag on the screen, right? <laughs> You know, we should take a second here and talk about tagging systems, right? Because <laughs> don't do it. Um, I've said this before. You've heard me say this. Tagging systems are like recipes for lasagna. Like, there's hundreds of them, and most of them are pretty good, right? Your mom's was especially good, right? But I remember Sean Wilson. He'd started on herd tracks, and I remember going out there admiring his new main cows, and he's got this brand new blue tag with perfect four zeros on the tag. <laughs> I'm not kidding you. Like who the hell tries to number a cow with four zeros? It must have been one of your US friends or something was talking you into that. But anyways, to his defense, zero technically is not a, a, a numerical digit. And so the reason we don't treat it or have it as an actual number because I know a lot of you like to have a leading zero in the number because it'll denote it was born in 2020, for example. So you have a zero, one, two, one. I get, I get that. But the one thing that everyone's pretty adamant about is you want to be able to sort your list at any given time by tag number, ascending, descending, whatever. And as soon as you start it, allowing the text values of a zero or uh, treat it like a text field with a zero in the front, that all goes out uh, the window. But um, back to that on the tagging, I think it's worth pointing out, and I should have mentioned this in Herd Tracks 101, tag color is mandatory, a tag number is mandatory, tag letter is not mandatory, and tag letter can be up to five characters. It can be a, a number, it can be a letter, it could be a prefix for a lot, but again, it's not mandatory. But we don't allow duplication of the tag color and tag number for the same animal type. So for example, if you've got an orange 92 cow with no letter, you can't have another orange 92 cow in herd tracks. And I won't apologize for it. I mean, because we sort through inventory issues all the time. Because I know someone will say, well, that orange 92 is a red cow, this orange 92 is a black cow. We know, we know the difference. But it's just try to keep some uniqueness within your tagging system. But I've seen a lot of really, really good um, tag systems out there. Sean's just wasn't one of them, that's all. <laughs> Thanks for the humility there, Sean. Um, I've written down here to talk about the feedlot work order and feedlot induction screen, but um, we're going to do that. We're going to address that in the feedlot um, session tomorrow. So now, that's how you put the records in there. Million dollar question, why do we do that, right? This is what I was talking about, you know, the value of, of, of keeping track of this. Well, first of all, first off, treatment history, I think it's undeniable. It's really, really important to know, did you treat that animal before? And if you did treat it before, what did you treat it with? And how long ago did you treat it? Um, you know, doing the same thing over and over again, expecting different res results, you've heard that. Um, you know, you can't just keep giving it Draxin every time. If it had Draxin the first time and it needs something else the second time, maybe you go to Exceed or, or, or something a little bit different. And having that information, I'm not saying you don't have, already have it in books and notes, but Herd Track should be able to show that to you really quick, right? You should be able to look up that animal and see that treatment history at any given time. Tracking of withdrawals, like it's critical, right? I mean, we. We're all in this together. It, 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 it's a big responsibility for us to make sure that uh, withdrawal dates are captured. Most of you, I think, are VBP plus verified, certified. I mean, you just won't get an audit or you won't get a check mark if, if you can't show that you're, you're tracking that information somewhere. It doesn't have to be herd tracks, but it needs to be uh, documented and, and responsibility for that. Your pharma use, right? So. We do have a component in there, and we need to, uh, I know a few of you have struggled with this a little bit, so we need to work through that, but where you can add your pharma as you buy it. And we actually have a, a, a setup that if you're gonna order uh, uh, pharmaceuticals from 
uh, Craig and, uh, and Tommy there, they can get an email, they can fill that drug order, but then that automatically sets up an inventory of those products within your account. Then as you use the products, right, you use 10 mLs of Draxin, right, you use another 200 of uh, liquamycin at some point, it'll offset against your purchased inventory and then you should be able to see you know exactly what you have left at any given time now and then i mean we're not i hear it all the time it's like i know someone ripped someone stole a bottle of draxin i know i know they did i think it was blah 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 right like if you're not tracking it how do you know right i mean but drugs are expensive and so it's worthwhile just kind of knowing where things are at and um so that's one really good reason to to kind of follow that along the other one is your drug costs. You know, what it, what, what, what's it costing you each year, right? I mean, we want, when we get to the feeds and feeding here after lunch, I mean, we want to look at what your feed cost is. Like flipping days like today, if it stays like this for another month, it would be unbelievable what the feed cost is going to be. Um, but we need to know that, right? What ingredients we're putting out the cost. No different with the drugs and, and you know, what did the cow herd cost me last, cost us? Um, from that standpoint. The thing that I really, really like the most um, is the benchmarking. The whole premise for me starting this program back in 2002, and you know, I'm happy to say I started with five clients and I think two of them are here. Four are still with us, one sold their herd. But uh, Jeff and Lori Miller and Harvey M and Owen uh, Tay's family. So, um, but I remember, Owen, I'm gonna, I'm gonna pick on you here. Owen and Harvey have this little pen in front of their chute. Have, you haven't changed that, have you? No. And so then when we're preg checking, that's where all the opens would go. And when I first started working for them, I think they had less than 100 cows. So you'd funnel off a few opens into that pen. And then I remember a couple years later, of course, Owen's dad, Harvey, a prince of a guy, and I've, I've learned so much from him, uh, hus husbandry-wise, too. I need to credit him for it. He was a dairy farmer first. But I remember him saying, Try, I think we're having a wreck here. We've got way more open cows. Look how full that pen's getting in front of the chute here. Well, it was kind of stressful. Didn't have herd tracks going then, of course, or whatever. But... Owen, you know, being as passionate as he was, Brandon wasn't old enough yet, he went and bought a bunch more cows, right? So they had a lot more cows, so yeah, you have more opens when you have more cows. <laughs> the, the conception rate was actually, uh, you know, the same or better. But same thing goes with treatment rates, right? You get, boy, I think we're getting a lot more pneumonia this year in our calves or our, our, our uh, scours, it's, it's uncontrollable. And you know how that is? Weather's like this, you get three scouring calves in a row and you think the wheels are falling off everything, right? I mean, it's three, but it seems like it's 50, right? And the information, you, you just need that, you know, and, and, and maybe sometimes it is increasing and it's getting out of hand. But having that data helps, just not even on the veterinary side, but helps us decide what you know, what new approach to take? Are we having some viral issues? Then we start using intranasal vaccines, viral vaccines on the calves at birth to try and thwart that for the following year. But again, you still need that information. So the benchmarking to me is critical. Um, and then of course you devise protocols and programs uh, accordingly. For verified beef production, you know, for IMI Global in the US, a lot of those verification programs are, are you know, it, it's essential you know, to get a stamp of approval from them. The other thing that uh, when Dr. Kostolansky spoke here last year, we talked a little bit about our branded pharma programs. Now, whether we can, I don't, we're not quite there yet for being able to capitalize on that. But for example, in the SelectVac Gold program, if the calves have had a certain set of vaccines in a certain time frame, and there's some other protocols that involve if the dam was vaccinated, then the calf out of that subsequent dam qualifies for this type of a branded program. Herd tracks will automatically flag that. A lot of you might have noticed that if you're clicking on your customized fields in, uh, um, uh, in the customized columns there, 
you say, well, what's this branded program? And you'll see select that gold, you know, show up in that column and maybe wondered what that was, but that's what it is. Hertrex has gone back into the exact product history that was classified as being a product that can be used um, or fulfill the requirements for that type of classification. So again, I can't speak enough about structured alignment with your herd veterinarian, you know, having a health management program uh, that's supported by the data, right? The data alone isn't really telling you much, right? But if, you, if you're working with someone to help uh, um, put that together for you or, or consult with that, I think it's invaluable. Any comments, guys? Because uh, that's all I had. Sure. Yeah, what, what's our time? Is it lunch? Oh my goodness. I'm gonna be um, late for lunch. Sure, let's, if there's two, let's do it. Yeah, um, so are, are they set up with Bullringer and Bohang? Express, verified, as well as the latest program? Yes, both. Yeah, sorry. Uh, the question was, um, we also, we have the SelectVad Gold uh, branded program set up already uh, working within her tracks uh, for Zoetis, SelectVad Gold, and we also have the Express Verified set up for Bowringer as well. Um, and then, can you have matching calf to cow color tag? Yes, I should have qualified that. You can, the calf can be tagged identical to the cow because it's a calf. And a lot of people do that, so we, we get that. It's just same cows in the herd. That's the issue is having the same tags. Um, uh, but yeah, that's so for sure. If it's a replacement heifer, you will have to re-tag her that, later yeah. on. Good, good comment. George just mentioned, tag the calf the same as the cow. But if you're retaining some of those heifers as replacements, they will need to get a new, unique, different tag. But I think most of them fully get that. It's just at calving time, it's nice to tag them the same. And then this was more for the group um, uh, thing. But uh, when you put in the weight in as a group event, does that record to the animal's file? No, we don't do any group weights right now. Okay, cool. They can reach out to me about discussing that we used to to do that but uh it kind of leads you down a garden path where every calf has this weaning weight or something like that it's so okay we're around for lots lunch is ready and have at her and that's we'll meet back here shortly after one is it going okay you think
Okay, I think we'll get everyone seated. I hope everyone enjoyed their vegetarian lunch. Jeepers. You guys all know the story of what happened years ago, though, right? When they had. Yeah, with the veggie burgers. Jerry Wolf was up from the U.S. He thought they were crab cakes. He said he didn't really care for them. <laughs> like, I don't, and I'm the one that ordered it, so I don't know how the hell that happened. I guess everyone will be good and ready for a steak later. Okay, so similar type approach on this, but we're going to focus on all the repro events. And what I mean by that specifically is your calving, which is timely. I mean, even, even for you commercial people, a couple months goes by in a quick, quickly here. Uh, the breeding events, the preg checking, a little bit on the semen testing. That's more of a vet controlled thing, but just wanted to make sure everyone's aware of that and how it works. And then there's a repro status, a flow of repro status on the animals and the program that helps kind of, I mean, we go through this all the time and why aren't cows on my calving list? And, and um, I know they're here and those kind of things. So I'm gonna talk a little bit about that. And then, you know, again, I'm not gonna, I don't wanna spend too much time going into those because again, it'll be recorded. I was just looking at what DLMS has been doing there and it looks fantastic actually. I, I'm just a little piece in the corner, which is excellent and the screen is, is all her track, so it's, that's really good. But yeah, we'll talk about the value propositions again of what we feel and, and what we know a little bit about you know, why it, it's important to collect that data and, we'll, and I'll show you some, some examples on the screen. So when, when it comes to calving records, and I'll just jump right back to that, it's kind of a chicken and egg, whether we start with breeding or calving or whatever, but um, just remember again the screens can be really customized and um, you know we can we can do some automated defaults and what I mean by that it was already brought up um, you know I said there's lots of tagging systems but traditionally not always the case but traditionally a lot of the commercial herds will tag the calf the same as the cow good practice I think it's easy to pair them and identify them tag colors are can be used differently and then the seed stock herds, you know, as you, as you know, usually start first calf born gets one and then they go in sequence. And then of course they get the year letter, which this year's letters, uh, I guess is gonna be L. Um, and as I mentioned a little bit earlier on the tagging, tag letters are not mandatory. And there's a lot of tagging systems that are using, you know, the last two digits of the year and then a, a, you know, a three digit number, make it a five digit number. There's lots of permutations. The only thing I'll, I'll, I'll mention that if, you're, if you have a tagging system that you, you're wanting to change, regardless of the direction you wanna go, don't go the direction of changing everything all at once, like the scorched earth. I'm gonna cut all the bloody tags out and start over because you're unhappy with it. Um, I'd never recommend that. Uh, what seems to be the most prudent and works the best is with your bred heifers, right? When you go to retag them, which often ha happens, except in, in purebred herds, and start with a, whatever tagging system you feel you want to migrate towards uh, to help create unique IDs. Start with the bred heifers. Boy, it doesn't take long, two, three years, and large percentage of the herd are, um, are tagged the way you want them to. So calving records, We'll just go in. How it's set up currently is, again, you could type an animal. I better just make sure we find. Let, let's just quickly talk about repro status. Um, I'm just going to grab one here and make sure. Okay, green 2080, remember that one. But the repro status, we try to make it flow in herd tracks, and I know it annoys some of you when, you when that happens, but if you initiate a breeding event on your animals in the program, it'll change them to breeding repro status. And once they're preg-checked, pregnant or open, and that event is completed, 
But remember, I know a lot of you don't always preg check the Menherd tracks. But again, the preg checking event, preg or open, will change the breeding status from breeding to either pregnant or open. And then once a calving event occurs on the pregnant ones, uh, that cow will be calved, repro status, or it'll be calved dead. So if it's got a dead calf, it'll say calved dead, or if it's just normally calved, it says calved. And these all just kind of, that's how the events get triggered. And then when you start the breeding event over again, it, they go from calved uh, into breeding status. And that just helps us in lots of different ways. Double, you know, checking inventory, reconciling cows that weren't here, ones that didn't calve, that should have calved, um, those kind of things. So I, I think you can see those permutations in your head. But on the calving list, kind of went a long direction here, but the calving list that I'm going to show you, they'll only show up in the calving list if they have a pregnant repro status. Right? So you've preg checked all your cows, but you didn't put them into herd tracks, and you've got all the pregnants there, but they're not showing up on your calving list. Um, that usually creates some angst, like what, why, why isn't it doing that? The second issue that gives everyone a lot of grief, and this was my doing, um, I don't update, herd tracks doesn't do a full update of the, of the calving list. They can all be pregnant in herd tracks, but the calving list won't update till December 15th of each year. So I've had numerous calls in the last month, why isn't my calving list updated? I'll just give you my rationale for it, and maybe, maybe we should change it. It's just a lot of people aren't done preg checking, right? They're not, they're, and, and so I don't want to update that calving list falsely and, and when it actually isn't complete. But it, I don't think there's ever going to be one system that suits everybody, but that's my rationale. You guys can think about it and, and share with me what you think. Anyways, just like treatments or deads, if I want to, Calve a cow, and the one I found that was pregnant in this list is, I'll pick 28E. You can just look her up on the home screen, and just like doing a treatment, if she's pregnant, that calve icon will show up there. If she's not pregnant or in breeding status or something like that, that's not going to show there. So you select calf, it'll put you into the calving screen. The other way, which maybe is more common for, for all of you, go enter calving. And again, there's what that calving list is supposed to be updated. I'll come back to that. But if I type 28E, and it pops right into the, uh, her calving screen. So just like the other events, this is new you know, for, some, for a lot of you, because we didn't have this there that long. Select fields, right? Um, we're not doing teat scores, we're not doing underscores, we're not worried about the source because we're being calved in our place. So just again, look. Look at the fields you can have on your calving screen if you want, right? And some of you will, right? I know you see the claw set there. Um, uh, that's a big one for the Canadian Angus is wanting you know, those things evaluated and we want to help out with that, right? So we want to help you as seed stock producers collect that data so you can submit it. Um, but just remember, if you're in this screen and you think you've got too many fields or not enough fields, uh, click on that select fields in the, in the top right. So this is a case where in the, the back end, we've defaulted the calf tag. So here's the cow that we selected to calve. And we've defaulted the calf tag to be identical to the dam, even the same tag letter. We can change that to be the same tag color tag number and this year's tag letter, which would be an L. Um, or it could be an L and an E, concatenated together. Lots of different options. But again, what we're trying to do is when you select that cow to calf, it's cold. God help you if you're calving when it's like it is today. Um, we want you to do it on the day it happens, so it defaults to the date. Tag info defaults. If they're all black, that's fine. You can change the, the animal color if need be. Um, but we want you to pick a gender, and if everything's normal, no, nothing was assisted, you just click save. Like we want it to be literally seconds for you to enter that calving record, because I don't want to hear anyone say, oh, it's taken too long to pull out my phone and, 
and put the calving records in. Just, it's, it's not true. And the other thing is it works really, really nice offline. Like we've got a large herd that's got four big locations throughout Alberta, actually one in Saskatchewan, and they'll have a dozen people with their phones offline running around entering calving records all, all at the same time. Not on the same cow, of course, but still entering the same time, maybe syncing at the same time, uh, whatever, with, with really no issues, right? I know Albert's probably gonna try and trip me up here. Is, you know, well, what if we got two guys calving identically at the same time, the same cow, and they go to sync at the same time, what's gonna happen? I don't know. <laughs> I don't know. Should try it. We'll see. Then I'll go. We'll have twins. <laughs> <laughs> what's supposed to happen, it's supposed to take the first sync and, 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 ig and ignore the second one. Um, so while we're in the screen though, I think it's, it's important to talk about a few things, because this is a, Again, these bars, when you're in a phone, collapse, expand. That's how you get to those codes. We intentionally put this damn photo link because in the event, um, uh, we actually don't have the picture for the calf, but now with these Holsteins, we gotta start doing that, but damn photos. So if you've got a cow, she's got a really nice udder, instead of udder scoring or whatever, maybe you just wanna take a nice picture of her uh, with that calf. That's what that's about. You want to look at the damn history, when she was bred. If she had an AI date, it'll show what her expected calving date was. And the other thing that I'll show on here, and it'll lead into our um, uh, uh, breeding component. I got the sire field here. This is what, it's amazing how the breeding events were not being entered in her tracks until all of a sudden if you put the breeding events in, her tracks would tell you if it was the sire or not, or which group of sires belonged to that calf. Boom, all of a sudden the uptick of everyone putting in breeding events like went up a thousand percent. It was really, really good. But again, that brings me back to the value, right? If you're doing this stuff and it gives you a little bit of value, um, you're more compelled to, to do it. So this sire field, again, I went back to this damn history, if she had an AI date, breeding date, and she was due to calve, and she calves plus or minus 12 days to her expected gestation to that breeding, whatever the sire was for that calf, that'll automatically populate in the sire field. So one of the big advantages of that is, no different than the purebred person, now you can, you can pull out your phone, put that calf in, and now you can make the tag and put the sire on the tag, right? I mean, pretty, pretty cool. I mean, again, of course, this is for our uh, purebred groups that have done AI, right? Or single pasture uh, matings, which I know some of you do. Um, if, sorry, you, did you I have was a just gonna say a huge advantage of that too is for anybody that's doing parentage now, you don't realize how complicated that used to be trying to, you know, hunt down the potential sires of any given calf, right? So we just blast against every bull that was potentially alive. Right, so now we've got a list, even on big pasture breeding situations where we could limit it to you know, 15 bulls instead of 80. That's, uh, yeah, the, I mean, the accuracy is better than it's ever been, even if we do the shotgun approach, but the speed of getting it done is much better if you can have a, a finite sire group versus yeah, the, the shotgun approach. And it makes Michelle happier too, right? Where's Michelle? <laughs> She's not here. A um, couple things. So, if, if I calve this cow, I think it said 65 cows on the calving list. If I click save, she comes off the calving list. She can only be calved once, right? So that prevents her from being calved a second time live or even if someone else goes offline after. And then you have a declining balance in your calving list, which that's nice to know when you get down to the last, you know, so many stragglers as to, you know, not only who's late, but oh shoot, these cows aren't even here anymore. It's another form of uh, reconciling your inventory. The, 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 the caveat to that is this twin status. If, if you select that she has twins and mixed or same sex, um, she'll stay on the calving list. And that's basically the process for entering a, uh, twin calvings. You look up the cow, enter her, uh, say she first calf was a twin, save it, go back and select her again and calve her a second time. 
And this, because she'll stay on the list because you said she had twins, you put the info in on the second calf, click save, and then that's, how, that's all there is to assigning uh, the twins. Um, the other thing that happens is, you know, the, to follow along that line of thinking is the grafting and the surrogating of, uh, of calves onto cows, right? So most of the time, if you have twins, one gets grafted onto another cow that that cow maybe lost its cow. I mean, you know the drill. There's lots of reasons uh, that people have to graft calves. It's amazing because I would say, oh, I don't know, 5% of a herd would have graft calves, but it causes so much grief record keeping, right, for just a small percent. I, I've done this for so many years, I still think this is the best approach uh, for that, is you, take, you find the calf, because here's the thing, you're not surrogating it um, the minute it's born. At least I don't, usually you're not, right? It's usually you let the mother up, they get colostrum, they're going for a couple days, this cow can use a calf and you move that calf onto the cow. So I'm gonna, I'm gonna come back to that in a minute as to the best way to do that. And then the dam details, what that's meant to be is just information on the cow, hoof leg score, claw set, and again, that's information that um, uh, could be hidden. But one of the most important fields on the dam details is the alert code. This is the best time to assess these cows for poor udders, right? I mean, you don't want to wait until she's got an 800 pound calf weaned in the fall. And I'm gonna pick on Lori Miller here. And Lori's telling Jeff that she had troubles with that cow's udder and Jeff's like, yeah, but look at this, look at this great calf that she had, right? I don't think we should sell her. <laughs> but it's not just your herd that does that, right? But um, so flag that cow, and which I'm gonna do. I've added, you know, the information on that calf and I'm gonna click save. And now you can see, oh, I guess it was at 64. I got one less cow to calf. <coughs> If you, this is adding new calving records. If I click on this view edit calving, what it's meant to be is just like you're going back into your calving book. So every calf that you've added, um, and you see there's nothing from last year because we reset everything starting December 15th. But every calf added with the most recent one will show up in this list. This is just like your, your, your calf, calving book. You go back, you can click on that record, it takes you right back into that identical screen. You can do some different things with it. And here's the best example of, now you've decided to take that calf, because that cow's got a poor udder, it's got mastitis or something, and um, you want to assign this to another cow, and I'm gonna pick 12. What do we got? I'm gonna assign it to this um, 12 GTB cow, and the reason is, um, bad udder, calf unable to nurse, okay? And that's what we do. And then her tracks handles that really nicely. That cow will not, if that calf weans off at 800 pounds, the, the dam is not gonna get credited with that. It's kind of an asterisk calf. It'll show it in the history, in the progeny history, but when we talk later about how we do uh, indexing and 205 ranking and stuff in the cows, the surrogate calves, of course, get, um, and should be, get, get left out of, the, out of the mix on that. And again, you click Save. And again, you want to add new calving records. You just jump back and forth between Add New Calving Record, View Edit Calving Record. And it's really quite nice on the phone. And again, you can customize those fields. Like you notice I didn't have birth weight on there. A lot of you, of course, collect birth weights. I didn't have a cavity score on there. You want to turn that on, you can put that on. Um, so those are all things I think, it keeps it standardized, I think, and formatted properly, but it also gives you flexibility. Um, Another important differentiation that we get lots of confusion about too is that the, the dam is the recip cow, right? I don't know how many times we always want to put the donor cow as the dam, 
um, and that causes a little bit of confusion in there as well. Yeah. So, so to Wayland's point, that's a good for the from the purebred standpoint. If I go view edit calving list, we go back to this. You'll notice that in this area here, it's surrogate and donor, right? So, back to the breeding events. If you do an embryo implant breeding event in your herd, and we've assigned a donor and a sire, of course, to that embryo. Um, and that cow calves plus or minus 12 days to expect, or the recip calves, the donor will populate as will the sire automatically. But like, again, it's our terminology, potato, potato. I'm calling them surrogates, graft cows. I don't know what, everyone's got their own term for it. But the surrogate is the cow you've moved, the, and, and, and in our contacts, the calf you've moved the, the, the cow you've moved the calf onto. The donor cow, and again, we should probably hide that um, in your fixed account settings you can. If you're not doing any embryo transfer, this, this box should not be here. So there's no chance for confusion on that. So Troy, guys at uh, Craig test after December 15th, can this be updated? Yeah, it can be. Yeah, you just have to manually do the re repro refresh, re refresh dates. OK, so that's. <coughs> That's calving. Let's go into the breeding event, okay? So again, oh, just a, just a little anecdote opinion on twins and surrogates. Um, a lot of times people will calve a twin calf or tag a twin calf, and then when they surrogate that calf, they'll cut the, that tag out and they'll put the surrogates tag in. I recommend you leave the dam's tag in and you, you use some arbitrary color that's not being used, tag color, and you put the cert, like say that's pink, you have no pink tags in the herd except for this reason, and you put in the other ear, you put the, um, the surrogate's number in that. So you have the dam's tag still in there, the real dam, and then you have the surrogate's um, pink tag or whatever that color may be in the other ear, just as a visual identifier. Because I've seen it happen a lot when they're pairing out um, and managing things and they, people get mixed up with the twins sometimes. Okay, breeding. Again, actions, <coughs> breed. Or you could go into the repro and it says enter breeding. Two different ways to get to the same spot. Um, Again, you can do select fields. You want to do body condition, things like that. There's two, basically two types of breeding events. There's single, and that can be AI. It can be an embryo implant, or it can be a natural service. You, you turned out Ferdinand and watched him do his deed on cow one, two, three. So that would be a single mating. Or there's what we call uh, uh, pasture exposure, and I'll, I'll come to that in a minute, and that's when we're doing the group events. And that's maybe the most important one uh, to cover because that's where a, a majority of you do. Some people like to have observed heats on those cows because that'll go into their, their breeding history. Um, so when you're looking up at the history of that cow and you see her messing around, mm -hmm. you can go back quickly in her history and say, oh yeah, it's about 20 days ago, you know, she was in the heat, she, she's coming back in again, those kind of things. So. Um, valuable stuff, but let's, you know, the most common thing is if I pick AI, today's date, this is, I, I alluded to this where if you have your semen tank inventory updated and put into place, um, you can pick, you know, a straw out of that tank and it'll trigger who the sire is. You can say if it's sex semen or not, we're starting to get, you know, into that realm now. And you can put who the technician was. Um, it's like a competition at some places to see who, who gets the best conception rates. Um, I've even heard stories that when they know they, they're not getting the horn or the, the cervix threaded properly, they intentionally put someone else in the technician side. <laughs> I'm not trying to give you any ideas or anything, but. Um, and then you pick your sire. If I just pick any bull, and this is kind of interesting. This 43A bull is a bull that's just loaded locally. That's why he's in black font. 
every one of these other bulls are that sire alliance grouping that I told you about, where there's just a, one big large bank of bulls um, to pick from, from, uh, from that group. If you were not wanting to be part of that alliance sire thing, none of those blue font uh, bulls would show up. But I think it was important to, to make you aware of that. So again, you put the AI in and you click save. And so there's a breeding record. It's done for that animal. Um, really nicely done on the phone, shoot side, especially on the AI, uh, especially for putting embryos in. You probably noticed there I have ET LCL, left, left side implant, uh, ET RCL. Sometimes it's just nice to track um, people that are doing the implant. Some people are better on the right horn than they are on the left horn. Again, I don't want to get into too many details, but it's even for the implanter, it's nice to, uh, to have that information. So it, you, you pop all those, those breedings in for the day and then they're there, they're uh, able to view for history. And again, if this cow, um, let's see, that's 34F. I'm just going to go and post that uh, breeding event, which would have been this one. So if I go to 34F now, and I go into her history, you know, you can see she was AI'd. Estimated calving date based on today would be September 29th and who the sire was. And again, if she calves plus or minus 12 days, you know, to that um, date, it'll put the sire. Now that's not 100%. Don't ask me where I come up with 12, because we've all seen cows that are two weeks early, two weeks late, still might have to do some DNA. It's not that exact, but 12 days just seems to be a, you know, a, 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 a interval that we, we've gone with. Now, as far as doing a group breeding, and I guess what I mean by group breeding, and, this, and you can do this, you AI a bunch of cows, and we have everyone sometimes kick the bulls out the same day, right? which I, I don't really advise that, maybe the next day. Um, but um, AI your cows, put 50 cows out with two, you know, two cleanup bulls subsequent to that AI. Hurt tracks will still sort out the calving dates best it can based on that window of gestation length and when, when the breeding window happened. And if there was two bulls and they calved miss the AI according to herd tracks and calve to those two bulls, it'll show in the pedigree tree potential sires, two, you click on it, those are the two bulls. And as Whalen was alluding to when we're submitting DNA for parentage, you know, we can take all the calves that were out of that pasture group uh, results and just send them and try and do a match against those two sires instead of, again trying to do the, uh, the shotgun approach. I think ultimately the more, the, the more we can fine tune our, our methods for submitting that and refining the data that we send to the lab, it'll get cheaper. Because I, I, I took a tour of the lab, right? And the number one cost in the lab, and let Michelle can chime in if it changes, the reagents and the chemicals they use. I mean, the hardware is the hardware. You got the machines and sequencer, sequencers and stuff like that, but you start using all these reagents up needlessly because you're double, triple testing and again, shotgunning the approach, there's a cost. I, th I think it could get to that if you can refine your bull, your calf parent sire list of max of four bulls to this number of calves, I think we could get the price down significantly. And I've argued for a while that if the price got between five and $10 an animal, everybody would parentage test. I, I know I would, right? Look at the value you get for an RFID tag that you spend 350 on and the value that you're gonna get for knowing the sire. So that's my opinion on that. Um, okay, so if we're gonna do a, a group breeding, I'm just gonna pretend and grab this group of 28 animals. But however you get to a list of cows, you can go to this and you click group breeding. And just like we were gonna do a group treatment, Here's all these cows, and remember, you can micromanage that list. These three cows happen to be missing, maybe. For some reason, they were sorted off. So we'll go into the breeding screen. 
The difference being now is we're doing a pasture exposure group. We now have a start date and an end date. And you can start assigning sires. I'll uh, just do it. one more bull. So you can sign those bulls. You got a start date, end date, but we don't know when we're pulling the bull yet. So what you end up with is a breeding event of these 25 animals, and you can put what pasture they're in, you know, needs, needs a bull pull date or whatever. And that's where you could use that calendar, right? To where you think you're gonna pull the bulls, pull the bulls and update and close off the breeding event and herd tracks, right? And that calendar notification is something you could do there. But again, you, that's done, you open up that event, and if you need to, you know, you just pick that date. It won't let you pick future dates, but you pick to when um, you pull that. And th so then you've, you've managed all your breeding events. Back to the repro status, you've now triggered all the cows that were calved or pregnant that didn't calve, open that didn't calve. Those ones now get triggered to breeding. So you can see how you can follow through the repro status, the inventory, and who's missing and who is there and because it's always it's always a challenge to know which cows I, I mean I don't know if anybody ever brings in their cows and preg checks them and AIs them and does those things and it's always exactly the number they thought that was going to be there right I mean there's always some some missing okay try if you have a multi-sire group, I recommend to put one event per bull. So if you have to pull one, uh, one out of the breeding season because he has foot rot or some, some, any event, you don't have to start from scratch and recreate all the breeding events because one bull was there for 10 days and the other three bulls were there for two months. That's an excellent point because that happens all the time um, where someone's bull gets hurt. And currently, if we set it up with four bulls, 100 cows, and we start, we start the breeding event on June 1, and June 30th, bull 1, 2, 3 gets hurt. He's out. You have to close off, currently, this is the way I showed you, you close off that event, and you just do a copy paste and restart another event on June 30th, July 1, with the new set of bulls. But what George is saying is actually very clever and a, and, a, and a good way to do it is if you've got 100 cows with four bulls, just put 100 cows with one bull, four different breeding events of 100 cows with each bull. And, and then put the bull name in the comments. Put the bull name <laughs> in the comments and close when he gets hurt. It's like you're, you're planning on him getting hurt though, George. <laughs> they all do. <laughs> <laughs> but it, it's actually, it's good, it's clever. Um, I, I like that approach actually. I've never actually tried that, but it makes, it makes perfect sense and how to do that. Because everybody has a sore bull, a hurt bull, something like that, that, that happens. And again, trying to think of it from the computer logic side, that's the only way you can, you can't just pull the bull out because herd tracks is thinking, you know, if you take him right out of the breeding event, he's gonna think he was never there. You know what I mean? Because you haven't closed it off. You just removed the bowl from the, from the entire event. So Troy, it allows you to use a cow multiple times then? In a breeding event? In breeding yeah. events? Yeah, yeah. It didn't used to. What? Yeah, I don't think it used to do that. That's it. I just lo I love herd tracks because there's always a million different ways to do everything, right? And everyone's mind works a little bit different. I would have never thought about that way of doing it. I would have done it like you said, just you know, breed the cows, you know, and then end it, bring in the new set of bulls for the next period of time, right? Yeah, because in lieu of that, if you look in here, you'll see when I open this group event up, right? Um, yeah, duplicate. Yeah. So that's where you can make it easier in yourself, close off the event, duplicate it, start the new one with the new date and just remove a bull. So either or. And then 
lastly, we've, before we start talking about the value that I think is involved, because that um, there's a semen evaluation program in there. Wayland uses it exclusively, so a few other vets do as well. Digitizes all your uh, your semen testing forms. Um, it's only set up though so the vets can access for obvious reasons, right? I get calls lots where how can I enter my own semen tests? Well, you can't. Um, it has to be a DVM logged in doing it in, in your account. Um, but it's sure nice to have from a history standpoint when you go back to do those bowls and you can look at, you know, instantly scrolls circumferences, you know, if you are doing a full morphology count, motility, stuff like that, lots of, lots of compares can be Oh, it opens up an entire new world of analytics and you start to wonder why you do so many. Yeah, <laughs> that too. But of course it needs to be printed for all the sale bulls, like uh, it's gonna start pretty soon, right? Yeah. Yeah, yippee <laughs> <laughs> All right. Waylon, you're pulling the tape too hard, Jesus. Oh man. yeah. <laughs> 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 Let me show you how it's done. <laughs> Got that foot okay, on we'll the shoot and yeah. <laughs> oh, I don't miss those days at all. I got to tell you a, a quick anecdote here. I don't want to pick on Gail Hamilton too much. But, <laughs> Every year. <laughs> but Dr. Oliver Schunick is one of the great consultants and friends that works with us. He couldn't be here today, but he helps Waylon uh, semen test at their place. And Oliver, Oliver can sweat, but when he's at Gail's place, he sweats a lot. <laughs> And I'm like, Oliver, why don't you take that rubber suit off? Like, it's obviously making you really hot. And he says, no, it's got, it's got nothing to do with the rubber suit, he said. He says, if you've got Gail standing over your back worried that, uh, telling you that you just missed a really good shot out the side of the chute there, that, uh, that makes you sweat. <laughs> Anyways, the land door. Okay, why do we enter calving records, breeding records, preg check records, track repro status? Well, I'm just going to go through some of these things, and of course, George and, and Waylon will, will touch in on it. But first of all, one of the things you're going to see when we do this indexing, um, uh, for replacement retention, like this, it, as you do calving records, um, it'll, herd tracks will build the pedigree tree. And I mean, it's like a, a, an entirely linked pedigree tree. You click in, and you already know this, you click anywhere in that tree, it takes you to that animal, its history, its linkages, et cetera. Um, and one of the things that I know you've all established is when you retain replacements, you get to follow those great cow families or those great, you know, genetics that it's, it's actually really, uh, satisfying for us that when you guys first start doing this and we you point out that this cow's got five daughters in the herd and three granddaughters and you're like well I knew she had some in the herd but I didn't know she had that many right so there's there's so much value to, to knowing that and some of you will say oh that's really micromanaging that's great if you got 50 to 100 I don't care we, the people we have that got 5,000 sure nice to know that you know these heifers have got that kind of a profile um, and you can pretty much flag them as a prospect, um, you know, based on the dam's history a lot of time. The other reason we like to do it is from a line breeding standpoint. There's a, you probably noticed there's that, that link in there, but it'll show the relatedness in the pedigree, right? So if there's any line breeding or double breeding, and I, I'm not here to talk about how bad that is and stuff, but if you're in a commercial herd, you're likely not wanting to do too much of that, right? So you got this new bull that was a heifer bull. Now he's gotten big and heavy and he's graduated physically into a cow bull. You really don't want him three years down the road breeding the daughters, things like that, right? It happens all the time if you're not tracking, you know, these sort of, sort of linkages. And I'm not gonna say you're gonna have two-headed calves and weird things like that, because again, controlled line breeding is a practice that's still present today, but you definitely reduce your heterosis and your hybrid vigor. And if you're a commercial producer, you know, I would say that's not a, that's not a great thing. Um, the progeny performance and, and, and calving intervals. So when I'll show you again in our ranking that the maternal index on these cows is related to an MPPA, a 205 day index on the cows, um, plus how early they calve in the calving cycle. So first of all, knowing the calving date of the daughters or the, or the, or the calves that you, you've had 
and over time knowing which cows are producing or giving you a little bit more performance. I'm not here to advocate you just pick all the big ones, right? It's, it's far from that, but there are cows that do tend to, to do better genetically, whether it be milk and, uh, and or genetics. And the calving interval is really important as well. Cows that continue to calve early in, in the first cycle are desirable, right? You can't know that if you're not doing calving records on their, on their calves. I mean, you hear this all the time at the animal science seminars. Oh, you gotta pick all those heifers out of those first cycle cows. Well, I guess you can sort them all off even though you haven't done anything with them into a group and then pick those heifers, but it's just so much easier if you, you actually put a, put a date beside them. Because it's true. I mean, fertility is the key, right? It doesn't matter how great the performance is, how great the carcass is, all of those things. I mean, if we don't get them pregnant every year and, and have a little bit of longevity to go with it, 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 we're shooting ourselves in the foot. Linking surrogates, flagging <coughs> twins, identifying those sires through breeding history. I mean, that's been the biggest uptick in value, I think, since, and Wayland's really taken it to a new level is, you know, identifying sires in these commercial herds. And we've learned a lot, too. Back to the semen testing. Tremendous. Not a lot of correlation sometimes between the great semen tests and the ones that sire a lot of calves. You know, I'm, I'm, I'm not here saying to quit semen testing by any means, but there's more work needs to be done to kind of explore that a little bit. Flagging problem cows. Calving time is the best time to do that. Your bad legs, bad hooves. I mean, if, if you are entering a calving record, already, whether it be a book or whatever, that's when that cow needs to be, udder needs to be evaluated, hoof and legs, maybe, maybe not disposition because you want to be in protective a little bit, but some of them can be, be problems. And then as we get back in later into the, the, the uh, ranking and indexing, we all find that group of cows that are what we call uh, voluntary culls, right? They get pregnant every year, they give you a calf every year, but they're just always in the bottom part of the herd. They're just never indexing very high. And so you can identify those cows, and what we found is you, have, you flag them, and if you're not gonna cull them, which we don't always necessarily think that's what you need to do, we start building planned breeding groups. So those cows, you'll say, okay, these are our bottom 30 cows, three years in, the, uh, in a row in the herd now, um, let's give their calves an uh, orange tag and we'll create a breeding group from that and let's give them another chance. Let's mate them to a bull that we've now got bull date on because we've been uh, ranking bulls based on um, uh, muscling, marbling, cavities, those kind of things and maybe give that cow a little bit of be better chance to have a better calf and shift her position on the bell curve a little bit to the right. Back to the breeding, you know, setting up calving lists are really important. I mean, I've talked to several of you already. Everyone likes to know what, you know, what's coming down the pipe, especially if you've got anything close these days, the weather. Um, but also it helps us, you know, once we have that information, we can troubleshoot the conception rates, pregnancy issues, single sire or sire group. Lots of times we'll have an entire cow herd preg checked and it'll be, 89% conception, right? So 89% pregnant. A wreck? No. Great? No, right? Just not fantastic. And then you go back to the breeding groups, and it's actually 95, 94, 95 on a lot of the groups, and then there's one group that's, smaller group is 20% 20, 20 open. It helps you drill right in uh, to help evaluate those, you know, target, because it, you know, it's always the guy, usually, right? So, can't, can't blame all the cows, right? <laughs> so, uh, so you zero in on the bull and, or a group of bulls and, and help troubleshoot it from there. Um, back to the, one of these parameters that we, Wayland calculates, he's gonna show some information on it. Pounds of calf per, Pounds of calf weaned per pregnant cow, and then pounds of calf weaned per exposed cow, right? Again, you go to these animal science uh, talks and you read about it, it's like, boy, those are the holy grail of metrics. Well, they're, they're tough, they're tough to get, right? Unless you've got good data. 
And Wayland shows that in, in the benchmarks, and those are really nice, valuable um, metrics to have. But again, you can't have it if you don't have some data to go along with it. Preg checking, you know, uh, that is, I think preg checking is maybe in your cow herd, and even for those that don't do it, I'm going to still stand here and say it. I think it's the most important time of the year with your cows. The most the best evaluation that can be done in those cows. I, even as a younger veterinarian, I got caught up in like, well, really, what's the economics of, you know, cow prices are low in October and, you know, we're just identifying pregs and open and most of these people are retaining the opens and feeding them longer. And I totally missed the boat there, right? Because yes, number one, you want to identify pregnant versus open, first and foremost, absolutely. But you have, now you have your chance to sort off your culls, right? Those those uh, involuntary culls, of course, the opens, the disease, the bad udders. Maybe cull some of those ones that were poor performance. You get a chance to assess the body condition score. And your vet's a really key uh, person to do that. I mean, we all get barn blind. I don't know how many times I've talked to people and I'm thinking the cow's pretty skinny. I think the cow's pretty thin. And the guy, oh, what are you talking about? You know, they're just working a little bit. They're, you know, she's fine. Mm, I don't know, right? Sometimes it's nice to have different assessments on that. Um, you can weigh the cows, give you an idea where they are year to year. I know a lot of you like doing your wean, wean ratios, right? You want to see a cow that's weaning 50 or percent or better of, um, of her body weight. You get a chance to benchmark and compare your conception rates from year to year. I know whalen has been working with a couple of herds that, again, nothing horrible, but you know, an AI program coupled with some single bull mating groups, stuff like that, a lot of things going on, but the data certainly help sort through that and follow it up. And uh, you know, who is missing? This is where you get to really nail down your inventory uh, as to which cows you have there, which ones didn't come home for some reason. Um, so. It, I, I do think it's one of the, whatever time of year you do it, I know a lot of you are purchasing your own uh, ultrasound machines, you're doing your own preg checking um, for lots of different reasons, you know, shortage of veterinarians available to do it, weather, timing, there's lots of that going on. But to me, that, that event in the fall, because a lot of you, that's the only time you handle those cows, right? Individually, right? Is that one time through the shoot, so. I think it's a really important time for not only collecting data, updating tags, putting in new RFIDs that have been lost, um, that sort of thing. So that's my value proposition list for reproductive parameters in the herd. Happy to take what you guys, what I missed. I just want to build on, like the preg checking event is turning into such an important event because we are promoting to only send these cows through the shoot one time a year almost. Like if you're not giving a scar guard vaccine, they're gonna get a, you know, a modified live post breeding vaccine now, one time a year. So um, and we usually have a fresh set of indexing at that point, the, the calves have been weaned, they've gone through the shoot. So I mean, all of a sudden we're thinking about planning the breeding groups for next spring, right? We know who's on the bottom, we know who's maybe gonna join an elite herd if there's enough cows to do that. Lots of times we have DNA back, we know what breed the cows are. I mean, we're st even at that point, we're already thinking about the breeding, uh, the breeding groups, like for, you know, and flagging them so that because they're not going to go through the shoots. You got someone's got to be on a horse, or you know, sorting them visually. Um, so at that time, you know, it's an opportunity to flag them, right? Just to show something. Yeah, um, sure. You know, to try to maximize our pounds for the next season, right? George is going to show us some. You have my all the clients in yeah, there. Yeah, should be. Just cloak the eggs. Okay. Protocols are in there, are they? Yeah. We didn't. I think maybe this is George's going, but the AI, the uptake of AI in the commercial herds for a lot of you is um, is really you know, taken off. I mean, back, there was a few people that were AI in, you know, 20 years ago, but I think it's the synchronization programs, of course, where you actually don't have to have a trained technician on site. You can hire someone to come for the day, 
to inseminate your synchronized group, 50 to 100 head of heifers or young cows, and um, pretty practical, and a lot of you are taking advantage of that. So um, it's nice to, again, work with your veterinarian and uh, get you know some advisory consultation on the best program to set up for that and how to manage it, and realistic expectations too, right, as to conception rates and all of that. Um, I just wanted to show you if you're going to do a fixed time AI, you can set up protocols that are linked together. So first day you start the synchronization program, you set up the protocol with your vet, and then it will automatically generate the next, the next step in your program. And the, the, uh, the event will be generated automatically into her tracks. So if you know the group didn't change, there's no mistake, everybody is there, you don't have to type in every cattle showing up at the shoot on the second treatment of the protocol. You just need to confirm that everything was done in that group, and you keep going with all the sequences of the protocol. So that, that's pretty cool stuff. And, uh, and they'll get an email notification of that too. Right? Yeah, you yeah. can put a reminder. Um, and uh, if you're gonna do fixed time AI, sometime it goes really fast. You may, uh, you may have two AI technicians, a bunch of cows, some employees. It needs to run through pretty smooth. So uh, if you uh, wanna make it work pretty good, I'll just remove some stuff so it's easier. Okay, so uh, an example is uh, 80 cows roughly to be AI'd on the same morning. You're gonna have two herd groups, two AI technicians, eight AI sires, three cleanup bulls, two semen tanks. How do you manage it with herd tracks? That's pretty straightforward. You put an alert on the cow that says which bull are you gonna use in which semen tank and in which canister and in the sort, you're gonna put the pasture exposure information. So you can even sort them coming out of the shoot after the IAI to get your groups for pasture cleanups. And you mentioned the bulls they're gonna be turned out with, so after you're done, you can create group events and everything is there. So you can see that cow was not AI'd at all. She was exposed to bulls and uh, Select one of those cows, uh, George, and go right into the breeding event. Just pick one. Um, and let's go up uh, into no actions. No, go back. We're, we'll delete it. Just go breed. So you can see at the top of the screen. So that pasture exposure is there in the AI information. So it's pretty quick. You have somebody lying that just sits right beside the alleyway and she, the, that person calls the shot to the AI technician to thaw the right semen straw. It's pretty, pretty easy. George's accounts take pictures of all their cows. You guys got to get with it. Okay, any questions, comments on herd reproduction? Number one most important part of your cow herd. Okay, take two minutes, have a stretch. We'll start in about another five. We're gonna do feeds and feeding. Okay, thanks guys.
it is a basic, you know, feed tracking program on the cow side. You do a little bit of TMR stuff, but you know, there's been more and more interest with some of the smaller, again, small, you know, smaller mid-sized feedlots that currently don't have a um, a feeding application to, you know, and they're already using herd tracks to try and incorporate that a bit. So, so it's evolving, um, you know, quite quickly actually. So. Um, what we're going to do here today is Waylon is going to talk about the basics of entering feed in your account if you want that option within the program. I know several of you uh, here today are already using uh, that. Uh, ingredients, rations, you know, how you select a ration to feed. Uh, you can feed using this grid screen. You can feed using mixed loads. You can do bunk calls. So it's kind of all there. I'll be right up front though, that one of the limitations we have versus our competitors is we're not linked currently to the scale heads on the wagon if you're doing TMRs, which is, a, you know, I think that's a pretty sweet thing if you can have on your screen, have it show a number and you touch on the screen and that's the number that goes in. So we're aspiring to that, but that's not present. So everything that we're talking about today, you need to either on your phone or your tablet or a laptop in the feed truck, if that's how you're gonna use it. Scale head says 1220 or 12,020, you, you've gotta type that, uh, that value in currently as it, uh, as it is today. And then once Wayland's done that, then Cameron Olson is going to, you know, talk about a, a feeding service module. Because remember I talked about these different modules, herd track success managers, virtual vet, managers, whether it be through, you know, the veterinary groups that are represented here today or your own vet group. But again, ultimately just trying to give you a little bit more value uh, and some options uh, with, you know, for those of you that are using the program. So Cameron will present that, might you know, be a little bit of discussion as to the value that they think they can bring. These guys, you know, they consult with all the larger uh, feedlots already on, at a very high level. Same with Zach Paddock, who's here uh, it's, it's you two and who else, Matt, me, that, or just you two are running the nutrition thing a little bit. Alberta, it's you and me. Yeah, in all of Alberta. So, so keep that in mind so when we have a break and you have some other nutrition questions like what do you feed the cows today that keeps them warm and not cost too much, right? But anyway, so I'll turn it over to Waylon. I'll, I'll chime in if I need to, but otherwise we'll just kind of go through the basics again in herd tracks to get started. So I want to thank you, Troy, for giving me the part of the presentation that I use the least. So um, I, I, I can't say that I've entered a lot of feed into the program. I do know how it works quite well. Um, the success of the whole thing, most of the feedback I get from clients is that, um, you know, is mostly about inventory management, right? Um, using an individual animal um, program as a feeding program, of course, has its limitations because um, you need to know where the animals are, especially if you're feeding by, um, by pen. Most of the time we can get the management groups sorted out, um, you know, trying to figure out exactly what pen they're in, you know, and even when we go back through the feeding history, we can see, you know, sometimes there's two or three movements that cattle have migrated through the feed yard. Um, and then as we're trying to enter feed in historically, the computer thinks they're in a pen and the inventory doesn't match them and everything. So, you know, part of the discussion about talking about this feeding program really is talking about trying to keep the inventory straight, right? Um, and then the, it works a lot better. I'll just comment on that. I mean, the inventory is critical, right? <laughs> a lot of programs don't deal with it on an individual basis like we do. And the best example is if you've got 100 animals in a pen today, but Monday there was 92, you go back to feed on Monday or you want to backdate some feeding because you put it on paper, you didn't feed it at that time, you think it should be feeding 100, it's going to show 92. Like the, the inventory is exact and that's back to a little bit of what I alluded to earlier about the dates and the timing of the movements. What, and you can feed by management group, you can feed by a location, and you can feed weekly or monthly, you know, prorate all the feed, add it all up, how many bales, et cetera. But the inventory has to be, individuals have to be exact uh, for it to be effective for you. The dates matter. And more and more I'm realizing in a program like this, the, every time you do anything in this program, the date that you're using matters quite a bit. 
Um, so we could look in the program. You can see on the uh, you know left hand side, we open up the feeding tab, and we have a lot of different options here. So if we get back to the root of everything, we got to start with our we got to get our ingredients in there. So this is the test account. All the ingredients are set up. Of course, there's a feed inventory now, um, which if you put the inventory of bales and feed, it will slowly reduce that amount um, as things are fed. You can see the units we have, uh, you know, by bales, pounds. So we just open one of these up, 2017 hay. You know, there's a place for, you know, details from your feed test, including inventory. Um, and then the other thing at the bottom is the amount um, that is being billed out. And if we go to edit, you can see there's a lot of different ways to add this in here. And there's a lot of machinery in the background that's been programmed to, um, you know, feed by bales, you know, use the amount that's um, being billed by pounds, tons, bags, blocks, tubs. Cow calf guys love to feed in all sorts of different increments. So there's you know, there's a million different ways to kind of price this. And then the important thing about the pricing is that as new, as the price changes, we just add more lines, right? So then the, you know, it will use the pricing in the, in the reports, um, you know, we'll use it up to a certain date. And then as the price changes, it'll start using the new, uh, the new price of the ingredient to start calculating the, um, the cost of the ration and the daily feed. Okay, so we'll save that. So then the next part of this, of course, is um, rations, right? So this is where you would take um, more along the lines of, uh, you know, it'll do it both ways. It'll do a TMR and also do it by the unit. So if we do, is there any rations in here? Ration, oh, here we go, you know, test 30. This is kind of the traditional TMR that you'd be feeding in a feedlot. 30% uh, barley ration set up by percent. Okay, pretty straightforward. And then there's also stuff, um, you know, bedding is also another thing that comes in here. Let's say, so we'll go, um, you know, I think that mostly bedding is not being fed this way. Most of the, fedding, uh, the bedding is being done, or straws, or straw bales, uh, hay bales is all done just as additional ingredients, actually. I don't think you would feed this way. Uh, this is mostly for a TMR, I believe, because you wouldn't go 100% Yeah, here. bedding would go as an additional ingredient. Yeah. Okay, so then we have, um, so if we go into the feeding history just real quick, we can see what has been done here already. Because uh, a lot of this stuff, um, you know, the bunk calls, um, formula, the mixed loads and stuff is based on what was fed yesterday, right? So um, there's some data in here that's great. We can see in, let's say, today's the, so 19th, we had pen four, you know, was fed a 40% ration, you know, and then there were some additional ingredients fed here in the end. The interesting thing that most people don't realize that this, um, you know, how this program calculates feed compared to d other programs is that you're, usually the feeding program will just take the amount of feed that's dumped into a pen and it'll just divide it by the number of animals that are in the pen, right? And everybody gets assigned that feed cost. The one thing that's kind of interesting about um, herd tracks is, you know, it does assign, if there was an incoming weight coming in, it will assign the feed um, to animals based on the last weight of them, right? So the heavier, and that's based on a metabolic weight Correct, Troy? Is that yep. still how it works? Yep. So, um, so that being said, the larger animal, um, you know, gets charged more for feed than the than the smaller animal. So, if you're feeding light cattle in a heavy pen, you're not getting charged for the amount that the, you know, that the average weight of the pen would be, right? So that's kind of the power of having an individual animal program like that, where you, especially in some lots where the pen you know, weight, you know, backgrounding lots, you're collecting calves from a lot of different places where the weight sometimes isn't that close in one, in one pen, right? So when you click on that, this is the inventory of the pen and this is who's in it and this is, would be what they weigh, right?
Okay, so we're going to set up, um, of course, your feeding list. You can go, this is where you would do some searching. You know, you can search by location, you know, management group, rationing being fed, and of course, a date range to kind of see what's been done. So for an example, we know that uh, pen four was uh, fed there. So we can use that as an example here. And we'll go to... Um, You know, this, so the first step you would go, you go to your bunk calls and you would say that uh, in pen four, let's say we were, you know, you would score this. A lot of guys have different ways of doing this. You know, one, two, three, you know, let's say there was, um, you know, we're at a two, you know, a lot of times that's a free text field, however you're, however you're doing that. We're gonna continue to go to a test 40 um, and let's say today we are going to add, you know, one pound of dry matter. And just to comment on that, and Zach, you can comment quickly on that. We've added that bunk score system in there, but we haven't <coughs> currently linked it to anything. But what, what ultimately, you know, Zach and Cameron have built a model to where if it's a bunk score one, you can explain I'd like for, as an example, a slick bunk is a one, is that? Uh, yeah, you can make the system fit. Or zero or whatever. Or, but whatever, but yeah. if it's so many days of a certain score, yeah. it'll automatically trigger what that dry matter pound change should be. Yeah. Like if you're really familiar with what you're doing and you're feeding all the time, like Whalen did, you can, you can adjust that number and put it in on your own uh, but I think it'd be better if we got into the scoring system. Do you have any comments yeah. on that, Zach? Well, the scoring system we came up with is just zero through four. Other people have similar systems. I mean, it's slick, crumbs, what have you. But it allows anybody really to go in there and train up how to call bunks fairly easily versus you've got kind of the guys that have done it forever can say there's 100 pounds left, I'm going to take 100 pounds off. Right. And this does it. Most time we do it. Uh, this is dry matter pounds per head, which goes back to what Waylon said, where you got to kind of have the inventory right in the pen to be able to adjust the call that way. Um, but yeah, right now, like Troy says, it's not linked to anything, but we do have the algorithm, and we'll probably, I mean, when we build it, we'll build it open enough that, you know, if you've ever seen AMS or some of the other bunk reader screens, they believe it pretty open where you can create your own if statement. You know, if you don't want to use our, so our algorithm or your vet's algorithm, you can even create your own that says if this, this, and this happened, it'll give you a suggested, you should change it by this much. Yeah, and so I think the nice thing there, you can use the score or not use the score. And like, like a lot of things in, in uh, herd tracks, the flexibility of following a protocol or just using you know, a product, a treatment product that you wanna use. What, what Waylon's showing here is yesterday's feeding, some mock feeding. I apologize, I, I just didn't feel comfortable using anyone else's feeding account for demo, but so we, we kind of set up some feed in, in this test account. But those are yesterday's feeding, and so what's showing to the right was total as fed that was fed. And it, if you adjust uh, you know, the dry matter, when you go to mix the loads for these uh, on the call, It'll, it'll show you that that pen needs to get a, a little bit of extra uh, feed based on that. So there is a little bit of a flow here, right? That might, you know, even myself, I haven't done this in a while. Like there is kind of a flow of screens that you need to go to, right? So I'm just trying to, you know, you got to start off with your bunk calls. There has to be some data there, right? Otherwise it, it kind of doesn't work. Then the next step you go into usually is your bat sheet where you're actually there with the truck um, ready to mix a load. So we went to our test 40 ration, which we've changed, right? So now we have, you know, we've adjusted the amount of dry matter that we wanted to, fed, to feed, and our adjusted amount is 424 um, pounds, right, to mix. So it shows that change has been done. So we're going to go and um, do the suggested change and then we're gonna calculate the batch. So then once you do that below, it'll tell you how much, you know, based on the feed ingredients of barley, mineral, and silage that are in this ration. So cumulative amount. 
So this adjusted amount is as fed then, I guess. Yeah. Yeah. OK. So then once we have that, um, we, know, we know how much needs to go into the feed wagon for this specific load. So then what we will do is we'll create, um, you know, create the mix load, which is actually what we're going to put into the truck, OK? So usually we start off with, um, I remember usually when I was making these rations, we would always try to figure out, we would put the, um, the silage usually on the top, right? Because I think, remember how this mix load works is that we want to put the thing that we're going to be off of the most is probably going to be the thing that we're putting the most of in the wagon. In this case, it would be silage, right? So as we, um, let me just see if this works. So we, we're, we're aiming for 249 pounds. Let's say we get a little, um, you know, we put too much in and we're at 260. And that's assuming you got the right amounts of the other stuff. Yeah. So that, yeah, we have to start at the top with this, don't we? Yeah. And yeah. you can change the load order, but that's, this is just how the loader is set up in this example. Barley first, mineral second, silage third. So now it won't work because I screwed it up. Just go back and start it again. Yeah. Okay, so we'll go back to, so I guess the order of the ingredients, how we set up that ration really doesn't matter. Um, so we'll go back to our batch sheet, um, test four, 424. Great. Okay, so barley, let's say we you know, put 175 in by accident. So what it does is it readjusts the amount that needs to go into the load based on adding too much. Right? Usually we don't add too little, we usually add too much. So then we're calling for um, six pounds of mineral. Usually we're pretty close on that. Oh no, it's got to be the total. 175, so it'd be 181. Yeah, you could, and you could change either one of those boxes. So you could actually change the six to so you can either change the net amount or you can change the load, to the scale total as well. Yeah. Doesn't matter which field you change. Oh, and then, it, okay. So then of course we're trying to get to the end. We're gonna change that again. We're at 430, so we hit, um, you know, 430. It won't do any adjustments if I put 435 in this case, which is why, you know, last time I used this, we would try to put the silage on the top, right? The thing that we were gonna screw up the most on the weight, we would put kind of at the top of the list. The advantage of this, because, and that's like Wayland said, there's a flow, but we, we have the option where you can just use a batch mix recipe. Hopefully it's close. You go with that and you deliver it to the bunk at X number of pounds. A lot of people still feed that way. It'll still break out how much barley, silage, and, and mineral that you fed. Where we want to be more specific, barley is not $3 a bushel anymore, right? And so, even whether it's you're charging for this or not, you want to track, you know, it, it's interesting because I talk to people, even with the really, really nice feed systems, they get it pretty exact, but still you're tipping loads of silage. You guys know how all that works with, with buckets and stuff. And you, it, to me, it's just nice to record exactly what you put in the load, even if the ratios are off a little bit, at least you know when you go to deliver to the feed bunk, deliver to those animals, the, pr the amounts get assigned and the prices get assigned, it's representing exactly what was put into that load. But again, there's an, you can just do it close, follow the recipe like you did on that first screen. You know, don't even record the fact you put 175, just say it was 170 even though it was 175, and then go feed it. So I, I think what you've put out there is, I mean, we've got three different ways to do this. We're gonna have to have a flow for you just want to feed by ration, or you want to feed by mixed load, mm -hmm. or you want to feed by grid. One of the one of the three, and then it'll take you through the steps that way. Yeah, this is just an optional step, right? Yeah. Like I would say, how many people are using the mixed loads? Is anyone using the mixed loads on a daily uh, basis? I don't think anybody in here is. Probably nobody is. Most people use it as a batch sheet. You put the ingredients in, and it'll tell you how much needs to go into the wagon for the batch, and they'll try to get close, right? This is kind of a, you know, and. An extra step that's built in here, I'm showing it to you, but I know um, probably underutilized at this, at this point. But we do get challenged a lot. Well, your program isn't specific enough. It won't track in enough detail. Yeah, we can track, we can track the detail if, mm -hmm. if that's what's required. Will the feed cost be calculated according to the actual deliveries if you put that 
I, I can't hear him. Um, he asked whether the uh, feed ingredients are being billed out by what comes into the mix load or what is expected to be fed. No, but goes in the mix load. Yeah, that's what I kind of... Okay, so we'll save this. So we've got a mix load. The name was... Um, so it automatically names it here as December 20th 2. So that's the name of the truck load basically, right? So then we'll go up to, now we're ready to feed. Just click to the feed to the right, where it says the, on the row. Saving feed? No, no, on the row where... Oh, yes. Gotcha. New feature, there's new buttons. You guys have noticed that about herd checks already, right? It changes occasionally. <laughs> okay. Um, so yeah, we have our, um, our mix loads here. We have what we started with. We were going to feed... Pen four, right? Sure. Zero. Pick pen three. Pen three. Zero. Oh. Well, we got one there. Pick the pick JP feedlot. Okay, sixty-eight animals. There we go. Pounds per head. Yeah. So this this is a thing here. If you wanna. If you want to say you want those 68 to get so many pounds per head, you can put that value in there. Or you can just feed to an end weight and put that value in. Or you can feed, um, you know, do the math in your head and see, you know, how much was fed. You can, either one of those, all of those boxes are live. Oh, okay. Then we can hit show mix load. But for George's question, if you scroll up, that's how it gets billed at the bottom. S scroll up some more. No. Oh, what was actually put in. Yeah. Okay. Of course, so the numbers because we 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 fed we put more in than what was in the load. Yeah, it's hard to do this on a demo. Yeah, it really I is. know. Um, so so there's that's the really detailed way of feeding. The other way to feed is to just go, go to add new feeding. Add new feeding. Pick your location or my management group. Right, it'll toggle back and forth. And pick JP again or whatever. JP feedlot, 68, we're gonna pish, pick. Uh, You've already made your ration based off of a reference sheet. Yeah, and we're gonna go. And you say you put uh, 2,000, 4,000 pounds, whatever. And then if you, and you put two bales of bedding, you click add new ingredient. Yeah, this is the, yeah, this is the beautiful. We can add extra ingredients on top of this, right? So we add hay or, or straw. Put a bale of hay and a bale of straw or something like hay. that. We got one bale, update. Uh, straw, we're gonna add another bale. So in some cases when we're adding, if we were doing you know, I get the question about how to, keep, how to use this for cows, and there are some, a few people that are using this for cows, and they keep this really simple, right? Like, so at the end of preg checking, we'll usually organize the cows into groups, and there's usually some sort of cows pregnant or active cows, mature cows that are live, right? So in that case, if we just want to keep track of how many bales we fed, then we can just go um, feed by management group, pick cows, Right, and, and then just add the additional ingredients if there's no TMR, right? So you can keep track of at yeah, least how many bales we've gone through. And great point, because if, you're, if you don't have a mixer wagon, which a lot of uh, you guys don't, um, you're just feeding by bales. Just feeding by bales. At least you can keep track of that. And it will, and the inventory thing will work. Like if you have a certain set of inventory that you've started with, it will reduce that amount from the... Yeah, uh, from and, the and an estimated a weight to per bale. That yeah. Goes, so. And now if you just... So we showed you the most detailed way to feed in the mix load. This is a common way to feed on uh, either bales or, or TMR where you're not tracking every pound of every ingredient exactly. And if you go in the feeding on the left menu there, uh, Waylon, and put, click feeding grid. Oh yes. This is really nice. We've got several producers that use this in the feed truck with a tablet. Yeah. Right, so it shows all of the pens they're feeding, what they fed, 
uh, you, you can click on the view history from what you fed the day before and and then just assign the feed and to be honest this is our most popular just based on use feeding feature but again we're you know we don't have any 20,000 head feedlots using this and I think that George's point if you do enter the mixed load ingredients on the billing it bills you know if they added 200 pounds extra barley it's going to bill that 200 extra pounds yeah which most of the other softwares actually don't do, even the big guys. Um, they bill on perfect loads, which would be that second part where you just said, I made this ration and fed 500 pounds. It's going to blow that 500 pounds out to the perfect load of ingredients. Well, I rode around in the feed truck when I was trying to get a better handle on how to build some of this, and there was no perfect loads. Oh, yeah. No. <laughs> <laughs> Yeah, <laughs> those no. don't happen. So that's what that's why we made the mix load. <laughs> yeah, but is yeah. the metabolic weight thing? Is there programs that do that? I I've, you know, I haven't had enough time to investigate or look into that, but not that I know of. Not for prorating the feed. It may do it for other things in the program, but not for prorating it. So yeah. if you're the guy with the light cattle and the heavy pan, your pan, no, you're paying more. Yeah, <laughs> so. I think, I mean, that shows how, and then it tracks all the costs and the ingredients and the inventory. I'm just going to log into a client's account here that gave me permission. And um, and yeah, there we go. So this is, this is really what it should look like. And then you want to look at your dry matter intakes over a period of time, your feeding history. I mean, so when you got real data in there, it's actually really quite nice and telling and, 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 and valuable as you go along. And then ultimately at the end of the month, um, you know, the one thing we haven't done yet, we've been kind of asked to do it a bit more, is make it a bit more of an admin program. Um, you know, where we can generate invoices like the feedlots for the custom feeders and stuff. And I, I think we're gonna go down that road because you'll see here with this one report, um, if I just pick, I'm, just, I'm not picking pens, I'm just picking some lots. But, you know, we have all the information there. We have the head days so we can assign a yardage rate. We have the exact feed total. If someone wants exactly how many pounds of barley and silage and mineral and stuff that went into that. We have the bedding total, we have the drug totals based on the pharma usage, cost per head per day. So you, you have all the pertinent information for tracking and billing if need be. What we don't go as far yet is generating an invoice for them, which when you have this, it wouldn't be a, be a big stretch. So wanted to just give you guys a taste. Thanks for that, Waylon, on, on, you did really good for not, you know, I've been in there for a while. Yeah. yeah. Um, <laughs> the, only, the only other thing I, th I think you maybe would have saw there is we do track medicated feeds as well. So the you can put a yeah. Chlor 100 in there. You put what the withdrawal is on that, and as you're feeding, those animals will get flagged for withdrawals, no different than they would if they were treated uh, with the antibiotics. So I'm going to turn it over to Cameron, who's going to present, and Zach. Um, yeah, Bubba, we'll we'll. Uh, his name is really Baba, so don't be giving me the, the look like I'm calling them bad names. Well, that was quick. Good. So this is, this is going to talk about the services that they already provide and that are now options because of our new expanded team with you know through all of you and they're going to present it to the ultimate scale but i think you know as we've talked you know it doesn't have to be all or nothing there may be some components of this that may be of i think will be of interest to a lot of you uh and then we could talk about that or pursue that so anyways cameron you're good okay thanks troy so my name is cameron olson uh, i'm a consultant with feedlot health um, I've been with the company off and on for a few years, but I was full-time in January this year. Um, 
So the first thing that I wanted to make you guys aware of uh, is even though that you, you might be talking directly to myself or Zach, um, when, you, when you deal with us, what you're actually getting is a whole team of people behind um, all of our interactions. So when we have a problem, uh, when you have something that is going on, um, I might be the one who liaises with you, but um, all of us work together to solve that problem. So we've got uh, a, a bunch of people on there. Um, Zach and I and Jorge are in Alberta physically. We've got uh, Matt in Colorado. Uh, the other Matt is in Amarillo. Adam is living in Illinois, but he's frequently back in Alberta. Uh, Jorge is in Alberta. And Wyatt Smith works out of the Amarillo office as well. Then we have Victor and Jackie that uh, support all of the work that we do with all of you um, in terms of collecting feed samples and, and putting together feed programs and all that stuff. Um, so yeah, when, when you deal with us, this is kind of what you're getting. You might deal with just one of us on a daily basis. You might hear only one of our voices on the other end of the phone, uh, but all of us are working together to solve problems when you have them. So uh, when you work with us, um, we're not going to be making or, or supplying you with any uh, feedstuffs or minerals. Uh, you're really accessing uh, our knowledge and relationships and the data. Uh, and we're going to help you uh, with the ability to decide and make decisions, especially on the feeds and feeding front and, and the nutrition side of things. So the way that we do that primarily, uh, we're going to use peer-reviewed information. Uh, we perform a lot of sensitivity e economic analyses on, on feedstuffs and options that our clients have. We generate new ideas from, from academic papers and things like that, and we validate those concepts in real life uh, situations. So we do a lot of large pen research, uh, and hopefully that's something that we can bring into the cow-calf world as well, is a little bit of real life uh, validation of data that we see um, from academic institutions. And we're going to uh, primarily for you guys going to put together rations for you uh, that are based on our understanding of biological and economic responses. And so we understand that the least cost formulation, while it might be the least cost, isn't always what biology will allow for. So we're going to put together a ration that's going to allow your cows to perform um, at the level that you need them to, while also being the most effective and uh, least cost uh, whenever we can. So a lot of the stuff that we do relies on a lot on data collection, which is where we fit very nicely with herd tracks. This requires some commitment from you um, to put in data kind of religiously um, so that we can see it. But uh, we need buy-in from all of the people who are involved in order to make this work the way that we really know that it can. And so we need reliable data that's accurate um, and, and consistent. Um, so being put in on a daily basis where necessary, on a, on a seasonal basis. And that obviously is all going to come to us through herd tracks. We take that data, we can summarize it, analyze it, and, and then bring it back to you and explain it to you. Um, and so by doing so, we can help you make decisions uh, based on the data that you yourselves have collected. So part of all of that data collection, uh, we're going to do some routine um, evaluations of what's going on on farm. Primary things on the, on the feeds and feeding front, we're going to look at the commodity uh, nu nutrient and dry matter variation. So when you're feeding your silage pit out, um, taking regular dry matter samples um, and sending one of those off to the lab on a, on a fairly regular basis, not often, but regular, is going to help us to put together rations that are actually realistic to what you're feeding on farm. Uh, we can also help with uh, body condition scores. Those were uh, talked about earlier today. And then some of those uh, key performance indicators that cow-calf operators use, like calving, weaning, death loss, and, and open rate, and how that all ties back to what you're feeding and when you're feeding it, um, especially during the winter time when, when those needs are supplied exclusively by, by humans, really. Uh, so all of those points, again, are, they're all integrated through herd tracks. So we can see all of that if you're putting it in. So this is just a list of, of the services that we're kind of planning to offer through this module. So obviously the very first one is nutrient analysis and, and feedback based on samples that you guys collect and, and submit. 
cost effective, uh, not least cost, but cost effective ration formulation and balancing depending on, on the needs of your cows and what you have on hand. Supplement review, that's a big one that a lot of our clients uh, rely on us heavily for, um, looking at the, the supplement they're currently using, evaluating it, and then perhaps bidding it out um, if we think that we could perhaps get a, a, a better deal elsewhere, or uh, just tweaking it to, to make sure that they're not overfeeding certain elements. And then we can do some scheduled farm visits um, from a consultant um, as needed. Uh, you know, we've kind of toyed with the idea of so many per year. Um, but it's really going to be kind of as you need us to come, uh, we'll, we'll uh, do our best to be able to, to make that work. That's especially true of anybody kind of in the Southern Alberta area. Our office is at Okotoks. So I'm not gonna promise that we'll be, um, as much as I might like it at this time of year, flying to Florida on a regular basis to visit cow-calf operations or anything like that. But um, if you're local to the, to the area, you know, we can definitely plan to be there on a, on a fairly regular basis as you need us. Further to that, we can offer protocols, um, standard operating practices, uh, strategies related to feeds and feeding. We'd mentioned bunk scores and, and all of that. We can help you establish that if you're not doing it or, or tweak it if you already are and make sure that uh, you're not missing any opportunities there. And we've done, we've done the research behind that uh, with our system and we know that it, that it works. And then finally, this is something that we haven't ever offered, obviously. Um, to our feedlot clients, uh, but grazing plans and stocking density calculations. Um, somebody comes out and, and either does some clippings and, and we have a look at what the actual dry matter per acre is in various feed uh, or various pastures. Um, and then we can tell you how many cattle you should be running for how many days uh, in those pastures. So those are kind of the things that, that we think are, are going to be of most value to you. Um, this is this is up to you to tell us what we need to do for you, help us to, um, to help you kind of thing. You may not need all of this. Uh, you, may, you may need most of it, and you might need something that's not there, and we're more than willing to uh, work with you to come up with, with whatever that is. So in summary, we're, we're offering um, a module that's based on scientific strategies and, and production protocols that we know work. Uh, and we have the ability to put together nutritionally and economically balanced uh, rations, which help you to put together those decisions as well. Um, and then, you know, each operation, as I said at the beginning, um, each operation poses some unique opportunities and challenges, and we have a whole team of, of people who are willing uh, and happy to help you uh, make decisions where, where you might be stuck on, on something. So there's just a couple more things here. Um, in terms of reporting and what you'll actually see from us, uh, I just printed off a, f a handful of things so that you could see you know, what, what you might uh, get from us on a regular basis. This is our dry matter report that Hold goes out. Camera. Sorry. You might duplicate your screen. Nope. There we go. There we go. All right, so this is just an, an example of one of the reports that we can generate. Um, this is for a feedlot, so they're collecting a lot of samples on a regular basis. You may not uh, have access to that or may not need that. But this is a dry matter report, so we've got um, average dry matters there in that column. We have a formulated value. This is how we're putting together the rations for that particular feedlot. Uh, and and uh, if these vary too much, we'll adjust that and redo your rations so that we know uh, exactly what your, what your animals are getting. So that's something that we uh, put out on a fairly regular basis that we plan to be able to roll out for the cow-calf side of things as well. Uh, when you get your rations, you'll get a page that looks just like this. 
with a dry matter formulation page. So that's this first table here. It'll tell you on a dry matter basis what percentage of all the commodities uh, for all the different rations that you've got for cows, bulls, backgrounders, whatever the case is. Uh, what that uh, uh, formulation is on a dry matter basis as well as on an as-fed basis. We give you the nutrients so you, so you know exactly what's going in there. Um, if you're feeding any vitamins or, or a supplement, those are all printed out individually so you know per, per animal basically what, uh, what each animal is getting. And then uh, uh, for the cow-calf specifically, um, pounds per head per day on an as-fed basis is also in there. And finally, this is the last one. Um, this is just a sample again of another feedlot, but uh, something that we can reproduce for the cow-calf side. Uh, this is commodity usage over time. So you can track um, from putting your stuff into herd tracks, we can get this data out of that and put it into something like this so you know how much you've fed for whatever time period it is that you're, that you're interested in. And, and Zach and I were talking yesterday, this can be used to do projections as well. So if you're regularly buying hay, um, we can kind of, I mean, it's not going to be 100%, but we can say, yeah, you should need two loads of hay or, or four loads of hay to get you through the next two months, right? So that's, that's what uh, is on, on offer through, through this module. Um, Zach, do you have anything to add? No, not offhand. Okay. Um, there's several of us in the room from Feedlot Health. Um, if you're interested and want a business card or something, come find Zach or myself. I was sitting over there. Zach's over here. Um, and we can kind of get you set up. Uh, I think we'll both be around tomorrow as well for those of you who will be at the TELUS sky. So.
coming up to introduce yourself. Okay, let's. Uh, it's going to be five o'clock somewhere, pretty soon. going back into Albert's account. You guys think Albert's working so hard? Look what he's doing all the time. Taking pictures. Okay, so what we're going to talk about now, this is the last talk for me, so we can have a big applause for that for today. Um, <laughs> I didn't even have to say that and I was going to get that. Um, what we want to talk about is in herd tracks, we do cow ranking, indexing, and then I've alluded to this commercial sire parentage testing. And Wayland's going to show the value proposition on this um, when we go through. But I thought it would help because I, I know I've had a few messages why is this cow a gold or why is this how did this cow get to be this and and all of that in the ranking and you know remember we've we've kind of come up with this through not just by the seat of our pants but we we've looked at what other groups have done for evaluating cows evaluating performance and breaking that out so we've built these internal indexes to help but please keep in mind that all of the data that you collect we can rank and import it and do whatever you want with it. You don't have to follow what we built in inherently. And Wayland's gonna show you that. A lot of people will wanna tweak some of the values. They wanna emphasize some traits more than other traits when it comes to selecting replacements. I think that's great because at the very least, you're using your information to help make those decisions. That's all we're asking. I'm not here to say that you know, if I say this is a gold cow, you got to keep a heifer out of that gold cow, right? And, and we'll, we'll continue to change this and, and, and modify it, I think, over time. What I wanted to do at the very least here, though, today is just go through the document and show you how you can access that document so you can read through it on your own later that explains what an HMI, an HTI, the happy cow, as we call it, HAPI, and a CPV value. And then, of course, we have elite, uh, platinum, gold, silver, bronze as a label. And actually, for those dairy people or dairy, dairy that had dairy in the past, I kind of got that labeling thing because you in the dairy herds, even to this day, you'll have a very good 90s or a, she's, a, she's a 96 point cow or she's an excellent or she's very good. And they wouldn't refer to her number as much as they would the label. So that's kind of why we, we've taken the higher ranking cows and given them labels. And uh, yeah, it is what it is. So when you go into any of your cows uh, profile view records, right? And that shows, you know, a bit of a history on them. I intentionally picked a really old cow from Albert. He's flagged her to cull for age a long time ago, but you just haven't culled her yet, Albert. I guess she just keeps getting pregnant maybe. She's had 10 progeny. She's got three daughters in the herd. And here's all the information on those progeny. And we've got, what do we got here? One, two, three, uh, four, five, six carcass records um, to go with this as well. So we've got, we've got a lot of information. And if I don't know if you guys have seen that picture, I have this cow standing there, the cow cloud with all these data and it's sort of like be, care be careful what you wish for because you hear some people will say well it, it was better when I just had weaning weights because then I only had one thing to think about or something along those lines so we don't want to complicate and confuse things when you look at this indexing platform box here in the middle of the screen and I'm doing this and I know you guys can't see me do it but in the middle of the screen where it says in herd rank and performance indexes if you click on that eye 
it doesn't matter which record, it's just going to open up that PDF, which is a reference document that's what I'm just going to quickly go through and explain, you know, why it is or how we come up with these rank values, okay? So we basically have four what I call selection indexes. There's a maternal index, HMI, a terminal index, HTI, an all-purpose index, and I have this cow production value, okay? And so if we get right into the maternal index, because we're weighing calves, we're collecting weaning weights, and you gotta remember, there's lots of traits that you can use, but you know, no traits isn't, you know, no parameters aren't, or attributes aren't very good either. So it's always been a proxy, whether it be for milking ability in the cow, maybe some genetics on the sire, et cetera. You know, a calf, you know, weaning performance, weight per day of age, you know, 205, however you want to relate that. That just seems to be a staple in seed stock corners, and, and we continue to use that. I'm not saying it's the, it's the holy grail. It's got issues with it. Um, but it is a marker that helps us evaluate uh, these animals. One of the things we're using is an MPPA. You guys have maybe heard of that before. It's called Most Probable Producing Ability. And it basically uses the 205 day weaning weight on a cow's, all their progeny. But it also has a heritability index or a repeatability index factored into it. So if you have a cow that does really, really poorly one year, it doesn't, over, it doesn't torpedo her entirely. You know, she doesn't get the greatest rank, but she doesn't get buried. And if you have a cow, first calf heifer, we've all had those that just rings the bell and gives you a huge 205 day weight, we don't overrank her accordingly. Because again, it's 0.4 is the estimated heritability on, on weaning performance. So we have to temper that a little bit. So, and, and if you can read this table on here, cow A, she had one calf, an MPPA index. Remember how the indexes or ratios work. 100 is average. So if you think of your bell curve, the middle down the, the center is average. It's 100. And then it kind of, the standard deviations to the left go below and the, and the ones to the right uh, um, go above. So she had one uh, MPPA of 94, um, or sorry, she had an index, a weaning 205 index of 85, which is really, really low, right? But we're giving her an MP, a most probable producing ability of 94. And that's what I mean is we're not torpedoing her, we're, we're factoring in the fact that the repeatability is not 100% on that. No different than the cow that had two calves that was at 88, you know, she's trending to still not be great, but she's, she's still 93. She's a little higher than what the actual record showed. And again, that's just using a 0.4 um, repeatability index. You got a cow with four calves, she's at 90. You can see the more progeny you get, the, the more it levels off, the, the closer you actually get to where that cow's index is gonna be. Here's a cow that's got three calves, 110, really, really good on the actual data, but her MPPA value is 106.7, a little bit lower, right? We're not over, you know, getting overexcited about how good she's done. And, but you have four calves at 112, yeah, that comes up a little bit more. So you see how we're tempering and softening the evaluation there. We're not, you know, again, raining on the poor ones for one or two records, and we're not you know, jumping up and down getting too excited about the ones that have a couple great records. But that will trend, okay? So we use that, and we do that with all of their progeny. So once you get, you can see four or five progeny, it pretty much levels out on the MPPA side as to where you're gonna be. And to try and make it equitable, I'm not saying it's right, but the seed stock associations do this as well because we used to have, well, here's the ranking of all your first calvers. Here's the ranking of all your second calvers. Here's the ranking of your mature cows. And you're trying to go back and forth between those lists and assess, well, these, these are good cows. I should keep heifers out of these, but what about these first calvers? 
we do an adjustment, right? So two-year-olds get 45 pounds added on, three-year-olds get 30 pounds, four-year-olds, and that's kind of a median value between a lot of the breed associations is where we got those, those uh, numbers as far as, you know, adding on uh, uh, to those animals. So it's an age of dam adjustment. And the other thing is each gender is only compared against itself. We, don't, we never compare heifers against steers. We don't need to do a gender adjustment per se because we never compare heifers to steers. It's only against you know, each other and how those get indexes. All the WW weaning weight 205 require a birth weight. If you put a birth weight in, it'll use the birth weight. But a lot of you that don't weigh the calves, no problem. You know, we're using an average birth weight for steers of 85, average birth weight of heifers for eight, uh, of 80. You gotta put something in there, right? So at least if you're weighing your calves in the fall, you, you wanna be able to, um, you know, at least get these values or a maternal ranking on those. Because what we want to see is the day you wean calves off first calf heifers, you put the weaning weights in overnight, next morning you're going to have a maternal index on those cows. And the other thing I really want to emphasize is we're only comparing your cows to your cows. I'm not comparing my cows to Wayland's cows. We get asked that all the time. Well, how do my cows rank up against so-and-so's cows and stuff? It, it's hard for me to go down that path. There's just too many variables, breed differences, management differences, feeding, calving, t times a year of calving, environment. I mean, but to create that bell curve within your own herd so you can say, you know, these are our better cows, these are our average cows, these are our poor cows, I think there's a lot of merit uh, to being able to do that. The, the other thing that we do, um, whoops, as I mentioned this earlier, is the emphasizing emphasis of cows that calve early in the calving cycle, right? In a perfect world, you have everything calve in the first 21 days. It doesn't work that way though. But a lot of you pride yourselves, I know you get 80, 85% sometimes of those cows calving in the first cycle. We do an age of calf index within your herd based on how early that calf is born from the time you start calving to the time you finish calving. So it just, those calves that are born earlier get a more favorable index versus those that don't. And simply put, our maternal index is the cow's MPPA value, depending on how many progeny she has, all adjusted like I showed you. We weight that at 65% and we weight the calf age index, meaning hopefully it's a heifer calf uh, or a calf born early in, in the calving cycle. That all in combination gives us this HMI value. We're 100 in your herd. Always, we always equate it back to 100 being average. So those cows that are 80 to 90 or below, those are 110, 105, 110 are above for that value. And that's what we're referring to as a maternal index in herd tracks. Take it for what it's worth. Always open to suggestions of other things we need to add into there. I know there's phenotypes and structure in that. We're still relying on all of you that are, you know, well-versed in all of that to, to pick that out through visual appraisal and, and so forth. But these, we can only use the, you know, the objective means here a little bit. Sorry. Yes. Um, there is, I'm just trying to think of what that. It's in there. Yeah, I don't. I'm not sure how that works, George, to be honest, off the top of my head. Yeah, good point. I'll need to, I know, of course, if a twin gets grafted, as I mentioned earlier, it doesn't get credited for that one. But um, yeah, good point. I need to probably look into that. The next index that we have, uh, ratio index, HTI, Hertrax Terminal Index, because we, I mean, we're going to have, I don't know, probably 35,000 head again go to market that are retained ownership cattle that were born in herd tracks, finished in herd tracks, and we got Cargill JBS data, Harmony data back on and imported back in and linked. So we, 
so, so we felt we needed to evaluate those cattle. The next thing we probably need to do is, uh, and people are probably thinking this on the seed stocks, that maybe we should do some ultrasound if we can't get the real carcass and do some ultrasound measurements and, and create a, uh, uh, a bit of a terminal that way. But essentially, what makes that up is what we call carcass average daily gain. That's one of my favorite traits. It's really simple. Carcass weight divided by age and days, right? Simple way to put it is you happen to have an 800 pound carcass and it was 400 days of age, right? 13 months, it's a two pound carcass weight per day of age. Huge. And what we see, we'll see the, and we, you know, when I talk about the weaning performance on the 205, you'll see those calves that are fat because the cow's got all kinds of milk and it's not so much genetics, it's more on her maternal side. And then those calves hit the feedlot and they, they kind of stall or they don't carry on. So you'll get, a pretty good, you'll get a pretty good carcass weight per day of age on those. It's no different than the ones that are kind of green. They kind of didn't do great on the cow, but exploded when at weaning on the feedlot. They'll have a pretty good carcass weight per day of age. But those that, those that were awesome on the cow and awesome post weaning, those are the ones, there's just no denying. They're the ones that just rocked it all the way through. And those are the ones that get two pounds a day carcass weight per day of age. You think about that, right? Muscle and bone at two pounds a day from the day it's born to the day it's harvested. I mean, there's a lot of live calves, right? That you can't hardly get them to do that live weight, let alone carcass weight. Anyways, so we use carcass average daily gain index. We rate that at 50%. We do a ribeye area index. And the ribeye area is our way of assessing muscling in these cattle. It's really, I mean, you can't just use carcass weight. You can't say, oh, I got a thousand pound carcass. That's a heavy muscled carcass. I mean, that's just weight. It doesn't tell you how heavily muscled it is. So right or wrong, we're looking at the ribeye area because that is a measurement that we get back from carcass traits. And in all of our data, it's uncanny how the average uh, carcass area is 1.7 square inches per 100 pounds of carcass weight. Okay, so to put that in perspective, an 800 pound carcass, an average ribeye area in our data would be 15.6 square inches. I'm still, I'm not using metric, I'm using the standard. And if you got a thousand pound carcass, which you get lots of those, because we actually don't get docked now until 1,050, you get a 17 square inch ribeye, right? But that's average if it's a thousand pound carcass. And a lot of people don't relate it that way, right? I mean, even on the ultrasound, you'll, you'll see them do a measurement and they'll go, oh, it's got a, got a 17 square inch eye. This guy's, this guy's a brute. Well, yeah, but he's 1,800 pounds, right? And so if you take 60% of that, he's, he's probably not as heavily muscled as you think. But what's interesting, you get these 17, 18 square inch ribeyes on 700 pound carcasses. There's, I think there's just no question those are naturally a little heavier muscled um, type, type animals. So we rate the ribeye area index score at 25%. And then we have a marbling score. I think, you know, again, within our group, we just looked at overall meat and muscle performance from start to end, muscling, right? We are in the meat and the protein business, right? But you can't ignore, we gotta have a marbling score index. So we rate that the same. And fortunately, we get, a, we get a, a numerical camera score for marbling. And you guys have seen that. It ranges anywhere from 200 up to 1,000 actually. Um, and then you, you'll see your AAA, your, your certified Angus AAA, your Prime, Angus Pride, all of those will fall in to these numbers, but you can't rank on that, but you can rank on the numeric values that we get. And so that's, that's what we're using. And so the higher the marbling score, we rank that at 25%. So that all combined will give what we call a, a terminal, because that's what it is, it's meat, muscle, carcass, index for, uh, for those animals. And then, we basically add the, the HMI to the HTI 
to get an all-purpose index. If there is no HTI, we just give everyone 100. We just give everyone an average, and then the, the all-purpose index flows from there. The caveat on this, and this is where some of your calls have come, where, well, how did this cow get such a high rank? Because her, her MPPA might not have been that high. She's maybe got no carcass data, and then she'll have a really high um, all-purpose index. Again, this is just us doing this. Direct replacements. Herd tracks tracks that. Part of, like I told you about having the calving linked to the dam and having those dams come back in the herd and part of the pedigree and that, just like I showed you on that screen, it shows this cow's got 10 progeny and five daughters and three granddaughters or something like that. Every daughter and every granddaughter in the herd gets one point on the all-purpose index. It's an extra. And it's, it's interesting when people will say, well, I don't know if she's that great of a cow. I don't know why she's got such a high index. And I think, well, why did you keep 10 of her offspring in the herd? She's not that great. Was that just a random gate sort or something like that? I don't, you know. There's usually a reason those cows' daughters end up in the herd. And you guys all know that. You followed maternal families and stuff like that. So, so that's how you'll get an HAPI cow that'll be kind of an outlier because you know how the bell curve works. You got 100, 110, 115, and then uh, 90, 85. And then you're going to get one that's in your herd. It's going to be 130. She's going to be an elite. Well, that's because she's 10 years old and she's got seven or eight daughters and project. I got to be honest with you. If I go into your herd and you say, this cow's got six daughters in the herd, back to my purple thing, right? I mean, first of all, there's a reason she got to be old. She obviously didn't have a bad udder. She didn't have feet and legs and all of those issues. And something had to be clicking for you and your environment to want to keep all those daughters. So that's, that's my paradigm as to why, you know, how we emphasize that. The last one that we do was something that was kind of interesting. I saw it done at, a, at one of the U.S. conferences I was at. Um, yeah, here's a good example here. She's had 12 progeny, six daughters, four granddaughters, and her, her happy ended up at, you know, really high value. Lastly, we have this, what's called a cow production value, okay? And what this is, this value, it shows the average weaning weight this cow produces every day of her life. So we basically take all of that cow's weaning weights from the day that she has her first calf, and you can basically look at that. And so I thought it was kind of a nice economic index if you think about it, right? Here's a cow, she's averaging 1.81 pounds a day of wean calf production since her first calf was born. That's when we started. And that translates into an average of 661 pounds of weaning weight. So if you go through this formula, it costs you $600 a year for every cow. That was, uh, <laughs> that was a while ago, I did this. This prorates into $1.64 per day cost. So in the example shown below, if, if this is $1.81 pounds of wean calf, and at that time I said it was $1.85 a pound, we could use two pounds a day, times 365 days a year, essentially that's the profit you're getting on that cow. That's what I mean by the cow production value. Just to kind of be able to take all of her weaning performance and pounds, pounds weaned, it's not adjusted or anything, pounds that she's given you and offset that against what it's costing you uh, to keep that cow. And then again, lastly, if you look at it when you get the labels, you get the indexes and stuff, we've just taken a generic bell curve and we've just taken all of your cows, dots all over in here, and, um, and assessed them, you know, in that way. So that's what's built in. That's what happens automatically. But again, what Waylon's going to show you, we use these values, but in combination with some other, you know, data for doing different selection. Because there's going to, all of you have different things that suit your environment and suit your needs better. Um, and so there's, you know, stuff that you're going to want to take out of here and make use of it. And we're happy to do that. I mean, we build custom reports all the time that you can just go in and you can run. 
gives you the list. Probably some of the nicest reports that are not here anymore, Jennifer left, but the replacement index report, um, selection report that Beef Booster gives to all other producers is second to nothing I've, I've ever seen. It just lays it all out for them. Because they're all, they're all on the same side as to what they value, what's important to them. They've added, added some genomic uh, uh, linkages in there. And so it works really well. So I'm going to turn it over to Waylon just to show you now then on the value proposition of, you know, what would uh, be good here. Ooh, we got a lot of goat here. Um, you got to go in. Is your account not open? No. Here, we'll just change it here. Any questions or comments on the... Yes, George. Why do you have CPD values with a star on the side of the cow record? I think... It doesn't seem to be the highest values anyway, so I don't know what that is. I can't remember off the top of my head. You're going to stump me all day here, George, with questions? <laughs> Jeepers. <laughs> There's got to be a reason. There's got to be a caveat to the data is why it's starred. I'll, it was probably in the document. I just needed to read it. Thanks, Troy. Yeah, so this is kind of my, my world, right? Once we get into the... You know, once we get into the selection and once we get into the... You know, we have these indexes and it's like... You know, we've been on this program for three years, now what are we gonna start to do with it, right? Um, and one of the things we're starting to do more and more is, is um, you know, choose replacements on a, on a large scale, right? We have a thousand heifers, I identify the top 600 and get, get rid of the chaff, right? We wanna get rid of the, you know, when we start, we always, we start to look at the data, we'll look at the twins, obviously, the free martins, we'll look at the heifers that have, um, you know, dams that have poor udders, bad feet, um, we start to look at, you know, the color thing always is huge. We always got to flag the grays, tans, you know, we can't, we can't get away from that. Um, and then we'll start to look at the outliers on weaning weight. You know, usually when we get there, um, we always agree on the bottom and we always agree on the top. But once you get that bulk of heifers in the middle that are all kind of the same weight, it's, and they're all the same color, they're all out of pretty good cows, it's, you know, it's tough to make the rank, right? So, you know, after doing this so many years and listening to everyone's kind of suggestions, which are all over the map, like everybody's got a different idea how to pick replacement heifers, right? So we had to come up with some way that was fairly um, customizable to do that. And we're in the process, we're probably gonna be building this, you know, into herd tracks at some element. And I realize once we get there, it's gonna be so customizable because one thing about the Canadian cattle business is we can't agree on, on how to do some of, these, uh, some of these things. And then add the DNA. That's the other thing that all of a sudden we have uh, coming in is we've got these GEPDs starting to come in. Um, you know, it's a huge document, lots of, uh, oh, I gotta download that. Lots of data, but then when we pair that with the performance data, it's not always a match. Right? Just because you have good DNA doesn't mean you're going to be you know, heavy enough, out of a good enough cow. I mean, it, it's not quite there. So we have to decide on how to weight those different traits. How do I download that? Hold it. Yeah. There's Excel on this thing, right? Oh no. Here I'll get one with the probably need to make this bigger. Eh? Oh. Okay, so I you guys can kind of see that, but we'll just kind of explain the point. So um, basically this is a list of all the heifers that we started um, that we maybe had the option to select, right? 
There's a report called Complete Com Performance Summary Report, which kicks out every single statistic almost on, on every heifer. So we, we almost have to start there, right? And the first thing that we really have to do is we have to start going through that list and we have to start picking out you know, the dams with low index, the purchased cattle, you know, usually we have a set date. We're not going to pick any heifers that are too young, right? You know, depending on your calving season, you know, we try not to discriminate between just picking the oldest ones. We try to pick the, you know, we try to take that element out of the equation a little bit, but we do have a cutoff where we just don't breed, you know, usually pick the ones that are born in the last cycle, right? So we'll end up identifying these, you know, maybe surrogates, twins, um, you know, these are all the good heifers kind of on top. But once we get to the bottom, we can start to see the ones that are, you know, have low index, um, low weight per day of age, you know, something that makes them undesirable. So we don't necessarily cull them, but we, we make sure that that stuff's available. Because when, you know, inevitably what happens is you're out there with a list and you pick the ones that you like, and then you look at the list, and then it reminds you and triggers your mind of, of maybe things that you'd forgotten about. The other thing that we started doing is really looking at the health history, right? We forget about calves that were treated twice for umbilical infection as calves. Sometimes we'll forget about calves that we've treated with a bunch of times with pneumonia. And we start looking at the data. Those ones kind of come back to haunt you eventually, you know? So, you know, digging into the health records is something that we just kind of started doing. And it's kind of a, you know, if you're good, if you're on top of the index, you're probably still going to get picked. But we're talking about a slug of cattle that are in the bubble here that we can't decide whether to take or not. You know, if you were treated twice, um, certainly if you were treated post weaning after this was made or after we got the weight, you know, that might sway your decision either way, right? So then what we do is we've got these GEPDs that are starting to come in and we're still trying to figure out how to use these, okay? Um, so it, this is a whole bunch of stuff in here. We get this huge file. It's not very important about what these numbers are. But what we do is we kind of give them a score, you know, kind of how they rank within the heifer selection, right? So the way that we did this, um, if you can see this, because we needed a way to evaluate and put all the GEPDs together in one thing, right? So in this case, we're going to rate them fairly high on RFI, 25%. And then we've kind of got 12% split between uh, dry matter intake, uh, fat, lean meat yield, ribeye area, a little bit of marbling, and then um, you know 12% on heterosis. So the way that this builds, we can switch this around, right? So if we're really, you know, let's say Angus based, we might put probably more emphasis maybe on uh, lean meat yield, ribeye area. Um, you know, probably not going to put a lot of emphasis on marbling because we've pr probably got a lot of marbling already there, right? So the idea is to tweak this to add to our selection. Um, so then the other part of this is that we add, in this specific way that we've picked this, we've got our, we're going to pick 20% weaning weight, 20% uh, weight per day of age. Um, I don't usually use weight, the 205, too much because what happens is younger cattle, you know, the weight per, day of age, weight per day of age ends up getting driven up, and sometimes it makes that 205 index end up being too large, right? So at least if we have a really high weight per day of age, we've usually got a low weaning weight to kind of help to counteract that a little bit. So I always add the, those in on kind of equal proportions. In this case, we've added a little bit of the older heifers, 5%, and I've only added in the GEPD at 15%. So all of this stuff over here, Right, is only going to come together and only going to influence us about 15% in the end. So we've changed that a little bit depending on the herd, depending on what kind of data we have. And sometimes it just takes a little bit of kind of playing with a little bit until we get the right number, which kind of matches to the performance of the cattle. And then once we've identified that, we can move forward um, year after year and evaluate how our pick did, right? And in this case, we also have uh, full um, sire parentage. So we know who the dads are. Um, and of course, we put 25% on the cow and then 15% on the sire happy, which just like Troy described, um, you know, is also the ability to produce uh, weaning weight adjusted for age a little bit, kind of. You know, it's an MPPA, but 
So this is, this, this is uh, specific to this herd. I can show you another one where a very common one is very common when we don't have GPDs. We'll go 50% on the dam index, and then we'll go 25% on weaning weight and 25% on uh, weight per day of age, or average daily gain, weaning average daily gain. So once we get that all together, right, it's just basically, it will add those scores together and it'll give us a rank from top to bottom. You know, so it'll give us our top heifer on top. And, then, and you know, we'll have a number in mind and we'll go through the list. You know, and then we see that the number uh, eighth, rank, eighth ranked heifer here, we didn't pick her because she was a, coxy, a coccidiosis relapse. So go down the list. So there's certain reasons that, that we were told not to pick any of the purchase ones in this case. We had one that was too young that made the top, probably because of an inflated weaning average daily gain. We've got some in here that were pneumonias that we didn't pick. You know, so as we get down the list, we get to the bottom, okay? And then eventually we start to have you know, there's just too many reasons why that, you know, we're not going to pick those heifers. So, so how, how this gets set up then is, I mean, we can also dig into some of this stuff and we can go, okay, who is the highest weight per day of age heifer? That probably doesn't work, eh? On the screen. Okay, so here's an example, right? If we take our adjusted weaning weight and we pick the top of this, all of these are, are born in June, right? So sometimes, well, the top two are anyway. So sometimes when we're picking these heifers based on their, um, you know, adjusted 205 index, we have to be a little bit aware of how old they are because sometimes that really inflates that number, right? That's exactly. That's exactly why in our maternal index, we use the 205 in combination with the, how early the calf is born in the calving cycle yeah. to offset us picking those late ones that get falsely inflated 205 parameters. So the other thing that we've been routinely doing when we uh, pick replacement heifers is we're always kind of aware of how many replacements are being picked out of the heifers. And there's some herds where the first calf heifers just never even make it into the range to be picked, right? So sometimes we'll even adjust that just a little bit. You know, I know we're adding 45 pounds, I think, for first calf heifers. Sometimes we'll tweak that a little bit, especially if there's some AI programs going on and there's some value there um, in picking the younger cattle because if you're picking the younger cattle, you should be, there should be the assumption that the younger cattle are the best cattle on the property to some extent. You know, if the genetic you know, if you've been picking everything right and there's, and we're shifting the bell curve on the cattle herd, the younger cattle should be better than the older cattle. So if every year we just keep, if we never pick any replacements out of the younger cattle, we always kind of look at that and then we might shift and I might adjust the dam uh, indexing just a little bit on the younger cattle just to get them into the range of the line that we need to draw to pick them, right? So then a very important part of this is to go back and find out um, what actually got picked, right? So in this case, I actually just found out in this data set last night, um, you know, whether they picked, whether, you know, what we agreed on, right? Because it's not always the same. Like I said, there's still a, we still need to go out and look at the phenotype of the animals, right? This is supposed to be meant as kind of like, you know, help pick the replacements is not just, a, it's not just supposed to do it automatically. So if we go back to our rank, there we go there. Oh. oh boy. It's hard to get that to click. Here, let me do this. Okay. 
Okay, we can see the top heifer never got picked. So I looked into this, horrible cull alert on the cow, like a fatal flaw where the cow was never gonna have a replacement heifer ever picked um, for the herd ever, right? So this, uh, the top heifer never got picked because her mom was so awful, they just didn't, they, she never had a chance. The second, play, the second heifer, um, what was the reason there? Can't remember. Got sick after weaning. That was the other thing. So got sick. So now we all of a sudden get into number three and four. We start to agree. Number five, there was something about her that didn't get picked. But when we all said and done, when we look at this, I think there's five. Um, I had too many picked here, but there was five that we didn't agree on in the end, right? So it's not to say that this is the only way to pick replacement heifers, but it did. It offered some sort of insight. Um, you know, especially on the middle, the bubble of heifers that we have to choose from that aren't um, obviously really good or really bad, or have things that we, the computer just doesn't know about, right? And then of course, the other thing we have here is the breed composition, which um, is kind of a new thing that we're starting to get part of the DNA program, which, um, you know, when you talk to anyone in the, um, in those circles, right, the, they're starting to rate um, heterosis as a pretty major part of their, um, you know, fertility or their um, maternal index. Actually, it's this number is actually turning out to be kind of an important. But there, so it's I think it's really important what Wayland just showed you. I mean, there's a there's a lot of you know preference or you know uh, paradigms as to what people want in their replacement heifers or how they want to pick them. And so I showed you a little bit what we do for, you know, creating a numerical value to evaluate certain components. But more often than not, you know, whether it be Whalen or even the producer on their own will be putting that data, running that complete calf performance summary report, and then creating their own list. And then they'll create a list. And how often does this happen with, with, with one particular client Whalen, and they'll say, well, how about you wait this now, change the weighting from 25% to 35% and then change it, you know, just to see how it affects. And you actually learn from that as well. But I guess the take home message I want to say is all the data that you're going to need is there, especially if you're collecting it. And we've got a framework that you can use and, and, and take advantage of but we can also work with you to, or you do that yourself. I know a lot of you do already uh, with different companies and, 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 and pick what it is you want. And then once you've, once you've got to that final selection point, you put an alert code on or you sort code on those heifers when you rehandle them, you buzz them on the computer and up it comes and she gets sorted off, she's, she's to be kept. And then ultimately, whatever the decisions you make, they're going to stay in herd tracks. They're going to get bred, hopefully get bred. They're going to have their own calves. And we do our own internal validation then to say, this one worked out, this one worked out, mm, this one didn't work out. Yeah. Why didn't that one work out? What did, we, what did we use on criteria for that one? Why we kept it? Or is it, I mean, they're not all going to work out. But um, it, it takes years too. You know, like we're just starting, we've been picking heifers at some places for five, six years now. Um, and we're trying to keep it consistent. Now we've got, you know, we know who's in the top half of the bell curve and who's in the bottom half of the bell curve, and then that flag stays with them um, throughout their life. So even um, after preg checking, right, we'll see how many are still left there. And then we'll also see, um, you know, how the difference in weaning weight um, and weight per day of age of, is of their progeny, right? So then by doing that, we can, we can almost evaluate different ages of cows. We can evaluate the one, two, three, four, five-year-olds because they are still are part of the bell curve that's on the top or the bottom, right? So I'm just gonna show you one uh, example that we just did uh, a few weeks ago. Um, this is just weight per day of age. The green is the top half of the bell curve that we picked, and the bottom is the or sorry, this gr um, brown color is kind of the bottom half of the bell curve. So it's just shifted slightly. But what has really shifted 
is the ones we didn't pick. Right? I mean, there's a big glut of them in there at the back. So one thing that was kind of interesting when we looked at this, because we're just, at this place, I'd like a, a way to pop the performance. The way that we're selecting them probably just isn't, there's not a big enough difference between the two. So this is essentially what we're doing in this place, right? So we've got the top half of the bell curve, right? Our adjusted 205 is 631, the bottom is 579, the non-select, this is this year's data, 516. We managed to capture that. Uh, weight per day of age, same thing, 2.67 in the top half, 2.43 in the bottom half. Remember the top one and top two is still ones that we'd, we'd, we selected, right? Um, and then we have the, the weaning weight, kind of follows the same trend. We have the dam index, we're ensuring that we're picking the best heifers um, out of the top indexing cows. Um, and that's where the adjustment kind of comes into play here, so we make sure that we pick some out of the younger, younger cattle as well. But one thing that's really interesting when we do this is the, we're not picking solely on birth date. So we're not just picking the biggest ones in the pen. There's a lot of things that we're taking in consideration rather than just picking the oldest, biggest ones. So we've managed to kind of pick cattle that are the same age that have better, you know, better numbers. So I'll just show you this, um, which is kind of interesting. The reason why, you know, so this is based on the progeny performance of all the cows that we've been selecting uh, replacements out of for years, right? We've only got, um, you know, the top half is still better than the bottom half, but there's only about 10 pounds difference in weaning weight. Still high, but I wish it was bigger. So then we start looking at, well, okay, what can we pick? How can we adjust this to kind of, you know, improve this, um, you know, statistic? And I think I have, the fertility was exactly this. Oh no, the, there was a 0.4 difference between, probably not significant there, which I'm not much of a statistician, which I probably should be better at that, but there's about a 0.4 difference um, on a 45 day breeding season between, um, the top replacements and the bottom replacements. So our, our top replacements seem to have more pregnant cows and um, have heavier calves. And you could argue you probably do this by your eye. There's people that have great eyes. I never see, I, well, I see lots of cattle, mostly at the back end of them, but I'm not going to walk into a pen of replacements and do this just by looking at them. Some of you could probably argue that you could do that. Again, this is meant to be um, help with that process because if you've ever gone into a pen of a, a thousand to pick the top 600 and they're all black, you know, it starts to get a little tough. <laughs> you know, you're pretty much just picking the ones that run through the gate at that point, <laughs> right? Any questions on replacement selection or? It, yeah, and I think the take home needs to be it's, it's, it's flexible how you do it, right? We're, we're not up here saying, oh, here's the, here's the secret sauce, here's the recipe, you do this, this, and this, and you're guaranteed a great replacement. I mean, but we do know that if you have a lot of different variables captured and, and measurements, it's, uh, you, can, you can make it objective. I mean, to, to oversimplify a bit, a lot of people will use the data to select 200 heifers, and they only want to keep 170. So they'll just use the data to sort off the shoot, and then they'll go out and they'll pick the phenotype issues, the uglies, the bad structure, the disposition problems, and, 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 and go with that. So I think everyone always knows their top cows, their top heifers visually, and the bottom ones. But like Waylon said, it's that middle group that I think you can add science to that helps, helps that a lot. So. And, it, and it does it, it's different for every ranch. That's the hard part about this. You know, it really is, you, 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 when you start digging into the data and the data is there, right, all of a sudden, um, you know, it is different at each place. Each place struggles with a different, um, you know, a different thing and they pick cattle differently and the cattle end up at different places, you know. Depends whether you're retaining ownership, you're purebred, commercial, um, you know, raising some commercial bulls. There's so many different types of producers that all have different goals, but 
and this is built to you know, help yeah. with that. I, I'll, uh, with guessing, 80% of the producers in this room are trying to be the best at everything. Right? Yeah. They're trying to raise the best replacements and the best feeder cattle. Right? And you think about going down that path of just putting, you know, going all in on replacements, it's basically what, 25, 30% of your herd that you're, you're putting all your inputs and efforts into selecting when the rest of them are just going to go on feeding, you know, pound cells, carcass cells, et cetera. So I, I forever have campaigned on trying to be all terminal, right? Buy all your replacements, breed them to terminal bulls, feed them all out, sell them, do whatever. Let someone else raise the replacements, but the person raising the replacements, that's not like a real lucrative thing either, right? Unless you start getting into sex semen and stuff, you've kind of given up some performance to raise those, you know, you know, milkier, more feminine, maternal type, lighter muscled maybe type animals. And that, then you've got 75% of your herd that that's what's going to the feedlot or maybe wasn't as heavy when you go to sell them. So, um, lot, like I said, it's end of the day, take home message. We have the data. You can collect as much of it as you want. Some of it may seem like overkill to you, but we just really encourage you that you use it, you know, to supplement. You take what you're doing now and use what information you're collecting in the program to assist with that. I think that's got us at time. Any, time. any questions? How many of the cow-calf herds in the room uh, keep their own replacements? Put up your hands. Yeah. Does anybody do strictly terminal? Oh yeah, Russ. Okay, well, that brings us to last, but the best. Dr. Kip Lukasevich. Am I getting your last name right, Kip? Absolutely. Okay. You're walking better than last time. See, he's a cattle handling expert, and he got run over and hurt his knee last time I saw him. So, <laughs> <laughs> isn't that what happened? Yeah, I passed off the horse. Yeah, this one. I thought that was a little wrong. Yeah, you can take whichever one you want. Can you help us, Bob? Keep it up close. Just to do a quick introduction. Perfect. All right. Okay, I got a little bit of a profile here if I can read it. Anyways, doctor, is Kip short for anything? Nope. My last name's so long that mom kept three letters in the front. So. <laughs> Anyways, doctor, Dr. Lukasevich, he's a veterinarian, got his degree in 1999 from K-State. He's the owner of Sandhills Cattle Consulting, Inc. As an equal partner with the Production Animal Consulting, PAC for short. And uh, we were joking that the, the acronym should be people and cattle, right? Mm -hmm. It's kind of a neat handle for that. And as well as Aeroboss. It, uh, Kip's primary focus is in feedlot consulting, animal handling, and facility design. He is trained under the late Bud Williams and has worked and trained extensively with Dr. Tom Nofsinger, utilizing Bud's thoughts on how low stress cattle handling and caregiving. Dr. Give a, Kip, along with Dr. Tom, works and trains with over 20% of the U.S. fed cattle industry and also travels to Canada to train feedlot clients on low-stress cattle handling and caregiving. Uh, Dr. Kip resides in Grand Island, Nebraska, which he's worried about getting home to here with a storm coming, with his wife not. and two children. <laughs> he is an active member of the Academy of Vet and Consultants, Nebraska Vet Med Association, an American Association of Bovine Practitioners. And Kip, I can't tell you how much I um, appreciate you making the effort to come up to wintry Canada for this. So. Oh, it's beautiful. I love it. I love it. I haven't been up here since COVID, so uh, y'all kept me out. 
<laughs> so <laughs> they don't want me. So I always like to do my jokes at the beginning because if I do my jokes at the end, all you remember is the joke and you forget all the other stuff that I have in between. And so, but I, I usually tell a lot of dirty jokes and, uh, and so I got to keep it clean because I don't want to get fired or, uh, you know, never told that I could come back. And so the other night, uh, Eric Belkey and I were eating uh, at a restaurant here and somebody in the restaurant uh, yelled out, does anybody know CPR? And I yelled back, I know all my alphabets. I can name them all. And we laughed and laughed, except for one guy. <laughs> Pretty dumb, huh? <laughs> Yeah. <laughs> you know, my, my wife, she, she, a lot of times, she likes to, uh, uh, I got to say it this way, because <laughs> I, do, I do this at the feedlot sometimes, you know, how do you tell somebody politely that they're stupid? And uh, you don't know how? You just simply say, wisdom has been chasing you, but you've always been faster. There's my stuff right there. I could get in the dirty stuff, but I won't. Okay. So we're going to talk. I'm going to go through this pretty quickly because I know I'm the difference between you and getting home and getting your livestock. So, okay. And so designing facilities. This is kind of what I do. I like. I love doing this stuff. Um, even like today, like or before I came up here, actually in in Omaha, I was, I was drawing facilities before I boarded the plane and got on. And and then when I leave here, hopefully Thursday. Um, if they let me back, <laughs> we have a blizzard coming in Omaha, so I don't know if they'll let me back. But uh, anyway, uh, I'll be drawn on Thursday morning, probably before I leave as well. So I took on two more clients here today just to draw facilities on. And so it's a never ending deal and, and I love doing it. I use AutoCAD and I usually, I'm not an engineer. That's why I always tell people I work with whatever engineers are out there. And, um, but I like to draw the facilities. I have, that's where my expert expertise resides primarily. Um, I'm a really crappy veterinarian. I kill them with the best of them. And so I had to move my talents to somewhere else. And so uh, that's why I do what I do today. So when we do facilities, I like to understand cattle behavior and flow. We work with these animals every day and it just amazes me. I had this happen to me here a couple weeks ago. Um, a young person asked me, they said, how, how many people out there that you work with, Dr. Kip, actually understand the behavior of cattle? And I was like, ooh. <laughs> I said, honestly? I said, you want an honest answer? Because, you know, I just said the stupid joke, right? And so I said, not very many. Most of us have an idea or a thought process, but when we start our day, most of us go out and say, well, we're going to process cattle today, and I have to bring up pin 201, or I have to go out and gather in this pasture and bring them in. All we worry about is getting them to the facility, right? We don't think about going out to our cow-calf pairs um, and actually going out there about 30 minutes prior to moving them to actually get them up and get them to suckle before we start moving them. Because like when I train at Meat Animal Research Center where we have 8,000 cows, like at that facility, our goal is, is that the last animal into the, the gate or the gathering pin is a cow-calf pair. Like I never want to have 20 or 30 calves lagging behind. You know why? Because that's a wreck. <laughs> when calf lose mom, what is the strongest instinct of a bovine? When they get somewhere and they come to a dead end or they don't know where they're going, what do they do? Yeah, they return where they came from. Have you ever tried to change the mind of a little baby calf? Not going, <laughs> yeah, it's tough. It's like talking to a little infant child. Yeah, it ain't gonna happen, right? And that is a strong instinct. That's, that's the first instinct when you guys are with cow-calf pairs. You should understand that right from the get-go, that they wanna return where they came from. They get lost, they return where they came from, right? So understanding behavior, especially when we're doing de uh, design facilities, is understanding behavior around flow. I see too many welders and engineers that don't have the experience or the knowledge of cattle handling or cattle behavior designing facilities. You know how I know that? What are the strongest senses of an animal? How many senses do we have? Five. 
right? Can anybody name them? Sight, Sight. smell, smell. taste. taste. What's that? Touch. Touch, yeah. Sound. Sound, yeah. What's the point of balance of an animal? You and I are the same, actually. We just don't recognize it. Your shoulder? Like if someone comes to my shoulder, am I going to move? Ears. And what does the ear open up to? Sound. And what else does it... So on a bovine, because our ears are way back here, we can't see them, right? But in a bovine, their ears are out here, okay? You should always know where a bovine is looking, right? Because when that ear pulls back, that animal just gave you their eye. So for me, point of balance is in that eye, wherever they can see. And I always say, you know, say that if there's a blind person in there, they'd tell you right away, point of balance is your eye, <laughs> right? Take your eyesight away, man, you, you take a lot of things away, okay? I couldn't imagine, I could live without my hearing. I could probably live without my eyes, but it's gonna be a lot tougher, okay? So choosing a side, I think, is important. We'll talk a little bit about developing a plan and so forth, invest, investigate alternative designs, and then draw the facility, okay? Maybe. All right. there we go. So cattle behavior, let's understand that. We already went through this here. Uh, uh, how far can an animal smell, you know, a bovine? Does anybody here limit feed their calves? Yeah. Has anybody ever seen like yearlings in a feedlot being limit fed? And then they have like bowling issues in the first 20 days on feed? And we think it's an implant? <laughs> can you believe that an animal can smell up to five miles? That's real. Yeah. You know why they're bowling? Because they can smell it. There's nothing in their bunk. And you know what happens when there's nothing in their bunk and they become irritated? What do people do if you took food away from them? You think we'd bowl a little bit with our neighbor? I bet we'd fight like hell. <laughs> yeah, we'd be a little stressed. You know the one way to cause a civil war? Take food away and take energy away. I guarantee you, you would not live in peace at that point. You could take our money away, that'd be fine. Take, take those other two things away and people will change in a heartbeat, okay? So cattle behavior-wise is, is they're so inherent on the fear of unfamiliar objects that they respond to sight, sound, smells, and so forth, but their curiosity will literally draw them in. And so, hopefully I'll have a video here shortly. Yeah, I went through this already too. I always get ahead of myself, but that point of balance is the eye. And when I have that up there, you'll see, you know, cattle are very sensitive to motion, but look at that last one. They can't see above them very well. You know how cattle see above them? They have to raise their head. Anybody here ride horses? You know how to do like a cavalry stop or a one rein stop? Yeah, you bring up, drop one, bring one up. Okay, that elevates the horse's head. Once you get him stopped, just go ahead and spur him in the side a little bit. See what he does, or she. I ride she's, <laughs> I don't know why. <laughs> okay. But they'll sit there and they'll sit there and they'll try to go and they'll try to go and try to go. They can't go. You ever watch cattle loading up a ramp and some truckers over the top of that loading the solid sides and when a trucker comes over the top, what's it do to the animal behind? Raises his head. Do you ever see that animal go forward very good anymore? All of a sudden that animal stops. If that person just would have stayed away, none of that would have happened. If you have motion and motion's in order and it's going, don't disrupt it. Don't be impatient just because it's not going fast enough for you. 
Be happy that it's going. That's more important. Okay, this one I really love because so I'm going to play this video. This was actually like I shot this three days before my really bad accident. Um, I did a bilateral tibial plateau fracture, just completely shattered my tibia. So I got three plates down there. And uh, then this year I decided I, w I, I just didn't do enough. So I broke my femur above. <laughs> so I got four plates in this son of a gun. It's like titanium steel. <laughs> it's perfect. <laughs> Hopefully it'll play. There we go. This is the power of the ear. Now watch this animal. Only Herefords will do this. Now, right there, she gives me her ear. She just pulled it back. And I'm just going to walk behind her. her. That's her calf right behind. Okay. I'm going to keep walking. Look how she's flexing, flexing, looking at me, looking at me. Now watch here. She's already flexed to the other side, and she's going to be watching me for the other side already before I get there. I'll show some other videos of, of people taking cattle down an alley, and I'll show you how I teach them as far as to always watch for ear, ear placement as you're driving cattle down an alley. Okay, It's pretty cool stuff. Understand that all these animals are the same. We all have predatory-like skills, because that's what we are, so they already know it. And when you move like that and you encircle things, that tends to make them a little bit more nervous. And so most of my facilities are, when I design things, things are pretty straight. I usually try to keep people on the inside corner of cattle so that if I want them to do a half circle around me, they naturally come around, it's all voluntary motion. Okay, does that make sense? They do want to see what's pressuring them. And I realize that a lot of you probably have facilities with a lot of solid metal, on, sheets of metal on the side. And you probably have catwalks that put you up above the cattle. So I already told you two things that I wouldn't do. Okay? You know, once you break a leg and you really disable yourself, you don't want to get up on catwalks no more. <laughs> I can't imagine getting up through when I'm 70. Okay? So I like to stay even with the cattle if I can. Stay with their eyesight. They love and they crave, they, they literally crave your guidance. I used uh, this analogy one time with our guys back home and gals, is I was uh, taken to uh, McDonald's Corporation at Chicago and uh, to give a talk there uh, with the McDonald's people. And uh, anyway, as they dropped me off in that city, I was a little frightful. You know, that's a different city. But believe it or not, those people are frightful of my country as well, the wide open. <laughs> They're like, it's dark out there. I'm like, yeah, I know. You know, that way when you appear, I'll shoot you. No, you won't do that. <laughs> okay? And it's just one on one. <laughs> okay? Okay? So don't come to my country. So, no, but when I, they dropped me off there, if I didn't have somebody guiding me in that city, I would have been lost. And what it made me feel like is, is like those new bawling calves that you just took them away from their mom and they just lost their source of guidance, and then you're taking them to the pen, and you're literally, if there's two of you or three of you, there's three of you behind, or there's two of you behind the herd, but nobody in front. You ever think of that? Think about those little calves. If they just had somebody to follow, how much easier that would be to take them to their pen. Be that source of guidance for them. They love it, and they crave it. But you can't walk your normal speed either, because you'll walk faster than them, okay? Unless they're running. I've had that happen before, too. <laughs> That's cat was so excited. Literally, one time I tripped and I fell, and I was rolling. I was doing somersaults and going, God, I hope they don't come over the top of me. <laughs> but it was really bad. It was one of my Polish moments. They do prefer to go in a straight line, and so, this is out. This is at Meat, Meat Animal Research Center. This place is on an old army ground. It's in World War II, where we had bunkers, and so the old bunkers are still there, ammunition bunkers. 
And uh, so it has a lot of history. And I don't know if you can see, we might have to dim the lights a little bit. Can we do that? Oh man, you can do it via remote. There you go. Ooh, you had it. Maybe it was just my video camera. I don't know, can I dim these here? There you go, okay. So I'll replay it for you, but. But in that, I mean, cattle do love to go straight. Um, and this to me is just perfect example of that, is, is that um, when we pair up calves, and th this video will precede one of the videos that I'll show you. This is in the spring. I'll show you another one of these same cow-calf pairs in the fall and what we do and how they actually go through the gate into the gathering pen. And this is at the Meat Animal Research Center in uh, Clay Center, Nebraska, and a uh, fantastic place. It's one of the largest research centers as far as in, in the States anyway for cow-calf, as well as for feedlot. We feed everything out there. So all these calves are literally enrolled in research project the day they're born, um, and then they go on to those projects through the feeding phase. And you can see in there, when we, when we go out there in the morning and we actually get them up and we allow them to suckle for 30, 40 minutes before we start moving, we literally have cow-calf pairs paired up. That's important. And when people tell me they don't have time for that, I'm like, well, then you have a lot of time for chaos in your life. Because that 30 minutes is going to be the best 30 minutes you've ever spent. Think about this way, if, my, if, if I told my wife that we're gonna go on a sudden trip and, I, and we have two little infants, now who has to take care of those infants before we go on that trip? I'm not only a crappy veterinarian, I'm a crappy dad. <laughs> okay. She's gonna do it. But if I rush her, how's my day gonna go? Not so good, is it? And how's the little kid gonna be the rest of the trip? Not so good. I should, but I don't. <laughs> I'm up here. <laughs> She's back home. <laughs> okay. Thank God we're empty nesters now, so it's really good. We got them both out of the house. Our goal was is to get them out and weaned and to never come back. Okay. <laughs> I told them that I have my life partner. It was up to them to go find their life partner, but they were not my life partner. Okay. <laughs> So these are the concepts of stockmanship, and we'll talk a little bit about distance, um, positioning, angles, and speed. The positioning means two things to me. It's posture. And so when I'm with cattle, I'm constantly changing my posture. And so like this to me is just a very non-aggressive posture. If I come to cattle like this, and I need them to move, and they're really docile cattle, this isn't going to work. But I also don't like using my voice. Okay. So if I need docile cattle like little beef on dairies to move, I gotta change. I gotta get down to my old wrestling stance days and just get in. I might have to get in really, you know, I move my feet a lot. There's sometimes I'll sit there and I'll walk standing still. If you have cattle standing still and you need them to move in an alley, and you're standing there going like this. I don't know if you're airing out your armpits or what, but they can't fly, okay? That does nothing to cattle, okay? This does nothing to cattle. This does something to cattle. They feel your feet move, guess what they do? Their feet start to move. If you have a really great horse, which I've had two great horses, you know, I could go out to that pasture without a lead and be walking, and the horse will come walk with me. I stop, horse will stop. I start walking again, guess what happens? Horse walks with me. If I do this to the horse and I don't move, the horse is like, what the hell? <laughs> <laughs> like, you joking son of a gun, you. <laughs> okay? Why would you do that to me? 
So for straightforward movement or encouraging movement like that, we always start up at the front of the herd. Okay? I never go to the back to encourage that motion. I might end up sometimes at the back depending on where the heads are turned, but I always try to start up at the front. When I want to slow cattle down or speed them up, if I want to speed them up, I go against them. If I want to slow them down, I go with them and get away from them and get towards the front. If I need to shut one off, I don't slam down on them and cut them off. I go with them, I get further away, and I get ahead of them. Like, I don't want it to be a race. Okay? You'll stop one every time when you do that. And you can say, well, I had this mean wild one one time, Doc, that she wouldn't stop. Last time when I was up in Canada, I used to drink a lot. <laughs> and when we were going back down through the border, we were very bloodshot in the eyes and so forth, but the, the guys there at the border, they asked, they says, uh, what brought you up to Canada? And we said, well, a horse got away from us in Montana, and we've been chasing that son of a gun the entire time. <laughs> they says, why don't you get back down here to the States? That's <laughs> <said>, okay. <laughs> they asked us to remove our sunglasses, and we said, We're, you're not ready for this. <laughs> We're still hung over. So this is a great video to me as far as position, distance, angle, speed, and starting the front. I got to stop this right there. Come here. So watch right here. Right when she gets, starts the movement, right there, that first one turned, look what she did. She turned her body and faced where she wanted the cattle to go. She goes with. This is, she's a Division II softball player. She's a fantastic young lady. She asked if she could come to this video. We were actually airing Doc Talk on this day, and she didn't realize she was going to be on TV. So then I, at the, until the end, I had to have her sign a waiver. But, <laughs> but Maddie did a really fantastic job. She does all the things that you're supposed to do. See how she's staying off the side right there at the beginning? See how that one animal turned back and see the ears are pulled back on them? That's all important. That's how I coach them to read cattle as they're going down an alley. Make yourself available to the animal. Don't just ride behind them or walk behind them. You should be anticipating what those cattle are going to do before they ever do it. When you see that lead animal in that alley, pull that ear back, you should automatically know he's looking over this way and he's probably going to turn that way. So what should you do if you're in a 14-foot wide alley? No. The minute I see him do that, I step over here and I just say, no, it ain't available. I'm here. And guess what they do? They normally look and they go, oh, okay. Maybe if I look the other way. And I just shift. Okay. Yeah. I'm there and I'm off. I'm there and I'm off. It's just pressure release constantly. If I need to turn one, this is a great example of how to turn one just through diagram wise, but if I want this animal to turn this way, so I'm here and I want to turn this way, there's two options of doing that. I can be on this side and I can put my pressure to the hip. That'll naturally bring the animal this way. Or if I'm on this side here, I gotta come all the way up here. Now I gotta point my direction right there between, everybody says the, the shoulder, you gotta be between the shoulder and the ear, but more up towards the ear or that eye. That's gonna do one of two things initially. It's either going to start sending them forward, which then you have to follow and continue the pressure towards the eye to turn them around this way. But you should know that. That whole side of the animal, so when we talk about point of balances, the reason I don't focus so much on the shoulder is mainly because when people do that, that's all they're focused on. 
I look at the entire side of the animal as my steering wheel. There's pressure points on that side that I can inflict and, and use to make motion or turn cattle and make them do what I want them to do. But do it in a way in which it's very voluntary and it's very easy. And now that I'm really slow, I've got to really be, like my instincts have had to really pick up a lot more. I use that ear constantly today on an animal. Okay. I'll show you this video and I want you to tell me position wise if you're going to ask calves to go into that alley, what's wrong with Beto's uh, position? Wrong side. All right? Should always be on the inside corner. Calves are not born with toe abscesses. Okay? We create them. You can blame the concrete, but we have cattle on RCC all day long. They don't get toe abscesses. They only get toe abscesses when people are handling them or you're limit feeding them and they're really, really hungry. Okay? We create them. And we create them by bad, bad positioning, bad angles, bad movement, bad speed. Primarily because we're all focused on just getting the cattle to the pin, and that's it. So in this video, oops. Oh, come on. Well, I shouldn't have did that, but I did. <laughs> yeah, I'll go to the next one. This is the power of drawing cattle. Yeah, it's plain. This is a really long video, but these are cattle that were just recently processed, and uh, we're going to take them about a mile and a half to their home pen. There's nobody in the pen in the back. This is the power of drawing cattle. The curiosity of them, just, it, they can't help but come to that horse. And you can just see how they're gathering and how they're looking. And look how slow, he's literally asking that horse to take little half quarter steps. And even that horse will side pass just a little bit every now and then. He just keeps his feet moving. He's not doing a lot. But look what it does to the other pins. There's going to be one calf in this entire pin that'll stay. And he was a cripple. Now, if, if I told you to go get that pin of cattle out, would you have done it that way? Nope. No way in hell I can tell you that. <laughs> because when I tell you to go get a pin of cattle out, there's only one way you know how to go get them. And that's your predatory instincts, is to get behind them and push them. There's things in Yellowstone that are really good, and there's things in Yellowstone that are really bad. <laughs> okay? The one bad thing in Yellowstone, it's making a lot of people want to become cowboys. <laughs> okay? And I'm not opposed to cowboys. But I really love caregivers and people that understand and know and understand the animal in which they're dealing with. And utilize all their instincts to their advantage. Because that's how you stop running away from wisdom. That would have actually, to go that far, as far as we were going, um, this is where I'd say is, is if you wanted them to go, you know, you could send like Ted, he is at the back here to go get that little cripple. Um, but th that's how they're, they're going to go all the way around there. And like I said, it's going to be a mile and a half jaunt in that alley. 
And chasing cattle after processing, you have to understand what you just did. And this to me is actually better from a feed standpoint, efficiency. Like if you're truly into wanting to, I say is make money, make cattle grow. I, I don't disagree with you that it's slow, but but I because I, I understand what you're saying. I have noticed though that if, if you go ahead of them and open gates, ahead of them, that's all of them. Absolutely, it's hundred percent. Like I, I always tell our guys, I don't I don't like them that much, so I sure, certainly don't want to ride with them. I'd rather ride by myself, and then you you we have a plan. Like I'll be in the lead, you bring up the back, <laughs> okay but I certainly don't want to ride at the back with you because I don't really care about what you did for the weekend okay? <laughs> or what you're going to do. Okay? So this video goes on and on and on, but this is that training those pairs. So that one video I had with those calves pairing up, this is in the fall, and this is us going and getting them and taking them back to the corrals. This is weaning day. So every time we actually move these pairs, that's exactly how we moved them. Okay. We always ask them to be paired up, be together. I don't know, hopefully this will, I'm almost scared to do this again. I don't know if it'll. <laughs> yep, I did it, son of a gun. I shouldn't have did that. Sometimes. Come on. A pin of black cattle that was following them. Yeah. They, was that a, a new environment for them? Or were it they was, them? actually. So the question is, is, was that a new environment for those black calves? And yeah, so they had just arrived. They were in a receiving pen for 24 hours. And then they went and, and got processed, and then we were taking them. So when we ask cattle to lead, the, the strongest time for cattle to follow you is initially um, up front in the, in the arrival process. It's the best time to actually get them to come in and, and to start doing that. Because they're literally, they're so curious, they're looking for that guidance. They want it. Absolutely. Like we have these, when we, yeah. We have this video in Australia that we were helping these young guys get these uh, strays in and uh, from out in the open. We had no corral. We had, we had one fence line. And so we brought the truck, and it was a loading ramp. And, and uh, let me see if I got it. I think I got it. I'll have to just escape out of this. Hopefully I don't screw nothing up. And this is what I like about the presentation usually, is what it usually does, it'll intrigue you all enough. You'll start asking questions or looking for things that I think are really cool. Looks like you're lacking a bit of content. <laughs> yeah, you don't think there's enough on there? So watch these guys. This is our loading facility. If any of you are up here, I think it was in 2019 or 2018 at Calgary Stampede when I was doing my animal handling demo. At the very end, we loaded that truck and I had no corrals other than a loading ramp. And I sent all those cattle, those yearlings up on that ramp individually and loaded the truck. And that was the first time I worked with those cattle. I only worked with those cattle for three hours. That guy in the back, he's one hellacious border collie. But if you train a couple animals to do certain things for you, that's what one of these is. It's what we call a sentinel animal. They've trained them to load. So when we have strays out in the backwoods of Australia, we don't have time to set up corrals, but we can take a sentinel, go match him up with the strays and bring them in and load them. 
to make you believers or no? What do you think? The guy came from Colorado. He must have been smoking the doobage. Right? <laughs> I don't think I was anyway. So that just gives you a little insight as, as far as what I, what I do and how I do it. Let me see if I can get this to, yeah, there we go. I'll just play it right from here. Watch that red cow. You see that one red cow with her head way up? She just popped it up over that yellow right there. She's a nasty son of a gun. And if we did this wrong, I'll guarantee you what she would do. She would take that remainder of the group and take them back out to the pasture. And so there I just had to tell Christy, you got to be aware of that. You got to slow your movement, pay attention, understand when to stop, when to go. When you get that many animals going up through about a 16 foot wide gate, that's not the time to start. And this is, the microphone's on. You don't hear our caregivers out there hooping and hollering or whistling. They say that and then somebody just whistled, son of a... <laughs> the hell? <laughs> That's when I have shot collars on the people that when I'm training them, treat them just like a dog. <laughs> no, I don't do that. <laughs> but boy, if I could have did that to my kids, I would have. There's our goal every time. That's the day of weaning. And on the day of weaning for the cow-calf guys and gals, you do have to understand that is the last day that they're going to meet their mom or get to see their mama. Okay? They don't get to come home from college to get their, their clothes washed anymore. Okay? They don't get to come home just for an everyday meal every now and then. That's the last day. So cherish the day and understand that that day they might be without feed for about 6 to 12 hours. You know, if, if you want to know what the impact of being off feed for six hours in the pig industry would look like, they'd start talking to you about gut leakage and things of that nature. Like in the cattle industry, we don't even talk about gut leakage. And I'm always sitting there going, it's like 90% of what we do in the feeding industry is we feed them to get sick. It's not that I pick on nutritionists, but because we're really good friends with them, but that's what we do. We feed them for the gut to leak, get a little sepsis, get sick. Or when we knock them off feed for a day because of processing or doing those things, you have to understand what you're doing. That's why that morning meal before you go separate cow-calf pairs is really important. Let them get something in their tummy before you do it. Scours is an environmental issue. It's a management issue. And my cow-calf guys don't like when I say that, but that is the honest-to-God truth. We can vaccinate all you want for it, but you got to change your environment and change your management a little bit. Just realize that, you know, when you point a finger at something, you have two fingers pointing at the person you're pointing at. you got three fingers pointing back at yourself. I used to do that to my son, and he started going like this when he'd point to me. <laughs> it's like, you... He's so smart. <laughs> God bless him. Okay. So selecting a building site. Oh, let me go back on that one slide. I think it's important. Is like when when I talk about. Uh, handling cattle and so forth is, is, is just, I, I talk a little bit about mediocrity and, and some of our results I think is sometimes our mediocrity. <laughs> um, and a lot of that's because of a lack of understanding of the animal in which we're working with. And then a lot of it is, is that if you don't like the results, say like you're weaning calves and you don't like, like how many of you work with your spouses on day of weaning or just processing the show of hands? How many of you love each other at the end of the day <laughs> you, you, <laughs> don't yell. you don't yell. Perfect. It ain't worth it. It's a waste of oxygen, right? There's very few spouse pairs that really like each other at the end of the day. And sometimes they dread going.
going and doing those events. And I'm like, why would you dread that? That should be an opportunity. That should be a, one of the best days of your life. It's the best day of my life was when I go to go handle them. Right? So I, need, I, I get to have a really great interaction. So why would you settle for really having bad results and handling results on that day? Why wouldn't you look at your facility and go, this isn't working, I should change something. Like the cattle don't want to go here, why don't they want to go there? Y'all have these, these silly little phones. I use mine for jokes, all right, and video. But a lot of times when I see something that I, I don't understand, what I'll do is I'll come down to the eye level of the animal in which I'm working with, and I'll take a photo of it. And then I'll look at it and I'll study it and go, what the hell are they seeing that they don't like? That's how I fix things. And then if I see something like there's a dead end, or what appears to be a dead end, what do you think I'm going to do? Am I going to keep working? Well, I'm going to work that day probably. But the next time, it's going to be changed before I ever go do it the next time. Like, I'll blow holes and stuff. I'm all about a torch. Okay? Open up their eyes. Let them see. Okay? Don't settle for, for mediocrity and poor results. Just change it. So, when we're choosing a site, we'll get into some of the facilities that we do. I think that this is oftentimes overlooked, especially uh, with feedlots. In the past, it's been more, it was overlooked in the past a lot. Today, people are putting a little bit more investment because it costs a lot to build them. And so they're thinking a little bit more. Like one of my calls uh, mid-morning was with a guy in Kansas, a cow-calf guy that sent me a Google map of his pasture where he wants some facilities built. And so I just quick took the information and well, then I'll get it drawn up, hopefully this weekend if I get home, and uh, we'll get something figured out. Think about like what I said about your existing facilities. I'm, I'm, not, I'm not always into, like I love building from scratch because it's the easiest, but I really like remodeling what you have and just make it work and make it better. Um, but again, you have to really study the environment and, and study what's there to make it better. Okay got really bright young minds and I always say man if you understand the behavior you'll figure it out you don't need Polish goofballs like me coming out to your place and <laughs> telling you what to do but I'm always happy to look at your drawings or look at what you got this is how facilities used to be built the feeding part of that is just over on the other side of this guess what the truck flow and the traffic is like in this this feed yard and they're trying to handle cattle up in this area. Just the noise alone is counterproductive to what you're trying to do. Okay. And then look at this. Feeding's over here. Processing's kind of over in that middle area. This is a one-person show in terms of handling cattle. And then yesterday, the yard I got to go to, they showed me these gates that they have for cross alleys. That's fantastic. Big old 40 feet sweeps that you can, one person can literally bring it around. It's just fantastic. It was over at uh, Rimrock is where they took me yesterday. I loved it. Like all the stuff that I, I design or that comes to my mind is not mine. It's all been part of the people that I get to work with or the places I get to go. And I see things and I go, yeah, I like that. I would maybe do it a little bit different, but this is what I would do. Okay. So I think developing a plan of activities is understand like when I design, I'll usually go down through a list of like, what things are you going to do in this barn or, or in this facility? What are, what's your goals? You know, Preg checking, uh, reproductive exams, castration, implanting, branding, whatever you're doing, weight collection, research enrollment, all of those things require different things. If you're doing like research enrollment, 
even if you're doing like just preg checking and stuff like that, I always look at like what's the ease of cleaning the building and uh, for biosecurity standards and stuff like that. And plus, I hate having things on the ground like hoses and stuff. I do everything with drop cords and drop hoses from the ceiling. It's way nicer. You ever go to a mechanic shop and they bring the air hose, you know? They never have hoses on the floor. It's fantastic. You can do the same with water hoses, electrical cords, and those things are really cheap at the end of the day. Like some people will say, well, that's a $150 real kit. I'm like, what's the length of time you're gonna have this building? <laughs> I think the payout will be okay. Like the 150 is like very minimal, okay? You should be more worried about the $200,000 building. The $150 hose, hose reel is not that big of an issue, right? If that's gonna break you, then maybe we should cut some of the building off, okay? And leave the, the bud tub or the bud box or tub deal outside, <laughs> okay? I try to make it like what, what's best for you. I always think about biosecurity. I always say like the US market, well, North America's market, um, when you really think about how Brazil got their, their foot in the door, did anybody watch Yellowstone this last weekend? Anybody? Yeah. What'd she say about the Brazilian beef market? A clearing rainforest, it's where beef's gonna be produced. You know, and honestly, a, I don't know that they're that far off, right? But you know how they got their little foot in the door? Does anybody recall 2003? U.S. and Canada were involved. What's that? I know, me too, because <laughs> it really devastated our market, right? It really did. Why did U.S. lose their export ability and confidence? Because we didn't have traceability. You know how long it took us to figure out where the cow came from? It's like, Jesus. <laughs> it took three months and like millions of dollars. How much you know, security did that give to other countries? And guess what Brazil was doing? Hey, we can figure it out in 24. And now they're here. So now we've got to deal with them, right? There's no reason for it at the end of the day, but biosecurity to me is important. And so when I think about when I'm laying out facilities today, today like shipping and hauling facilities, even if it's on a ranch, I would always make sure it's on the perimeter. Like if you ever have biosecurity lines drawn up so that you can maintain shipping, if there's like, like mad cow is one thing, but what's the worst thing that could happen to us? Hoof and mouth. How are you gonna deal with that if that ever happens? So I'm a big believer it's not if it'll happen, it's just when. You think about all the wackos out there today. I'd say, man, we better have a plan of where you're going to ship cattle and be able to maintain your biosecurity so you can continue to ship cattle. So if you're not in that zone, you can continue to do business. Those are the things I think about today. And a lot of people, even in our feedlots today, they don't think about that. Like, it's so far from their mind. They're like, ah... We're just worried about today. I'm not. I'm more worried about what's going to happen and how do I make sure you stay in business at the end of the day. Okay. I think computer hardware, software, so if we have herd tracks in there, or, uh, you know, the um, individual animal management system, it's easier for me to say it that way. I'm terrible with acronyms. <laughs> okay. But, uh, those types of systems, you know, how you capture your data and how you, you do the stuff that you need to do. Um, I think all that's important. Again, keeping it watertight so we can wash or sweep or do whatever. Obviously, you're not going to do a lot of washing this time of year, um, but how we do those things. Scales, overhead, or floor mount. I'm a bigger fan of floor mount still. I work with the overhead scales, but the suspended ones. But the only reason I don't like them 
is that you know kind of moving and if an animal's on that scale and that shoots kind of moving it just gives them a little bit of like e okay they sense that and it makes them a little nervous so i'm all about keeping the animal calm for the few seconds i have to have them in there make sure it's a delightful process and get them out this video I'm not going to mess with it this way because I know what it'll do to me. So I'll play the video. But I want you to understand this guy here, watch how these cattle go into this barn. This is a barn that I designed and, and that I did. You know what they were complaining about as far as why that, those animals weren't going very good? What do you think they mentioned to me right when they what was giving those cattle problems? The shadow, right? Everybody's like, oh, it's a shadow. Well, I had been watching him out in the back for about three rounds, and he struggled every time. This guy is from the uh, Larned Correctional Center. He is, he's a prisoner. Okay? He was going on the outside edge and not coming on the inside corner. Now watch what happens. Same group of cattle. The shadow is still there. think positions matter I'll, and I'll keep it going this time I ain't going to interrupt the video so I don't screw it up you think that position matters I think it does because he'll come out here he'll do it again and he literally the three groups I watched him before that he struggled each one Shadow is still there. It didn't move. Crazy, isn't it? This guy was put in prison for doing a little bit of uh, sniffing dust and selling it. He's a tree trimmer by trade. Poor guy. <laughs> These are fantastic people to work with, though. I tell you what. They want to be out of that prison. <laughs> they like, but we have security cameras up around that building all over the place. A couple times I was there, the warden and, or the guards came out to, apparently one of them did something wrong and they were working cattle and the poor guy running the alley, all of a sudden the guards came in there, put him on the ground, handcuffed him and hauled him off. And I was like, well, shit, we needed him. <laughs> I don't care what he did in prison, we, we still need him, we're not done working cattle. <laughs> Can you send another? <laughs> okay. This is on the inside. And these guys, we, it doesn't take long to work with them and, and train them. Like there we have our hydraulic no backs. We get them up. I always call them no, no goes if they're down too far. So we put them on hydraulics so we can get them up out of the way. He stays on the inside corner. Life is good. It's very voluntary. Okay. has to sit there and wait a little bit the other little kid was also in there for a lot of dope stuff but our worst ones have been there's been some uh, I've, I've dealt with one murderer he shot his dad and uh, I didn't know that at the time and I just asked him <laughs> I always ask him what'd you do <laughs> and, uh, and they always look at me and they go what'd you do and I go I fell off my horse. <laughs> okay. And the one guy told me, I, he never did tell me that he did that to his dad. The, the manager told me, and, and uh, man, I looked at him totally different after that. I was, but you, like, you would never have known it, right? These guys are great actors. It's crazy, I mean, to be that cold, right? But great workers, nonetheless. But that's who we get to work with sometimes. So it's pretty awesome, actually. I always tell people, I get to work with the absolute worst, okay? And uh, we make them into something. And uh, one of our guys that implants on that crew, he's been there for 15 years, still in prison. And uh, but I think in two years, he gets out. And we've asked him to please just come back and be a part of the, the feed yard. And uh, we're hoping and praying that he does because he's really, really good. So, huh? We might. <laughs> We've actually talked about it. <laughs> she asked, are you branding him? I was like, yeah, we might. So this is the difference open facilities versus closed facilities. And so 
understand that, like, to me, I can visually see in that open facility and I can see all the easiness of it. I can understand why cattle would flow in it, why it gives them comfort, um, why it gives them confidence. We have confident footing in, in the bud box or even if it's a bud tub or whatever. Um, that's what we would try to do every time. Whether it's a rubber floor, bedding, something has to be confident in their footing. This facility down below, I can understand why they would balk at going through that. I mean, do you see what I see? Looks like a black wall. And when cattle hit a black wall, what do they do? Stop, reorganize, turn around, go back. Every time. So I'll talk to you a little bit about bud boxes, tubs, and bud tubs. So today I primarily do bud tubs, mainly from a safety standpoint with people. So the bud box you just got to see um, with him as far as Dave, as far as running it, how he runs it, and so forth. You can also see some of maybe the hazards of doing them is, is that you're in there with the cattle and in a tight area. And if you get an ornery one, well, Dave's a prisoner. <laughs> we'll get another one. No, no. <laughs> No, I'm not that way. <laughs> We'd hate to lose him. But, <laughs> but you can see how it can be detrimental, right? You can put them, you're putting people in safety risk, right? So <laughs> I'm going to get fired before I ever get hired. <laughs> so, okay, bud box, the pros of a bud box is, is that they're super easy to design and build. The reason I start, when I started doing AutoCAD, the reason I loved doing bud boxes is because making squares on AutoCAD for me with lines is really easy. Making arcs and making them work really suck, okay? <laughs> like, it's, it, you gotta be really on your deal. I, I give engineers credit all day long for what they can do. It's like, wow. Even welders that have to do it, take an engineer's plan and do it, it's like, wow, that's pretty good. Bud boxes are super cost effective because on a ranch, you can do them with cattle panels, portable panels. Like these guys that pull circular tub alleys to the pasture, well, just take a load of panels. I mean, anybody know Burke Teekert? I managed the Deseret Ranches for a lot of years. Burke always taught me is, is that, he taught me several things. He's a fantastic person, a fantastic manager of people and developer of people. But one of the things on a ranch he always told me is keep things fluid. Don't build it permanent. Because when the bank comes, you want to be able to hide it. <laughs> you don't want them to know that you had that. Okay? And then you want to be able to move it really quick over to another place so they can't see it. <laughs> okay? If it's permanent, they're going to see it and you're not going to move that one very easy. Okay? They're going to sell that one. Okay? So he always taught me, keep things fluid, keep, it, keep your assets liquid at the end of the day. Okay? Um, the other thing he always taught me is, is, is that, you know, what the, what the definition of, of uh, leadership is and, uh, and, and management. And he says part of management is, is that you provide people tools and you provide them the education and you provide them the freedom to use it. But he said if it doesn't come in that order, they will fail. You can't just go give somebody a tool without educating them on the tool and then ask them to use it and think that they're going to be successful. So when we give people these tools or we put people in these facilities, we need to educate them on how to use them. We can't just tell them to go get the pin of cattle. We can't just tell them to go round up cattle out in the pasture. You can't assume that they know. You should always have a plan. So this is at SRAM feedlot. This is a very good example of just voluntary flow. People get worried about my open sides about cattle not flowing by people. This guy's worked here for 12 years. We don't really know what he does. He's semi-retired, but that's usually his position in the processing barn. Yeah, I think he's just counting the cattle. We don't know. 
They seem to like him and they just come into the facility, so we don't, we don't care. These cattle have actually been through once before. How many of you have actually taken cattle through once and then complained about how hard it was to go back through the second time? And if you're on cow-calf, you know that like with synchronization programs and handling them three times or four times in a row in a short period of time can be very strenuous and very difficult, especially if the facilities are not good. So what we always look at in our facilities is, is that if, if they come through one time, they should come back through the second time better. And the third time, better yet. The only ones we've ever had difficult with is that Meat Animal Research Center where we've sent cattle through like 17 to 22 times in about a 20 day period. And we're doing punch biopsies of their muscle and their loins and taking blood and everything else. Well, there's a lot, not a lot of good things happening up at the chute. <laughs> okay. That's when we start having a little trouble. Okay. This one, this bud box used to be sheeted all the way up to the top. So we asked them to take the sheeting off. Watch what Jose does here. This is Jose Vias. He's on our team. He pulls across to pull that ear across. He brings that animal around, and then he's going to send him. Now he's going to start turning a little bit. He should start turning. He didn't. Now he's going to actually come out so that he maintains eye contact. That's a bud tub, okay? or a bud box, I'm sorry. Okay, circular tubs. The pros of a circular tub to me is, is that it requires less understanding of animal behavior. Like I don't need to be really knowledgeable about putting cattle in a tub and sweeping them around. And that's not to be offensive. That's just, the, if you ask Temple Grandin, she'd tell you. I work with a lot of people in packing plants. They don't have a lot of talent. I got to have facilities so that we can move cattle. Doesn't require a lot of training or a lot of thought. Right? And that's not to be offensive. If you take it offensively, well, get over yourself. Okay? The cons to me is, is that they're expensive to build. Um, again, it requires less understanding of the natural behavior of cattle. I think oftentimes, most of the time, they're misused. We fill them up full. Like if you have a, a circular tub, a bud box, or a bud tub, how many cattle should you place in that facility? Enough to fill the alley. To fill the alley. Who said that? There you go. Amen. Should you go get more if the alley's filled? No. It's okay to stand and collect a paycheck. Why do people go fill it? Because they worry about what people are thinking about them. Standing there. They want to be busy. Do cattle care if you're busy? No. Cattle could give two... I about said <laughs> bad word. They don't care. They do care about your positioning. They care about if they have a place to go. Those facilities are guiding facilities only. They are not storage facilities. Why do they get so dirty with manure? Because we store cattle in them. What do cattle do when they stand and they're nervous? They defecate. <laughs> you know what cattle do if they have a place to go and they don't have to stand for very long? They don't poop that much. You know how much time that saves in cleaning? It's really fantastic. Those are just truths. You can sit there and go, that's not true, Kip. I'd be like, oh. Um, I look at, so say like if I can fit seven in my alley, just for example, or eight, we'll use eight. If I get down and I'm, I'm kind of calculating how fast, so if, I, if it's like re-implant or something, and like we're clocking cattle through every 20 seconds, through the chute, or the crush, whatever you call them here, then uh, those eight aren't going to last me very long. Like I might get eight in, I might let one go, and I might, depending on my walk and the distance I have to go to get my next draft, 
That's what it will depend on. So sometimes I might go right away if, if the flow is going really good. But say it's taking us a minute up at the chute, I might wait till I have like three left in the alley. It only takes me two minutes to go get the cattle and bring them into the facility. That tells me that they're going to have one left behind the chute by the time I get there. That's it. So I start gauging it. That person in the back, that's, that's their job is to gauge flow. These are just some different designs that I pulled off. This is a design at one of our yards, just a very poor circular tub design. You can see why cattle wouldn't go in there. This is what we did to it to remodify it. I actually poured some concrete and we made it into a bud tub. Okay. Now we bring cattle in, we shut that solid gate, it goes right into the alley and then we can actually sweep them right back around. It's really slick. We made that really easy for people now. This is a poor tub design. Some of you might be there. This is an example. This alley will hold five cattle. What do we do? We fill the tub. Cattle go in, they reorganize. They're like, uh-uh, there's no place for me to go there. Now, would you blame these people for prods and hot shots and stuff like that. I mean, you could blame them, but or I could come in there and take those devices away. They're going to get really mad at me. What do I need to do with this facility? The owner designed this facility, which at the time I did not know. They asked me in the main office what I thought of the facility. I said, well, it looked like a gladiator ring to me with all the concrete. And uh, like I was thinking about the gladiators, you know, <laughs> down in the pits and you can't get away. And uh, I told him, I said, well, the first thing I would do is I'd get some dynamite and I'd blow that son of a gun up and I'd start over and I'd give you something better. And he's like, well, I designed that. And I was like, well, I'd still just get dynamite and I'd blow it up and start over. <laughs> Not a lot you can do with concrete. So once you have it, you have it, right? So, and if it's designed poorly, well, then you just have a really expensive facility that's poorly designed. And I get to shoot videos like this and show them to people what I wouldn't do. This was a tub facility. That video went on for like 30 minutes. I didn't bore you with that. This used to be solid. You'll see these are Canadian calves. You'll see the CAN brand on them. We open that up. And today, that, that snake is actually opened up all the way around now. But just opening, like, you see, you can see through that to that one side all the way to the door. They used to balk at going in there. So we just open that up. We opened up where they primarily stand. The CEO of this feed yard told me that you're going to have cattle break their legs. And I told Jerry, I says, Jerry, if you have nothing positive to say about what these guys have done, I said, if any animal ever breaks its leg in that facility, I says, I will label it as respiratory dead so you will never know. But I said, what these guys have done to help your cattle. It's phenomenal. Like that'd be the last thing I'd be worried about. We've never broken a leg in this facility to date. And the reason we took all that solid off the alley is because today we work with like 350 pound beef on dairies. It's primarily a backgrounding yard. And those little beef on dairies, believe it or not, they just sweep around very really nice. But we had to take that sheeting off so the little buggers could see us. <laughs> they couldn't see us. Just made that facility a lot better. I don't know if you can see this very good. Is there a pointer up here by chance? Yeah. I could point with that pen, but it ain't gonna work very good. If not, that's okay. You got one? Oh man, thanks. I shocked you. <laughs> okay, this is a bud tub. You can't see this one very good. This is a bud tub in a loading facility. 
Okay. This is that Timmerman's yard in Indianola. Um, they built it just like it is, like, a, like I drew it, uh, which is really nice. Um, but basically the cattle come through, they come around, and then they come up. So rather than a, a normal tub design would have brought them this way and swept them around. Well, I need some alcohol or something. <laughs> no, I'm just joking. Okay, I'll stop shaking. They, normally, uh, a normal tub, they would have brought them around and swept them around. I actually bring them the opposite way, bring them through, let them come around, and then return where they came from and come up. Does that make sense? Here, up. Okay, I'll show you some videos of it. Okay. This is uh, in Grenada, uh, Grenada Feeders in Colorado. Shut the gate. Is that voluntary? I think so. To me, that's that's processing here. Yep. And that's a rubber floor. That's animats. Those are up here in Canada, I believe. Makes those the makers of those. We use a lot of animats in our facilities today. The only things I'd do different is, is again, with these tubs, this is a Dodge manufactured tub from Dodge, Nebraska, is where this manure is, is I'd have that open to the top. It's the only thing I'd do different. Okay. This is another tub. This is a quarter tub. <clears throat> this is the one I really prefer. This one, we have a little walkthrough. Like they can walk right through there. Cattle don't see it. There's no gate. Here, if Dan would have just been, this is Dan Thompson from Doc Talk. Um, kind of a crazy, funny guy. He's also our CEO. He's a really fantastic person. He wouldn't have had to do that right there. The animal was gonna go on his own. That's a really nice bud tub. And so we did one of these at National. It's just a 16, it's actually about 18 diameter tub at the uh, National Beef Packing Plant in uh, Dodge City, Kansas. Um, I got my first foot in the door, um, really upset Temple at the, at the uh, uh, NAMI's conference in Kansas City. She had to, she was there, she got to see it. Um, and uh, she had her opinions of it and so forth, but, which was fine. And uh, I love Temple. I mean, she's brought a lot of awareness to our, our, our industry. And, and, uh, but just the things that I design are a little bit different and, uh, and different in, in their modes of action. And, uh, and so here's another one. This is a drone. This gives you a little bit better interpretation of a bud tub. So we can actually set this gate wherever we want it. Like we could open it all the way up back to here or we can close it down tighter. This gives you the best impression of how they use it. Does that make sense? So that one's still solid. Yes, there's a Dodge tub as well. Would you, like the, I, the swing, the closed gate that you follow up with is yeah. pretty solid. Yeah. Do you advise a bit more open? Though yes, absolutely. Because I always think about, uh, Troy, about working on the ground if I'm on foot. Yeah. The cattle have to be able to see me. Yeah. And I don't want to be hanging over. And I don't, again, this to me, this catwalk around there, that is a waste of money. Just open it up. You don't need no catwalk. I don't need to be above them. I need to be with them. They need to see me. They need to feel me. They need to taste me. So those reverse bug tubs. Yep. Do you have a do you have an entryway like you did on the last one on these ones as well? On the old ones? Or can you revamp them somehow? You can revamp the old ones. Absolutely. And you have that escaper yep. to get over. Yep. Yep. Like if you wanna say you wanna walk through and come over on this side, I put a little walk through right there. And so let me see if I have a, 
Now let me go through. I'll go through this, and then at the very end, I'll show you some of the walkthroughs that we do. Okay. So with any facility, I think just understanding of the behavior of cattle, I think, is first and foremost most important. Only place in the tub what the alley will hold. Don't put any more cattle in there than what's what'll well, what put that way. Mm -hmm. And you bring enough into Correct. And so how many would you have typically to load a deck? Yep, exactly. And so that tub that I just showed you, if you opened up that back suite, yeah, it'll hold 16 and then some. Absolutely, 100%. Double alleys or single alleys coming over the tub? It's a good question. Danny Daniels is my best friend in the whole wide world. Guy fought bulls for Tough Hedeman and Lane Frost. And I mean, he wrestled for Nebraska for two years, dropped out of college, went on to bullfighting. Silliest bastard I've ever seen. He's the one that we got, we got kicked out of a McDonald's drive through in Lethbridge, Alberta. About got deported on that deal. <laughs> okay. That's how crazy I get sometimes. Okay. And we were nice. We just were doing the Charlie Brown mic deal. You know, she didn't like that. Okay. So, <laughs> silly stuff. Okay. But, uh, <laughs> but I, I argue with Danny all the time about the double. I, the re I don't mind the double. I just don't like the transition to a single because that's where cattle bulk up and they, they get tight and it looks like a tube of toothpaste to me. Like you got two, two animals coming in that double, they want to get to the single and then all of a sudden it's like, a, you know, yeah, it just tightens up, you know, they can't move. So I'm more about keep the, like the double width to start for about five to six feet, but have that angle because most of our cattle will use the outside alley anyway and then just keep it straight. Don't give them a transition. Just keep it straight and keep it single. Okay? Because what does the double gain you? Two animals. Well, for crap's sakes. <laughs> I don't need two animals, right? I'll just go get two more. If that's what it takes. So it's a great question. I love that question. That's awesome. Yeah. Okay, yeah. How many, how many can work? How many can you work at once? One. <laughs> yeah, they're all there, but what, is, what happens when cattle stop moving? They stand, they stand there until somebody comes and moves them, right? So how many people do you have? Today it's getting fewer and fewer. So I might, you know, look at that and, and go, okay, well, and that would be one of my questions to you is, well, how fast do you work cattle, for one? And then, you know, if you're working every 20 seconds, well, you might need, uh, you know, where you have 15, because it's going to be pretty quick. But if, if you're taking a minute, well, you might only need five or six standing there. You don't need a lot. I like motion continuing. I don't like motion to stop. Because if motion stops, I got to go restart it, and I don't like that. Okay. And I think in the future, futuristic-wise, there's things that the dairies are doing today with robotics, like robotic processing of cows in terms of a single alley and just a hydraulic sweep that pushes them over to a padded deal. And then this little robotic arm comes down. And it has like four injectors in it. It looks right at the neck and goes, <laughs> done. Pretty quick. So like some of the things I'm doing today, I'm designing around that. Because I, I don't want to design a facility that you can't remodel quickly and put robotics in. And you go, well, you're trying to take my job, Doc. I'm not trying to take your job. It's just that you're not applying. <laughs> and what I would also tell you, when you have kids at home, I, I talked to the feedlot manager about this here last week. He's telling his, his younger kid, his kid's a sophomore in high school, telling him, you know, Go do something different. Go do something different. I'm like, Travis, why would you do that? Zach loves the feedlot. 
well, I don't want them to go through the struggles I'm going through. I said, well, you have a beautiful house. You put food on your plate. Why are you telling them not to come back? Because it's a struggle? Well, hell, life's a struggle. Don't sway these kids away from ag. This is the best environment that anybody can be in. And if you do cattle right, it should be the funnest event you ever do in your life from a family standpoint. If it's not, change it. Figure it out. Make it fun. Make it enjoyable. Well, I think we all agree we're not here for the money. No. <laughs> Hell no. It's a lifestyle. Right? So these are just some, so this is, a, this is my vet clinic in Ainsworth, Nebraska when I first built it. So this is an overhead view of it. And uh, you can see I had bud boxes there. Um, this is a facility today. This was a high choice feeders. Um, I put these little safety walk alleys in today. So the handler is always on the correct side of cattle, you can walk down, slip through these little walkways, bring a gate, slip through a walkway, bring a gate, whatever you're doing. Okay. This is that same facility, just a little closer up. There you can see the bud, bud tub that I put in today. You can see the little walkway right there. So you shut that gate, you can walk through. This gate here, you can actually put on electric over hydraulics, put it on a remote. You can actually put this gate on a remote as well. It's really slick. We have them today where you can actually remote unlock and latch the gate with a little cylinder. I like things really simple. You don't get a physique like this by overworking. <laughs> okay. <laughs> okay. We give people really nice environments, hydraulic room, restrooms, vet storage rooms. This is uh, in this, their facility. They put their uh, horse bays with a wash bay for the horse tack and all that in there as well. It's a really nice facility. I mean, these guys really thought about their people. Here's those little walkways right there. That's how simple they are. I was at a, that facility yesterday where they had little gates like for, for the overhead door. I thought what Shiloh told me yesterday was so spot on. He's like, I'm going to remove these little gates, Dr. Kip. And you, and you know why? Because he says somebody's going to bring this overhead door down on this on little remote, you know. It's, it's not a roll-up one like manual one. It's on push button. <laughs> he goes, somebody's going to drop this door and not bring those gates across, and we're going to ruin the door. You know how much the doors are? They're expensive. They're like $10,000 doors. Those overhead doors are today. They're expensive. And he told me, he says, you know, the cattle don't even, he says, I've ran this facility and not closed those little gates. He says, none of the cattle look at them. I says, exactly. And you could actually make them 18 inches wide and the cattle still won't look at them. And they always, you know what the one person would always say, what about that one? <laughs> one out of 4,000 to me doesn't matter, right? That's a statistic. <laughs> That's an animal trying to commit suicide and go do something that he wasn't supposed to do in the first place. Okay, and if he gets his head in there, guess how far he's going to get? Not very. So it doesn't matter. Keep them. I don't like why I do those today, and you can kind of see it on the other side here. That's what they see. But you know how fast a human can get through that if you get an honorary one. Really quick. You know how long it takes me to open up a gate? About three seconds. You know what three seconds can buy you? Not a broken leg. <laughs> okay? And not a workman's comp claim. And I don't have to scale a fence, which is really cool. Yeah. Like I like having outs and get out of trouble areas. About 18 inches. Yep. Oh, sorry. I'll go back. I'll replay that. This will actually show it. So, 
Now everybody will say, those guys are really skinny. I guarantee a fat guy can get skinny if you're getting chased. Okay. <laughs> oh. I, I realized yesterday when Eric put me on the D sort, I am an ultra early out. I only had 11 days to shipping. <laughs> That's the uh, South Dakota State uh, cow-calf research facility. I got to design that with uh, Cody Wright, and it's a fantastic facility. I tried to send my son up there, but he ended up going to UNL, and UNL just built, was building, in the process of building a new facility, but they didn't use me. They used my designs. They used Sechi Agri-Engineering, so they're using my designs still, but uh, they didn't use me, and that's fine. No hard feelings. This is a ranch. This is actually up in Canada. Um, a deal that I designed up here. This is just a bud box facility. So we had kind of a main gathering uh, system and then they could come down, they could go in these systems, sort back and so forth. This is my favorite ranch facility for sorting. This is over by uh, Rose, Nebraska, which is unincorporated. There's basically nobody lives in Rose. Okay. When you have cows that love to go somewhere, let them go. And then just, if you step in front of a little ultra-sensitive calf, that little calf will go, oh, Jesus. And then they'll go off to another spot. And then we can take these calves, when we have them here, and we put them right through that white gate, they go down right with their mamas. It's fantastic. But what's really neat about this place, when they do their brandings or uh, calf weaning vaccinations and stuff like that, Eric will actually send all the cows through and he'll sort the day before and then he'll leave them separated. And then that morning he'll put them back together and he'll do the whole process one more time and sort them again on the very first time. And we actually are always training for separation. Like our day of weaning on a cow calf ranch is the day the calf is born. Every time we separate mom and calf, we're always thinking of the last day. That's in our mind. That's how we think. We're a little weird, a little bit different, but I'm sorting so that I don't have to use CT CTC and things of that nature. This is a cow-calf facility at Meat Animal Research Center. So this is a bud box, but if we do have to capture an individual, say like a C-section or a OB or dystocia, we can open this little gate, it actually opens up. What's really nice about this though is that gate will actually swing all the way around, but we'll bring them through. She actually comes through another little box right back here. This is a little pull cord, right? little gate right here is actually on a, a nice little slam latch. And so she'll walk this way voluntarily on her own. We actually then send that gate across. We can walk through here, we get to our pull gate, by the time she's back there, she's already coming back where she came from, coming back into this catch. We'll go to the stand right here, boom, catch them. If you want to watch that, it's on Doc Talk. I think, I can't remember what episode it's on, but uh, it's with the Meat Animal Research Center. And uh, if you look that episode up, you'll find Katie, and you'll watch Katie bring a cow through, and she'll catch it, and it's really nice. Then our little work area is if we have to do a dystocia or anything like that, there's a door right there. We can actually open that door up. So if it's really cold, we can pull that calf into a calf warmer, warm it up really quick, or do whatever we need to do to it. But all of our working supplies and all our work stuff is right there. When we're normally processing cows, that's the vet station. Computer stuff, everything is right there. So when we design things on a ranch, that's what we'll do. Okay? Make sense? If you have an okay corral or some portable type corral system, you can build bud boxes with square panels. You don't need to take a tub facility out to work your cattle. If you're taking an okay corral or some type of a portable system like that, uh, there's a whole bunch of different ones. I just always know the okay corral, so I'm not promoting their design or their facility. Okay, There's a whole bunch of different ones that are out there. And do it that simple. This is another little portable facility you could do out of portable corral panels. 
Cows come in, sort them out, sort the calves, keep the cows, sort the calves into here, sort the cows over there, work them. Okay. A summary of my presentation basically is, is always put some thoughts in your design facilities. Study other facilities, study other people's ideas, use them to the best of your knowledge. Think about the things that I talked about today. And then just surround yourself with really great people. I've been pretty, for, pretty fortunate in my lifetime to be around some of the greatest in my book. Uh, if anybody knows Bud, or if you got to work with Bud Williams, you just got to know that he was an odd duck. And he, you know, he loved cattle, he loved dogs, he loved horses, just wasn't a big fan of people. And um, he'd call them stars, those that didn't want to listen and uh, didn't want to obey <laughs> Bud's rules. And uh, when I worked with him, I had to stand behind him a lot, and, and uh, I couldn't look around that tall son of a gun. He was a lot taller than I was. And, uh, but if I wanted to keep working with him, I had to abide by his rules and, and just learn. And so that's what I did. I was pretty patient. Um, but he did give me a really good understanding. And then, of course, I got to work with the mellow Dr. Tom. And Tom Nossinger is the way mellow version of Bud. And uh, just a different egg <laughs> at the end of the day. And, uh, but I'm partners with Dr. Tom today. And... Uh, and I'm blessed to have said that. And uh, so that's where all my experience comes from. And then my own knowledge is just going out and actually studying behavior. And that's, that's what I do today. And so you can hit me with any questions you want. I'm sorry to keep you here this long, but uh, I hope it was worthwhile. That's all I got. Excellent. Thank you very much. Yeah. Got a question over here. Leading cattle, yes. Yes. Well, what about cattle that have been settled into the pen? Yep. On feed for, you know, 60 days, 70 days, you want to remove plants, you want to bring them back up to the chute. Would they follow the horse out of that pen? Depends on how you ride the pen every day. So his question is, is will they lead out of that pen like you put them in there? And uh, I think is the gist of your question. And uh, the answer is no. It depends on how you've worked with them. So when we go to pins and, and uh, when we're training our people is, 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 is how we ride a pin. So I would always say is, is if your sole goal of riding pins is to find sick cattle, pull sick cattle, and take sick cattle to the hospital, then no, it's not going to work. If your goal is riding the cattle to train the cattle every day to do something for you and to be something for you, then yeah, it might. It's just not going to work like the first day. Will they still follow and lead and be curious if somebody puts somebody in front? Yes. I'd still put somebody in front. Mainly because I don't want to be with the rider that I'm riding with. Okay? That makes sense? So even if I have to split the pin, say, and take 20 head ahead of me, and I'm guiding those 20, Guess what the 150 or the 300 are going to do because there's those 20 head that I'm leading out in front and I'm guiding in front of me. They're the, my lead at the end of the day. Like I have video of emptying a large pin where we actually empty the pin and that's exactly what I do is, is I, I take 20 and the other person brings up the rest. Mainly because I don't want to be with that person. I don't have anything to say to them. Okay. Does that answer your question? Yeah. I do like people, but just not that much. Yeah. Okay. Oh, that's a good question. Yeah. 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 It's a great question. 
So this question is, is when cattle have to make that step up. So like in Temple Grandin's study of cattle exiting speed out of a chute, the flaw of that design and as far as exiting out was is that they had to step up four to six inches into the chute and they had to step six inches down. It had nothing to do with the swirl on their forehead or on their pole. <laughs> had everything to do with the six inches up and the six inches out. So when I do facilities today, um, it's a good question. Let me just give me a second and I'll show you how I combat that. If you ever wonder, how in the hell does he find all those files? It's right up here, <laughs> okay? It's all in the file system. So, that's the alley into the chute and out. It's zero entry. We recess our chute. And how we recess things, um, So that's everything. You can kind of see right here, there's a pit. This, this drain system right here flows into this, and this goes out to our sediment on out to a main pit. But our chute is recessed. And then in that pit, there is a... Can you see that? That's a steel beam and there's I-beams underneath and so we can put whatever chute we want. So if we want to switch to a silencer, we can switch to a silencer. If we want to switch to a dodge, we can switch to a dodge and switch to whatever chute we want. At the end of the day, the load cells are on that, those beams. You can do ramps if you want. Yeah, you can do that. So like if you have an existing facility, Troy, and you don't have a pit and you want to ramp up to it, I would just say that you have to give them like about a five to six foot ramp. So that's a good question. It's a great question. Yep. Does that answer it? Yeah. Right. Perfect. Anything else? All right. Thanks for having me. I really appreciate getting the opportunity to come up here. And I'll be around maybe till ever. I don't know. Quick show of hands. Who's coming tomorrow? Oh, good. Some of you. Perfect. I'll be around tomorrow as well. So if you want to pick my brain or whatever, I don't have much of a brain, so you can do whatever you want to pick. But pretty impressed with your content. Huh? Holy shit, man. Got <laughs> well, I got a lot of stuff. stuff. That's awesome. Yeah, yeah. There's a